This is Audible. The Lost Artifact. Written by Vaughn Hepner. Narrated by Mark Boyette. Prologue. Chapter 1. Yen Cho, the oldest of the Yen Cho series androids, and likely the oldest android period in human space, hunted an assassin in one of the most secure buildings in London in the England sector of Earth. It was the Queen's Tower, a gleaming skyscraper soaring over the rest of the city. The android was on the 101st floor, moving through a carpeted corridor. He wore a Star Watch intelligence uniform, but possessed a questionable pass. If that wasn't bad enough, two Queen's Tower security agents guarded the door he needed to get through at the end of the corridor. Yen Cho wore a disguise, a Captain Maddox faceplate with elongated legs for this mission. He attempted to mimic the captain's customary swagger and impatient stride. If the agents questioned him, though, Yen Cho ran through his parameters as he neared the two agents. One watched him closely. That agent used his left elbow to nudge his partner. The other looked up, seemed perplexed, and grabbed a hand monitor hanging from his belt. Yen Cho did not like that. His logic processors churned at incredible speed and precision. 167 years ago, Yen Cho had gained builder-grade upgrades, making him unique and possibly the most lethal of the androids. He increased his pace as he was seven doors away from the guards. The second agent, a man with heavy sideburns, must have seen something he didn't like on the hand monitor. He let the monitor drop, reached for his holstered sidearm and spoke rapidly to his partner. Yen Cho broke into a sprint. He could have drawn his own weapon, but it was a dart gun with special tranks and only contained a few shots. He could not afford to waste the darts on these two. The first agent froze, if only for a moment. All hominids had that tendency, which Yen Cho had hoped to engage. That gave him his chance except for one unforeseen problem. The second agent must have been a speed draw artist. He cleared a Churchill automatic from its holster, flicked off the safety with his thumb, and pulled the trigger before Yen Cho could reach the man. Then, one of those quirks of fate gave Yen Cho a hand. The automatic must have jammed. It took a moment for the agent to realize that nothing had happened. Using two hands, he began to clear the misaligned bullet. That was all the margin Yen Cho needed. He reached them and punched the gun-wielding agent in the throat, crushing the human's windpipe and bones with an exoskeleton-enhanced feature of his metallic frame. Yen Cho had a pseudo-skin covering and thus appeared human to anyone without a scanner. But that made no difference to his incredible strength. As the second agent crumpled to the floor, the first agent finally came out of his funk. He swung at Yen Cho. That was a mistake. The android absorbed the strike against his face. It did not hurt. He only feared that it might damage the pseudo skin, marring it and thus wrecking his disguise. Before the agent could recover from his mistake, Yen Cho grabbed the man's head and twisted so the neck bones snapped. The man joined his compatriot in a heap on the floor. The android did not need to check a watch to see how much time he had left. His internal chronometer told him that he had less than seven minutes left, if his calculations were correct, and Yen Cho was quite certain they were. He used a key, unlocked the door, and dragged the two corpses into a hallway. He stepped back outside, staring at the blood on the rug. There was nothing he could do now about the mess left there from the ruptured throat. I say, a woman called from deeper in the apartment. Is everything all right? I was told no one would enter without my permission. Yen Cho knew he was out of time. He shut the door, locked it, and hurried down the corridor. Something warned him then. It wasn't intuition, as androids did not possess such an ethereal function. 
It must have been the upgrades running through various scenarios. He knew that the woman was a highly skilled credit thief. It seemed unlikely she would have called out as she did in an innocent manner. She must have done that to lull whoever had come in. Yen Cho threw himself onto the floor as he turned the corner. His assessment had been correct. The credit thief hid behind a sofa with a spring-driven needler in her hand. She'd fired as soon as she had seen him, and several steel needles pin-cushioned the wall behind Yen Cho. You're fast, the thief said. She had short red hair and what humans considered a pretty face. Yen Cho hadn't expected her to keep her cool so well. As he scrambled up, a half dozen steel needles pin-cushioned the pseudo-skin of his face. The android was aware of the strikes, of course, but he did not feel pain like a man would have. He moved fast, and the thief blanched as he charged her. She shot him again in the torso this time, tearing his Star Watch intelligence uniform. By that time, Yen Cho had gone over the sofa, grabbed the credit thief, and pinned her shoulders against the wall so her feet dangled above the floor. You're hurting me, she said. Yen Cho regarded her with the steel needles embedded in his face. Obviously, you're an android, she said. Where is he? Yen Cho asked in an imitation of Captain Maddox's voice. She stared at him without replying. You will talk to me, he said. Listen, she said, not frightened yet, but seemingly considering if she should be. I am out of time, Yen Cho said. He threw her onto the floor, turned her over, and put a knee on the small of her back. Upstairs, she gasped. He's upstairs. I know that. What floor and room? Does it matter? Yes, he plans to assassinate the Lord High Admiral of Starwatch. You're lying, she said. Everyone knows Admiral Cook saved humanity. He saved us all from the swarm. Why would anyone want to kill him? Yen Cho did not have time to debate. He had withdrawn a hypo from his kit. He pressed the end against the woman's neck, and with a hiss of injected air, gave her a full dosage. Afterward, he removed his knee from her back and stood up. She turned around groggily, blinking at him. I know, Yen Cho said. It hurts. The pain will not go away until you are dead. If it is any comfort, you are going to die soon. Terror widened her eyes. The fear should help the drug loosen her tongue, which was why he'd told her. Who? Ah, she whispered. I am Captain Maddox. No, disguise, your android. He pulled out an energizer and pressed it against her neck. It caused her body to heave upward with a massive jolt of electricity. She began talking, babbling as fast as she could concerning what she knew about the assassin. Yen Cho listened, his cybertronic brain recording everything. In 56 seconds, it was over. The credit thief drummed her heels on the carpet as her seizure worsened. Half a minute later, air wheezed from the corpse as all the muscles relaxed. Yen Cho was already in the bathroom using the mirror to pluck the steel needles from his face. He removed the ones from his torso as well. Could he reach the assassin in time? He ran through possibilities and saw that he had one chance. It was a risk, a big one, considering the man's location and the event that was taking place near Big Ben. Soon the Lord High Admiral would give his speech. Yen Cho whirled around, moved back into the living room past the dead woman, and came to a large window overlooking London. It was a long drop to the ground 101 floors below. Yen Cho smashed one side of the glass. He then yanked the window pane inside. Some shards would have rained down. He hoped no one noticed. Without hesitation, the android climbed up to the window frame at the right side. He manipulated his hand. Spikes appeared at each fingertip and each toe. He had already kicked off his boots. Like a human fly, 
Yen Cho drove the finger and toe spikes into the outer wall of the gleaming Queen's Tower. He scaled the outer wall as the wind whipped at his garments. This was seriously compromising his human disguise. He would have to discard the pseudo-skin soon and replace it with a new covering. The android's right foot slipped, and he almost lost his grip. Concentrate, he told himself. He did, and he climbed to the second highest floor. While clinging to the wall, he used his left foot and hammered the glass of another window. It was a tricky maneuver, but he made it into the room. It was empty. Good. He had less than thirty seconds left. Admiral Cook would soon come up on the podium. Given the assassin's motives, he would want to kill the Lord High Admiral at the psychologically worst moment. The android ran through an empty corridor and slowed down as he neared the fated door. A hiccup in his logic processors came to Yen Cho as a moment of doubt. He shoved that aside. If he was correct, this could lead him to the greatest discovery of his long life. That was why he did this. He did not care about the Lord High Admiral or the unity of the Commonwealth of Planets. The Swarm Imperium was going to conquer human space. It was just a matter of when. The Imperium had sent one invasion fleet. Eventually, they would send a second, third, and fourth, however many were needed. No, this was for a possibly greater prize, one that Yen Cho had secretly yearned to achieve almost since he had gained self-awareness. The android opened the door and slipped within. He moved soundlessly, and in seconds, he saw the assassin. He was a wizened old man, hunched over a long-range beam rifle. A force screen shimmered in place of the window someone had taken out. The man's ability to reach this location at this time was unbelievable, considering the security that had gone into locking down the City of London and the Queen's Tower in particular. How did the assassin think he could get away with this? Surely he wanted to live afterward. The android advanced upon the assassin. The other adjusted his big beam rifle. It was on a stand while a targeting computer made minute adjustments. Something must have alerted the assassin. He whirled around, and his eyes widened in astonishment. Captain Maddox, how? The android smiled. Strand, he said. Fancy meeting you here. The old man, who looked exactly like the Methuselah man Strand, licked his lips. He seemed to be calculating madly. The android drew and fired the dart gun, putting three tranks into the man's chest. The Strand lookalike blinked at the darts, looked up at the android, and faded into the influence of the tranks, wilting onto the hard floor. Yen Cho moved up and looked through the beam rifle's scope. He saw the podium down there. He saw the Iron Lady, the Lord High Admiral, and Captain Maddox, all sitting in the front row of a vast crowd. If he wanted, Yen Cho could assassinate them all. Would that be what humans called ironic? The android's internal chronometer told him he lacked the time for such thoughts and pauses. Taking out a hypo, he revived the man who looked like Strand. Yen Cho knew the real Methuselah man was locked on the throne world, a prisoner of the new men. Who was this man, and why was he here? As the Strand lookalike woke up, Yen Cho bent down and put a device on the man's forehead. He then sat on the floor, cross-legged, beside the man. The interrogation would take fifteen minutes, and it would cause the lookalike much pain. But Yen Cho wanted data. If he was right about the reason for this strand-looking assassin, this little talk could be the most important one of his exceedingly long life. What was funny about it, in a way, was that he, Yen Cho, had just done the Commonwealth a great service. 
they might or might not learn about the greater danger to the Commonwealth that this look-alike and his assassination plot represented. That, though, wasn't the android's concern. Ready? Yen Cho asked the man. Please, don't hurt me. Yen Cho chuckled. Then he began the intense process of extracting the assassin's data. Prologue, Chapter Two In galactic terms, human space was a tiny region several hundred light years in circumference. Within the patrol-charted area were several multi-star system political bodies. The Commonwealth of Planets was the largest, containing hundreds of Earth-colonized worlds. Before the swarm invasion fleet a year ago, the Commonwealth had been busy integrating planets from the Windsor League, the Shattered Wahhabi Caliphate, the Chin Confederation, and the Social Syndicate Worlds, among others. Since the alien invasion, since the billions of slain people lost in the Tau Ceti, Alpha Centauri, and other star systems, since the hundreds of destroyed Star Watch and New Men warships and hundreds of thousands of dead servicemen and women, Several severe political quakes had shaken the Commonwealth of Planets to its core. People were tired, people were scared, and people were hiding their money because the taxes to pay for such powerful space defenses had started to become too burdensome. Despite all this, there was a greater hidden problem. While many of the quakes, the revolutions, the nationalist rebellions, and the quantum leaps and in incidences of piracy seemed understandable. There were other problems with a different source, a calculated and possibly evilly premeditated source. Brigadier Mary O'Hara of Starwatch Intelligence had sensed this hidden hand. She'd pored over charts graphs and secret reports indicating this veiled malignance, and she had lost far too many of her best agents in the oddest places. She finally asked the Lord High Admiral for the services of Starship Victory and for her favorite intelligence officer to return to her stable of operatives. That officer, of course, was Captain Maddox. Brigadier O'Hara, a.k.a the Iron Lady of Starwatch Intelligence, summoned Maddox to her office in Geneva, Switzerland, Earth. She briefed him, listened to his thoughts, and then sent him on a secret mission to a no-man's space between the Chin Confederation and the former social syndicate worlds. After Maddox left, O'Hara studied a different report, a troubling one that she hadn't considered yet. That report led her to request the use of a special builder communication device. Three days later, the Lord High Admiral granted her permission. Two and a half hours later, O'Hara spoke to the tall, urbane, and golden-skinned Emperor of the New Men. The Emperor lived on the throne world, many hundreds of light years away from Earth. Star Watch did not know the precise location of the planet. However, Star Watch did know that it was in the region of space commonly known as the Beyond. Quite simply, the Beyond meant beyond human space. More than 150 years ago, the last two Methuselah men, Strand and Professor Ludendorff, had started a colony world of genetically superior people, hoping to create a defender race of supermen for the rest of humanity. Things hadn't quite worked out that way. The new men were faster, smarter, and stronger than the old, so that part was a success. Unfortunately for the rest of humanity, the new men had understood their superiority over Homo sapien humans. Seeing themselves as the rightful rulers due to genetic brilliance, the new men had decided to subjugate those they considered as sub-men. Those sub-men had proven more stubborn than the new men had expected, and the initial new man invasion had been beaten back 
by ferocious and desperate fighting. Due to a number of strategic factors, the new men had come in their star cruisers to help against the swarm invasion fleet. With the climactic victory over the aliens, the star cruisers had departed human space and returned to their place in the beyond. However fragilely, the uneasy peace between Star Watch and the new men still held. One of the reasons that the Emperor of the New Men had agreed to help Star Watch was that Captain Maddox had given them a special captive, their genetic creator, as it were, the Methuselah Man, Strand. Strand was also the reason for O'Hara's special long-distance call. She had achieved the call through a unique builder communication device, its duplicate on the throne world. After O'Hara completed the pleasantries, she came to the point of the call. I cannot pinpoint the exact reason, your majesty, O'Hara told the emperor. But I have a feeling that a Methuselah man works against the commonwealth. The emperor nodded. They spoke via screens. He seemed to nod, however, only out of a sense of common courtesy. In truth, the golden-skinned Superman seemed bored with O'Hara. Do you suspect Professor Ludendorff? The Emperor asked, most likely out of a sense of obligation, and not because he cared what happened to the sub-men. I do not suspect him, O'Hara said. You may not know, but Ludendorff has left our service. I believe the professor is recouping from injuries gained during the swarm invasion. What I'm saying is that he did not seem to be in a belligerent frame of mind the last time I saw him. I see, the emperor said. He straightened the slightest bit. Obviously, then, you suspect Strand. That is why you have called me. O'Hara nodded. I assume you realize that Strand is still in our custody, the emperor said. I do, sire. You must also realize that he has had no outside contact with anyone but me. O'Hara became cautious. Those the new men considered inferior easily offended them. I am in no way suggesting that someone can trick you, sire. I was merely wondering if it is possible that some of your people could be secretly helping Strand. The new man smiled indulgently. Brigadier, my people hate Strand. Most would like to strangle him with their bare hands. Those who think otherwise would like to torture him to death for all the indignities he has heaped upon us. There are none among us who would help Strand. O'Hara wondered how to bring up the next question. She finally blurted out, May I ask, sire, why you don't kill him then? Strand is dangerous. He may be the most dangerous human alive. The emperor's dark eyes swirled with passion. It's possible he considered himself to be the most dangerous human alive. If I have overstepped myself, O'Hara said quickly, you have, the emperor said. Yet, you are a substandard model of O'Hara understood that the emperor had just cut himself off out of what he must think of as politeness. New men were insufferably arrogant. They couldn't help it. I realize that fear motivates your rudeness, the emperor said, taking a new tack. No, lady, that I study Strand as I talk to him. He is full of unusual insights. He is restless, though. He hates captivity. Rest assured that prolonged confinement is better revenge than killing him. Strand seethes inside. He desires to be out creating mischief. He also fears what I will eventually do to him. There is another point to consider, one I believe you are intelligent enough to perceive. You are gracious, O'Hara managed to say. The emperor showed off his white teeth in a feral grin. 
Clearly, he understood how she really felt about new men. I believe there may come a day that we desire Strand's insights, the Emperor said. That is the key reason I permit him to live. O'Hara nodded. She didn't like hearing that. But I shall watch him even more closely, the Emperor said in a condescending tone. If I learn anything that shows he is actively plotting against the Commonwealth, I shall inform you at once, Brigadier. You have my word on this. O'Hara nodded. She couldn't ask for more than that. Thank you, sire. You are most gracious. He smiled indulgently, clearly waiting for the interview to end. I wish you well, sire, O'Hara said. Yes, yes, he said with a wave of his long-fingered hand and no pretense of returning the sentiment. If that is it, then... It is, sire. Thank you once again. The emperor nodded a last time and cut the connection. O'Hara sat back as the screen went blank. She believed that the emperor had told her the truth. So, if Ludendorff wasn't plotting against the Commonwealth, if Strand could not because he was a prisoner of the new men, was there a third Methuselah man out there working against humanity? How could another one have been hidden this long from her agents and from the other two Methuselah men? O'Hara did not know. She hoped Maddox found a clue at Smade's asteroid. Starwatch needed to find this hidden foe if they were going to keep the Commonwealth intact. Humanity needed the Commonwealth because mankind needed Starwatch. For one thing, the terrible Swarm Imperium was still out there. We defeated one small Swarm Invasion fleet, O'Hara thought to herself, and it took everything we had. What if the Imperium sends another fleet through the hyperspatial tube? What if the Imperium sends two or three fleets, each of them three times the size of the first fleet? O'Hara took a deep breath. Star Watch had a lot of work to do before humanity could sleep safely. A lot of hard and ceaseless work if they were going to keep the human race alive in this part of the galaxy. Part 1 Smade's Asteroid 97 Days Later Chapter 1 Captain Maddox abruptly returned to consciousness and tasted blood in his mouth. He didn't know where he was. He didn't know what had happened to him. He did, however, have a sense of danger. Was he in danger? Was someone close to him in danger? Or was it broader than that? He tried to assess his surroundings, but that proved difficult, as he was groggy and disoriented. He lay on something cold and hard. The coppery-tasting blood came from a cut in his mouth. A cut in his mouth? Yes, he'd been in a fight. He recalled three blows. The first had smashed his inner cheek against his teeth, cutting skin. The second had badly staggered him, and the third had presumably knocked him out. Maddox tried to bring his right arm around in order to touch his jaw. A jolt of pain caused him to open his eyes. It was dark. He couldn't tell if it was night or if he was in a building. He was breathing hard from the pain in his right arm. He lay on his face, on metal. Slowly, carefully, he shifted onto his left side. Then he tried to move his right arm again. That sent pain shooting up and down the limb. Was it broken? He didn't know, but he was beginning to suspect so. Maddox concentrated on moving his right arm. He clenched his teeth so he wouldn't groan. He refused to for a number of reasons. The first was a matter of safety lest he give himself away. The second was a matter of pride. He did not like to give in to pain. 
Soon his right hand touched his face. With his left, he tested the right arm. He did not find any ripped cloth or jagged bone ends. The muscles were tender, though, as if someone had repeatedly wrenched the arm back and forth. He was wearing boots, pants, a shirt, and a jacket. He suddenly remembered why he wasn't wearing his Star Watch uniform. He did not want anyone to know that he belonged to Star Watch. Star Watch. Abruptly, Maddox groaned as he remembered the Battle of Alpha Centauri. Star Watch had fought the Imperial Swarm and an ancient spirit entity, Ska. The good guys had been on the verge of defeat. Maddox had saved the day by engineering the explosion of the star Alpha Centauri A. It was a tri-star system. The exploding star had annihilated most of the enemy fleet and the Ska. Unfortunately, it had also killed every human inhabitant of the Alpha Centauri system. The guilt of slaughtering hundreds of millions of humans. As he lay alone in the dark on the cold metal floor, Maddox ground his teeth together. He could logically process the idea that he'd saved the greater commonwealth. He had also rid the universe of the wicked Ska. He had not yet found a way to process, to personally accept, murdering hundreds of millions of people to achieve those ends. None of that mattered to him here, wherever he was. It was time to figure that out. Making as little noise as possible, Maddox worked up onto his knees. He cradled his right arm. The injury couldn't have occurred too long ago. Like new men contributed by the new man who'd impregnated his mother, he healed faster than a regular human. He had a slightly higher metabolism and definitely had quicker reflexes than a normal person. He stared into the darkness, but saw nothing. He craned his neck. There were no stars or sky or visible cloud cover. No breeze stirred against his face. Given the taint in his nostrils, the silence and the darkness, he could be in a basement or an underground garage. It has a metal floor. That could indicate a spaceship or satellite. He did not sense any vibration that would have revealed an engine. Could he be drifting in a dead spaceship? With a surge of determination, Maddox climbed to his feet, swaying for several seconds. The last blow, the one that must have knocked him out, must also have scrambled his brains more than a little. He waited, and the feeling of disorientation passed. He searched through his clothes. He did not have a gun or a link to Galleon in Starship Victory. No gun, no brass knuckles. He had nothing to defend himself, not even his monofilament knife. The empty scabbard was hidden under his jacket. He must have lost the knife somewhere. He listened, but there was still nothing to hear. Maddox picked a direction and began to slide his feet. He did not step in case he might trip on something. He slid his feet and bumped up against something. Crouching, Maddox felt a prone body. He searched for a pulse, but found none. He leaned near the mouth, but could not hear any breathing nor feel air move against his cheek. The skin was cold and clammy. He discovered the handle of a knife with the pommel pressed against the chest. Right. The blade was in the torso, possibly in the heart. Ah. Maddox recognized the handle of the knife, his monofilament blade, a weapon so sharp it could cut almost anything. Maddox must have stabbed this man for striking him. With a tug, Maddox removed the knife and, working carefully in the dark, wiped the blade against the man's garments. Afterward, he slid the ultra-sharp blade into the scabbard inside his jacket. 
Turning around, he slide walked back the way he had come until he reached a wall. His right arm didn't hurt quite so badly now, although he had no intention of trying to use it yet. He felt left handedly along the wall until he reached a hatch. Hatch? This wasn't a door, it was a hatch. What did that indicate? A spaceship? A satellite? A submarine? Maddox bent his head, but no memory came. Wait, he did remember something. He... With a sick feeling, Maddox felt his scalp. Someone had shaved him bald. They had done so in the past few hours, as he did not even feel bristles of hair. He felt along his scalp until he stopped, at the back of his head. He felt stitches. For a second, rage surged through him. He fingered the stitches. He was going to yank them out and tear out whatever had been implanted in his head. Before he could, the hatch slid up, and a blinding flashlight shined in his eyes. Chapter Two Don't move, a mountain of a man growled. Don't even twitch a muscle. Maddox squinted as harsh light blinded him. He raised his left hand to shield his eyes and backed away from the bigger man. There was a popping noise. A tangle capsule struck Maddox's chest and flung sticky strands around him, webbing his arms to his torso. Another popping sound occurred. A second capsule struck his legs, tangling them. Then a third sound, a sharper one, heralded a solid rubber bullet striking his chest. It knocked the air out of his lungs, and it caused him to attempt to stagger to keep his balance. He couldn't because his legs were webbed together. He toppled backward and hit the deck. You don't listen too good, the man told him in a gloating voice. The bright light moved into the chamber. A second light appeared. The two beams centered on Maddox. A third man cursed. His light shined on the corpse in the chamber. He killed Yunan, a higher-voiced and weaker-sounding man said. Despite his tangled position, Maddox turned his head. Through the beams shining in his eyes, he saw a massive corpse. The dead man looked like a pro wrestler from a 2G planet. That would explain the power of the blows. The corpse had close-cropped hair, a mashed Asian face, and wore an unfamiliar black uniform. Blood had welled from the chest like an old-fashioned oil gusher. I'll be damned, one of the men said. Something clicked and light flooded the chamber. Maddox squinted in the glare and looked around a bare room. He didn't remember it, and he didn't understand why he wouldn't remember. But he wasn't going to worry about that now. He focused on his adversaries. Two of them looked like Yunnan clones. They were massive, wore black uniforms, and had mashed Asian faces and ugly dispositions. One cradled a tangler, a shotgun-looking weapon, while the other had a pistol slug thrower. Each had a flashlight, which they now snapped off. The third member wore a white lab coat. He was much shorter and thinner, and had copper-colored hair that he wore like a bowl. Why did you kill Yunnan? The tangler-armed mountain man demanded. Maddox had a vague recollection of the fight. It seemed like a dream. He had trouble remembering. Look! said the scientist, the thin man in the white lab coat. Yunnan hit him. There's a welt on Maddox's face. The armed man looked closely. Yunnan broke the rule, the scientist declared. Maddox is in a delicate condition. The scientist stopped talking, possibly because he noticed the captain watching him intently. Did you operate on me? Maddox asked. The tangler-armed mountain man laughed, but choked off the jeering sound at a frowning glance from the scientist. What is this place? Maddox asked. You're going to be all right, the scientist said in a soothing voice. 
Did I escape? Maddox asked. No, no, the scientist said. You're upsetting yourself with these questions. That's not going to help you recover. You've been injured, and we're helping you. He killed Yunnan, the pistol-armed Asian shouted, his features having turned red. He killed him. The massive Asian rushed Maddox. With a steel-toed boot, he kicked the Star Watch officer in the stomach. Maddox twisted in pain, tightening the sticky strands webbing him and making it harder to breathe. Stop that, the scientist shouted. The huge pistol-armed Asian cursed bitterly, kicking Maddox a second time. No, the scientist said, reaching into a lab coat pocket. Please, Dr. Lee, the tangler-armed mountain man pleaded. The huge Asian went for a third kick, drawing back a tree trunk-like leg. Then he stiffened as his eyes bulged outward. He turned stiffly toward the scientist, Dr. Lee, presumably. Dr. Lee held a small device, pressing a switch with his thumb. The huge Asian raised his pistol at Lee. Lee frantically pressed the device a second time. A hiss sounded from the massive Asian's skull. Smoke trickled upward as his eyes rolled up into his head. A second later, as the stench of burnt flesh filled the room, the huge man collapsed bonelessly onto the metal deck. The tangler-armed man's head whipped around as he stared at Dr. Lee. You killed my friend, he accused. He was going to shoot me. Lee said. You panicked. That's not an ordinary gun, but a slug thrower firing rubber bullets. Dr. Lee shook his head. You bastard, you panicked and killed my friend. Don't swear at me, Lee snarled, stung, it seemed. I don't ever swear at me, Lee shouted, raising the device as his thumb hovered over a switch. The massive Asian with the tangler turned away from the scientist his shoulders hunched. Maddox glimpsed the mountain man's face. He was furious, but Dr. Lee had cowed him. I have a question, Maddox said. The tangler-armed man focused on Maddox. Hatred burned in his black eyes, but he kept his back to the scientist. Yes, Dr. Lee asked. Who are you? Maddox asked. Lee seemed shocked by the question. Then a sly smile stole onto his face. Interesting, he said. Maddox did not find it interesting. He found Lee's smugness annoying. It was time to begin playing his adversaries. I'm finding it hard to breathe, the captain said. Could you loosen these strands a little? Lee eyed him. Finally, he focused on the armed man. Guard him, Jund. On no account will you touch him. If you harm medics in any way. Lee glanced suggestively at the newly dead 2G corpse. The tangler man, Jund, nodded without looking up, although he had turned to face Lee. I'll be back with the stretcher team, Lee said. This time, John did nothing. Lee seemed as if he was going to add something. Finally, he pocketed the device, headed for the hatch, and stopped. Oh, Lee said. Don't talk to him either. His memory loss, that is quite interesting. The master will want to test this, I'm sure. Lee moved through the hatch and continued walking, the sound of his footsteps soon dwindling. Maddox had a premonition. This was it. If he was going to do something to get out of this, now was likely his sole opportunity. Chapter Three Where is this place? Maddox asked. The huge, tangler-armed man, John, looked at him. Then the heavy, a term for a 2G person, sneered and turned his back on the captain. A little guy always tell you what to do? Maddox asked. There was nothing, no response. 
Seems like Dr. Lee is a little prick with a big weapon, Maddox said. John glanced at him, shrugged. Lee also murdered your friend with his little device, Maddox said. There was nothing again, but Maddox had the sense his words bothered John. Just pointed the device, pressed his thumb, dead, Maddox said. That was a hell of a way to go. It wasn't even a fight. Your friend was angry I'd killed his friend Yunnan. I can't blame him. If someone slew Sergeant Riker, I'd kill him or her if that were the case. But no, that little prick, Lee, took out his control unit and fried your friend's brain with it. I can still smell it. Can you smell it? Shut up, John said. Just shut your yap and wait for it. You're not going to be talking soon. I get that, Maddox said. I just don't understand your place in this. I mean, two of you are already dead. I killed one. The little Dr. Lee burned your friend's brains. Not that he had much of a brain to start with, but if I had a burn unit in my head, you do, you idiot, John said savagely. It will do more than just burn you, though. Maddox was silent a moment, as if pondering that. That shut you up, John said with a sneer. That doesn't make sense, Maddox said. Why use the tangle gun on me then? Just press a button to stop me. I don't know why you're lying about that, but you obviously are. You think so? John asked, staring at Maddox with hot, beady eyes. I know it, Maddox said. You have stitches in the back of your head, you fool. Why do you think they're there? Maddox raised his eyebrows as if surprised. That's right. They put a control chip in your head. A better one's going to go in deep later. Right now. John suddenly seemed worried that maybe he'd said too much. This was the moment Maddox could sense it. He also felt that he'd gotten a handle on John's personality. It was time to twist the metaphorical knife. Maddox chuckled. John's face soured. What's so funny, huh? You and me, Maddox said. What do you think I'm going to tell the little guy about you? If you're smart, not a damn thing. Wrong, Maddox said. I'm going to tell him how you told me about the deep implant. That's good, because it gives me information. You're screwed, John. I'm going to watch Dr. Lee burn you. I'm going to laugh while he does it, too. You're a bastard. I'm Captain Maddox. Yeah, John said. I know about how you think you're tough, because you're half new man. You ain't crap, though. I could twist you like you're a child. I doubt it. I killed your friend easily enough. Now I'm going to watch you die. <laughs> I'm going to shut up, John shouted, stepping close, looking as if he was going to kick Maddox in the face. Maddox looked up into John's eyes. The heavies were obviously powerful, but they were not bright. They were also far too emotional, which seemed strange given their background. He wondered if they were from the planet Shanghai. He'd read a report once about the lush, Earth-like planet with two crushing gravities at the surface. Hadn't there been Chinese colonists? He seemed to recall experimental drugs that had promoted massive muscle growth, along with tougher tendons. Most of the second generation had died on Shanghai. The few that had survived were incredibly strong compared to regular 1G-raised humans. Could Yunnan and John be from Shanghai? Dr. Lee had also looked Asian, but he clearly wasn't from a 2G world. John crouched in front of Maddox. The gunman held the tangler under his right armpit as he flexed his huge fingers in front of Maddox's face. I know what you're doing, John whispered with his bad breath. It ain't going to work, though. 
I'm going to watch them shove an implant deep into your brain. I'm the one who's going to laugh, not you. I'm not going to laugh after I talk to Dr. Lee, Maddox said. Rage boiled in John's black eyes. He stood, deliberately turned his massive back on Maddox and stepped to the hatch. He leaned against the frame as if indifferent to everything. And another thing, Maddox said. John began whistling, as if to show Maddox that he wasn't going to listen to any more provocation. That was fine, as that was what Maddox had been trying to achieve. He didn't think he'd have long, though, and he had no doubt John had hair trigger senses. Low IQ gunmen often had the best hearing. You can whistle all you want, Maddox half shouted. That only made John whistle louder. As Maddox continued to goad the big man, he strained his left arm. Tangle strands were capture tools. They weren't meant for long-term confinement, though. The sticky web still held him, but not quite with the same ferocity as earlier. The trick with Tangle Strand was to relax. The harder one fought them, the more they tightened. Maddox had relaxed, and fraction by fraction, he'd been repositioning his left arm. Now he strained. Now he had run out of time. He strained until his head pounded. He strained so his right arm throbbed with renewed agony. By a monumental effort, he forced his left hand under his jacket. He'd stop talking. If he tried to speak while he did this, his voice would sound too strained. John would surely turn to investigate then. In truth, Maddox needed some luck. John could turn around at any moment. The man could also realize that Maddox no longer spoke. The loud whistling helped a little. That might be the margin that allowed him to... Maddox's left hand clutched the handle of the monofilament knife. He jerked back. The sticky strands fought him. He jerked back again, and he grunted. The whistling stopped. Maddox took a slow, deep breath, tried to slow his jackhammering heart, and said in a rush, I knew that Lee was going to fry your friend's brain. I have to say that I really enjoyed... John hunched his monstrous neck and began whistling again. Gritting his teeth, Maddox heaved, yanking his left arm back enough to free the monofilament blade from its sheath. He had to be careful or he'd hack himself. He brought out the blade and sliced several sticky strands. He ended up shaving some of the uniform, but he didn't slice into his flesh. He cut more strands, giving him a little more control of the left arm. He worked frantically, slicing, freeing more of himself. The whistling stopped again. What are you doing? John asked as he turned around. Despite the agony, Maddox rolled, using his right hand to push against the floor. That hurt like blazes, but it worked. He heaved up as John stared at him in surprise. Then the mountain man brought up the tangle gun. Maddox lunged. John pulled the trigger even as the captain clapped his right hand over the barrel mouth. The capsule struck his hand with terrible force. Maddox growled at the pain. He stabbed left-handed, the blade entering John's flesh. The blade cut effortlessly through John's clothes and flesh, bones, and blood vessels. It was a sickening weapon if one had time to think about it. John screamed, flinging himself backward in order to get away. Remorselessly, Maddox followed, killing the enormous man by slicing off the top of his skull. As the captain did so, he found himself looking out of the hatch and down a long corridor. It was lit now, and it seemed like a ship's corridor with metal bulkheads. The corridor went for a ways. At the far end appeared two more heavies. They carried a stretcher between them. Bringing up the rear was the thin Dr. Lee. Maddox did not hesitate. He knelt, felt around John's bloody jacket, and grabbed a magazine of tangle capsules. Then he was up with the tangler moving into the chamber where he'd first woken up. Stop! Lee shouted in the distance. I'll shock you if you don't stop! Maddox did not stop. 
but charged through the chamber heading for the hatch on the other side. Lee might or might not shock him. Probably the scientist would. But while he was free, Maddox was going to try to escape. Chapter 4 as Maddox passed through the hatch and entered a different corridor, a buzzing sensation caused the back of his head to tingle. Maddox hesitated. Would he drop, convulse, or simply go unconscious? None of those things happened. Abruptly, the tingling stopped. Maddox began to run. The first mountain man must have hit him too hard when they'd fought. The heavy must have jarred something loose in Maddox's control chip. Instead of smiling at his luck, a fierce resolve built in Maddox. Someone had shaved his scalp and operated on him. According to John, Dr. Lee or his team planned to put a deep implant into his brain. The brain surgery sounded like Methuselah Man Strand. Maddox knew that Strand was a prisoner of the new men, of the emperor on the throne world. Maddox knew because he'd captured Strand on the junkyard planet Sind II and given him to the new men as a gift. Maddox turned a corner. He still felt strong. Could Strand have escaped from the new men? Maddox seriously doubted that. Could the spacers be behind this? They surely hated him enough. The captain glanced back but couldn't see any pursuers. If this was a spaceship, there should be monitors everywhere. He did not see any security cameras. He still did not feel any vibration on the deck plates. Maddox reached another hatch. He panted. For all his vaunted self-control, he had been running too hard. The control unit in his head might have something to do with that. The remembrance of Strand's horrible practice of having a controlled crew of new men added a touch of horror to Maddox's predicament. He let himself pant, as he put away the monofilament blade and loaded the tangler. He had three shots. He had to use them wisely. Maddox cocked his head, listening. He heard footfalls in the distance. The two stretcher bearers and the scientist were coming after him. An alarm began pulsating. The sound came from the other side of the hatch before him. The hatch slid open, and Maddox saw two new Chinese heavies in black uniforms. They were too close for a good tangle shot. Maddox automatically reversed the direction of the shotgun-like tangler and used the stock, smashing it against the nearest face. There was crunching, and the big man staggered backward as blood gushed from his broken nose. The second heavy's eyes widened with surprise. Maddox drew back the tangler and tried the same stock-smashing tactic. The man was fast, despite his size. That confirmed Maddox's suspicion that the heavies came from Shanghai, from a 2G planet, like his wife Meta had. The heavy yanked the tangler out of Maddox's grasp. Maddox moved in aggressively and brought up his left knee in a vicious groin shot. He didn't have time for anything more elegant. At least the heavy had unprotected and normal balls. The man's eyes bulged outward and his mouth opened and he made gobbling noises. Maddox shoved the man. The Shanghai bruiser toppled backward and curled into a fetal ball, clutching his groin as he did so. In those seconds, Maddox examined the chamber. It seemed like a guard station. There were video screens, coffee cups, rice snacks. On one screen, Maddox saw the two stretcher bearers racing down the corridor. He presumed they were running after him. Dr. Lee huffed and puffed, falling farther behind despite his labored running. On another screen, Maddox saw what seemed to be a bazaar, with stalls, cellars, and milling crowds. What was interesting about the bazaar was the ceiling. It arched high, but it seemed artificial, as in a satellite or possibly an interior asteroid. Maddox had normal weight, which meant normal gravity, a satellite or a rich enough asteroid base would have gravity control. None of that jogged his memory, but he wasn't going to worry about that now. The point was, if he went through the next hatch, he could possibly mingle with the bizarre crowd, losing himself among them. The captain did not like to kill, 
Needlessly, he did not consider himself a murderer, except for the hundreds of millions who had died due to his actions in the Alpha Centauri system a year ago. In personal situations, he did not casually murder the helpless. But this seemed different. He was lost. He did not have all his memories, and a nefarious group was trying to control him with brain implants. Since he didn't know what this was about, he would assume the worst. He had to believe this was an attempt to infiltrate Starwatch, maybe help overthrow the government of Earth. Maddox drew the monofilament blade and swiftly slew each guard. He did not think he had much time left. He could not afford any mistakes. He took both men's IDs from their wallets. Then he buckled on one gun belt, fortunately adjustable for a thinner man, with its blaster, and secreted the other gun on his person. Afterward, he moved to the hatch and automatically touched his shaved scalp. Would that make him conspicuous out there? It was possible. He made a last glance around, saw a felt hat on a console, grabbed it, and slung it onto his smooth head. Then he picked up the tangler and used the stock to smash each screen. The others wouldn't be able to use the guard station to track him. Finally, Maddox went to the hatch and opened it, heading down a short corridor, which he hoped led to the outer bazaar. Chapter 6 Maddox struggled. The woman shocked him with a riot baton. The two men lifted and shoved him feet first into the mouth of a tube. He dropped, sliding down metal, picking up speed in the darkness. They had manhandled him much too easily. Were they slavers? Had they noticed the Shanghai ruffians hunting for him? He should have been paying more attention to his surroundings, his lack of awareness. He slammed against a mattress, bouncing off it and tumbling onto a deck. It took him a second to get his bearings. He was in a small metal room. He spied a portal and tried to force it, but it wouldn't budge. Because he had light down here, he went to the mattress, listening carefully at the tube exit, lest someone or something else... Maddox jerked back as he heard someone coming down. If it was his captors, maybe he could disarm them. The woman dropped out of the tube, striking the mattress and bouncing onto her feet. Maddox snatched the pain wand from her belt. It was a riot control weapon and what she'd been using to shock him. She no longer wore the ankle-length dress, but pants, shirt, and jacket like the men who had not come down yet. I had to use it, she told him, referring to the baton. We'd run out of time and you were resisting. You almost made a scene. Maddox ingested the words. She seemed to think that he should know her. Do you want to get off the asteroid or not? She asked, searching his eyes. He nodded. Of course he did. Then get out of my way, she said, pushing past him. Keeping the pain wand, he stepped aside and watched her. She moved decisively, touching the portal's handle. Maddox heard a click. It must be thumbprint activated. She opened the portal, looked back at him with her eyebrows raised, and he followed her into a large chamber. It had sleeping cots, lockers, and an assortment of carbines in a rack. Just a minute, Maddox said, grabbing one of her arms. She spun around fast and raised her other hand. It held a needle with a glistening green drop of poison on the tip. Maddox let go of her. The pin jabber brought back a memory, but not about this woman or this place. Maddox recalled that his mother had once used a weapon like that to protect him as a baby. He'd seen the memory while... Who are you? Maddox asked. Where did you go just now? She asked, seeming interested. Your eyes went blank, and then suddenly you were back. You seemed so sad. Enough he said. Answer my question. She searched his face. She was tall for a woman, although shorter than he was. She was slender and pretty in a hard fashion, with calculating brown eyes. He wondered what had happened to her veil. He did not think Meta would like her, not because the woman wasn't a decent person. 
Meta would not like the woman because she had a way about her, a way that Maddox liked. I warned you not to come here, remember? The woman said. Yes, he said, not knowing if that was true or not. His instincts told him she was telling the truth. He was usually a good judge of character and good at telling when others lied. You don't remember me, do you? She asked. He shrugged. They did a number on you, didn't they? Her eyes widened. Did they tag you? Maddox almost said no. In the midst of a mission, lying came second nature to him. But in this case, yes, he said. They tagged me. The woman swore, seemed about to run. Maddox grabbed an arm again. She brought up the pin jabber. Maddox knocked it out of her hand. The needle weapon shattered against a locker. Who are you? He said. Give me the truth. Finley Bow, she said in a deadened voice. What are you? She hesitated before saying, I'm a muck, a pilot. The way she said it, it probably meant smuggler. You have a ship? Maddox asked. Great, she said. That's just great. They mind scrubbed you too. They're probably moving in on us even now. Look, she said in earnest. Your name is Captain Maddox. You didn't tell me that, but I found out just the same. I lifted this. She tried to reach back with her free hand and then winced as Maddox squeezed her arm with considerable force. Do it slowly, he warned. She nodded, slowly reaching back, and produced a small leather wallet. Maddox released her, opened the wallet, and saw his ID. You lifted this from my pocket? he asked in disbelief. No. On the way in, you stashed a small bag in my ship. I saw it, even though you tried to hide it without me seeing. I opened the seal. Give it, he said. If you mean the rest of your stuff, it's on my ship. Maddox studied her. If Finley was correct, he'd hired her to bring him onto the asteroid. That meant she could likely take him off it. How much did I pay you? He asked. A hundred thousand credits, she said, with a bonus if I brought you out. She'd probably inflated the price in order to try to get more credits from him later, but that was fine. What is this place? He asked. Look, she pleaded. You said they tagged you. That means they can follow you with a locator. Maybe, he said. The tag shorted earlier. She stared at him. Maddox took a risk, half turned and pointed at the back of his head. Finley swore again with greater force. We're screwed, she added. You're a freak, one of Chang's zombies. What are you supposed to do, infiltrate? Maddox shook her so her teeth rattled. It only tingles when he presses the pain button. She blinked at him several times. If it tracks me, Maddox paused. Could that be true? Was the master, was Chang the master, tracking him even now? You're a mercenary pilot, he said. We have to leave. Finley shook her head. I want to leave, but there's no freighter scheduled for another three days. If we leave now, as you say, Chang will send out his scouts. The scouts will blast us so our remains will float in space for the next million years. No, I have people out there. I don't believe you. If Chang is tracking us, Chang won't care, she said, interrupting. His bouncers will, though. Bouncers? Don't you remember anything? Just a little, he said. Finley appraised him again. You're a slick one, all right. It looks like you escaped after they caught you. All right, if you're tagged, I'm already screwed. But we won't go down without a fight, right? Right, he said. Then let's make a run for the hangar bay. If Chang's bouncers are there, maybe you can kill them, and we can grab my ship, get clearance, and go. What about your gunmen? She sneered. They're not mine. They're local protection. I thought you said you remembered at least a little. I did. So it's just you and me, then? Maddox asked. You're finally getting it, aren't you? We're totally screwed. 
I never should have listened to you. Don't worry, Maddox said. We're going to make it. Why do you think that? She asked. It was a reasonable question. Instead of answering, Maddox spun thinly around and pushed her toward the hatch. In situations like this, speed often counted for everything. And he didn't know why he thought that. Chapter 7 Finley received a lesson in Captain Maddox's efficiency. He used the pain wand and a sap like an artist, leaving cracked heads and unconscious questioners everywhere. If Chang's men were hunting for them, they should be easy to find by following the trail of snoring bodies. The trick is speed, Maddox told her. Finley shook her head, bewildered by his performance. It's time to really run, he said. Finley was already running down a corridor with Maddox beside her. She ran as fast as she could, her feet pounding against the floor. The corridor led toward the asteroid's main hangar bay. Maddox had stolen tech IDs, a beam carbine, and a headset. The captain wore the headset, but Finley heard hangar personnel alerting the tower for two fugitives worth half a million credits each from Chang. Half a million credits? Who was this guy? Why would Chang pay that much, and why for her, too? Finley's feet tangled, and she would have gone down, slamming her nose against the floor. But Maddox grabbed an arm, keeping her upright. Once she got her feet back under her again, he sprinted even faster while keeping hold of her. The air burned into her lungs as sweat dripped from her face. What had she gotten herself into? As the two ran, Maddox cocked his head. According to his headset, the guards ahead said they were ready. Maddox had debated with himself to ditch Finley. He could do this without her, but he owed the woman. She could have faded into the woodwork. Instead, she'd nabbed him, as he'd no doubt instructed her to do before Chang's people had captured him. Her action had his signature style and had likely saved his life. He wouldn't ditch her. He paid his debts, good or bad. No matter what happens, he shouted, keep following me. Finley glanced at him with glazed eyes. After releasing her, Maddox began to truly run, sprinting faster than any Olympic athlete. In seconds, he raced around a corner, spying two guards outside a security hatch. Despite what they'd said on the comm earlier, they must not have expected him like this or so soon. Instead of kneeling, aiming their weapons, each guard watched the corner but kept his weapon down by his thigh. Now the guards tried to bring up their carbines. Maddox fired from the hip. A beam drilled the first guard in the face. The captain hadn't aimed for the chest because the guard might have been wearing armor. The second man went down almost as fast as the first. His face burned off. It was brutal but effective and took pinpoint accuracy. In moments, Maddox dragged the smoldering corpses to the side and opened the security hatch with one of the recognition codes. Finley finally staggered around the corner, looking sweaty and beat. As a pilot and asteroid dweller, she'd probably never run this fast or far before. That couldn't be helped. As she lurched near, Maddox once more grabbed one of her arms and half lifted her as they ran through the open hatch down a short corridor and entered what had to be the asteroid's main hangar bay. They slowed to a walk then. This was a back way in, which was why they'd needed the tech IDs earlier. The cavernous hangar bay was full of docked shuttles and ships. Crews dragged fuel hoses to some. Deck workers repaired others. Finley groaned as she stared into the distance. Maddox followed her gaze to an obvious smuggler's craft. Are those Chang's men? He asked, indicating a group of black-clad heavies beside the ship. Yes, Finley panted. Maddox looked around. He saw a coaster to his left that could work. It was a two-man craft, a little bigger than the flitters he sometimes used for landings on alien planets. We'll use that, he said, pointing with his chin. Finley shook her head. You're crazy. We'll last a day out there, tops in that. Then what do we do? There's nowhere else to land in the system. Now, if there was a freighter coming, we're gambling that there is, Maddox said. Finley gave him a worried look and must have seen the determination in his eyes. Listen to me, 
she pleaded. I'll take the beating. Maybe Chang will have me tagged. At this point, I don't care. I'd rather be alive than not. You're going to live, and live untagged, but only if you stick with me. I don't think so. You're crazy, and believe me, it shows. You're rated a comp tech, right? So? Finley asked nervously. Don't look over there. Hey! A Shanghai heavy shouted. That's Maddox! Let's get him, boys! Seven Shanghai gunmen standing guard around Finley's smuggler craft turned toward him. Each was massive, but broke into a faster run than any normal could do, proving their 2G heritage. Maddox didn't hesitate. He knelt on one knee, powered up the battle carbine, sighted and burned down the last man in the group. He did not target the first man, as others would see the person drop. That might make the others more cautious. He did not want them cautious. He wanted them racing like charging bulls, so he could cut them down. The second-to-last gunman flopped onto the deck. So did the third. That was when the first runner looked back, shouted in dismay, and watched the fourth member of the team smash onto the deck with a smoldering burn hole in his face. I'm going to be sick, Finley said. A hangar siren began to blare. Finley moaned in dread. The remaining gunmen fired back, sending a fusillade of bullets. Finley hit the deck as slugs whined and ricocheted everywhere. One of them tore Maddox's jacket at the shoulder of the previously injured arm, sending up a spray of blood. The captain kept beaming. He seemed impervious to pain. Then it was over. The Shanghai heavies dead on the main hangar deck. Everyone else had disappeared, having ducked out of sight. Maddox stood and waved the end of the carbine back and forth as if cooling the tip. He hadn't checked his shoulder yet. He turned and regarded Finley with eyes that seemed to be made of steel. Who are you, really? She asked, awed but still in panic mode. We'll talk about that later, he said. You still don't get it, she said, beginning to sound hysterical even to her own ears. Sure, we can steal the coaster and fly into space. But now, Chang will order all his strikers after us. We won't stand a chance against them. Our only chance was slipping away quietly. Maddox did not seem to listen as he peered into the distance. What now? She asked in growing dismay. He looked at her. I was going to suggest we grab the rest of my equipment from your ship. We can't now. More of them are coming. What? She said, whipping her head around to look where he had been staring. More of Chang's black-clad heavies burst onto the hangar bay. They looked around, shouted, and pointed at Maddox. Maddox grabbed Finley, slinging her much too easily over his bloody shoulder, and sprinted for their chosen craft. Well, his chosen craft. Chapter 8 Maddox shoved Finley at the coaster's main hatch. She tried the outer combination, but the hatch wouldn't open. No, she moaned. It's over. We're dead. We're... Maddox spun her around and slapped her across the face. She blinked at him in shock as pain jolted her mind. Outrage flared next. He put his face an inch from hers. Get it open. Get the thing running. Now. A light snapped on in Finley's eyes, indicating the terror had taken a back seat. Right, she said. Maddox faced the charging bulls, once more took a knee, and fired the battle carbine. The new Shanghai heavies scattered, jumping behind ships or dropping and sliding on their torsos as they tore out their guns. A few fired back, but they were too far away for effective pistol shots. Maddox drilled one guy in the face, killing him. The rest of those who dropped to the floor scrambled for cover. Behind him, Finley laughed with glee. Maddox glanced back as the hatch opened. Finley darted into the coaster. Maddox followed as he fired the battle carbine. Hurry, Finley cried. Maddox came through. She slapped a control and the hatch snapped shut. This wasn't like a shuttle. It was much smaller. 
The woman squeezed into the pilot's chair and began pressing panel switches. We got a break, Finley said. These are easy to warm up. Maddox stowed the carbine as he squeezed into the other seat. He began activating a weapons board. I don't know what you think you're going to do, Finley said as she continued to manipulate the controls. We don't have clearance. Tell me again, why is the tower going to just open the outer bay door for us? Just get us airborne, Maddox said. I'll do the rest. The engine whined as the coaster began to vibrate. We have plenty of fuel, Finley said. But we're not airborne yet, Maddox said. She shot him an accusatory glance, tapped the controls, and the flitter began sliding along the hangar bay deck. That make you happy? Finley asked. I tried to lift us too soon. Don't give me excuses, Maddox said coldly. Just do your job. Her jaw muscles bulged as she ground her teeth together. Her fingers seemed stiffer as she punched controls. The small coaster lifted off the deck. Turn us, Maddox said. Aim us at the gunman. Finley licked her lips and did as the captain ordered. Maddox's fingers blurred across the controls. From the underbelly of the coaster, a cannon chugged 20-millimeter shells at the Shanghai gunman. What are you doing? Finley cried. You'll damage some of those ships. That's going to get a lot of people seriously pissed off at me. Maddox ignored her as he continued to rain heavy shells at the hidden locations. Some of the gunmen broke, racing for the exit. Maddox targeted them. The coaster swung about as it headed for the main closed hangar bay door. Don't do that again, Maddox said. I was killing them. I'm the pilot. Maddox stared at her. Finley hunched her head. Okay, okay, she said. Don't be a grouch about everything. Now, how do we get that hangar bay door open again? It's shut in case you forgot. Maddox flipped a switch, turning on the comm. He tapped the selector for long-range communication. Bring in the space marines, he said. If the bay doors remain closed, blow them open. I repeat, blow the main doors open unless the authorities cooperate. Who are you talking to? Finley shouted. Maddox did not answer. He was too busy staring at the hangar bay door. Why are we racing for the door like this if space marines are ready to storm Smade's asteroid? Finley asked. Someone else must have thought the same thing. The comm crackled as the screen blinked. Maddox pressed a switch. The screen activated. A bearded man with gray eyes regarded him. The man wore a tower uniform. Who are you? The operator asked. Open the outer bay door, Maddox said. If you don't, I'm not responsible for the people on Smade's asteroid. The operator seemed queasy but stubborn. I heard your message. I think I was supposed to hear it. Our scanners don't pick up anything out there. You know what I'm saying? There are no space marines waiting to enter. Suit yourself, Maddox said, seemingly indifferent to the situation. He turned to Finley. Start blowing up spaceships. I have orders not to let anyone escape. That doesn't make any sense, the bearded operator said from the screen. If you don't want anyone to escape, I should keep the hangar bay door shut. Get off this frequency, Maddox told the operator. I'm expecting a call any second. Come on, get real, the operator said, looking more worried. My scanners would have shown stealth ships by now if they were out there. Maddox scowled as he gave his full attention to the tower operator. I know what you're thinking, that this is a Star Watch operation, but you're wrong. I'm with the Dominance. What? The man said, obviously perplexed. The Dominance, the new men, Maddox said dryly. The operator stared at Maddox, and the man's eyes widened with horror. Maybe he noticed that Maddox looked like a new man. Oh, why? Are the new men here? The operator stammered. Can't you guess? Maddox asked in a sneering manner. The operator glanced elsewhere, stared as if listening to someone, and finally regarded Maddox again. I don't see anything out there, he whispered. I know, Maddox said with a smirk. You're not supposed to. The operator wiped a sleeve across his sweaty brow. You'll put in a good word for me? The operator whispered. I have already memorized your face and speech patterns, Maddox said. 
The operator whispered something under his breath and began to tap controls. The hangar bay door is opening, Finley shouted. Maddox had immediately clicked off the comm at her first syllable, lest she give away his scam. Go, Maddox told her. Keep accelerating once you exit the hangar bay. What direction should we head? Finley asked. In system, he said. What about the waiting space marines? She asked. Don't worry about them, just do what I tell you. Finley stared at Maddox a moment longer. There are no space marines waiting out there. Are there? She whispered. You make everything up as you go along. Maddox nodded. She had that right. Oh, crap, Finley said, turning pale as the little space coaster shot out of the hangar bay opening. Chapter 9 On Smade's asteroid, several minutes after the operator had opened the outer hangar bay door, his tower hatch opened, and three massive black-clad Shanghai heavies entered. These three were subtly different from the other heavies, seeming smarter somehow, like big male lions instead of snorting bulls. You're not supposed to be in, the operator said, abruptly silenced as one of the bruisers grabbed him by the throat, lifted him out of the seat, and crushed his windpipe. The huge Shanghai heavy twisted the operator's head for good measure, snapping the neck bones and tossing the puny man aside to expire on the floor. Only then did Strand the clone enter the control chamber, looking like a stunted dwarf compared to the threesome. The clone's eyes burned with passion as he studied the main screen. The stolen coaster zoomed away at what must have been full speed for the craft. Strand had followed Maddox's performance throughout his time on Smade's asteroid. According to his calculation, the hybrid had decreased in efficiency since the original Strand's capture in the Sin system. That decrease was interesting and heartening. The clone pulled out a small tablet-type unit punching highly advanced symbols into the logic processor. The unit was connected to a larger computing system on Strand's ship. Ah, uh, Strand said as he observed the results. The tiny screen showed strange symbols that almost seemed like Egyptian hieroglyphics. Strand knew what the symbols meant, but no one else would have. Give me that, Strand said. The biggest of the three Shanghai bruisers held a control unit close to his massive chest. The man had a bullet-shaped head and hot, beady eyes. He was Chang, a different kind of pirate lord, with the deadliest crew on Smade's asteroid. Even so, like a second-rate, cowed punk, Chang handed the unit to the wizened Strand. Strand inspected the device. Chang had been using units like this for two years already. The original Strand had taught Chang a few interesting tricks, as well as modifying the space pirate to near perfect obedience. The pirate lore did not realize that he now dealt with a different Strand, and that didn't matter in the slightest. The clone flipped open the unit's shield and pressed a red button. Nothing happened that anyone could see. He dropped the shield back into place and handed the unit back to Chang. After that, Strand turned and headed for the hatch. Just a minute, Chang managed to say. Strand raised an eyebrow that no one else saw. This was unexpected. How had Chang managed to resist his programming? Strand stopped turning to study the huge man. Chang tried to match the burning gaze, but failed. That's it? The pirate lord asked. That's all you wanted? Strand assessed Chang's inner struggle. It surprised him to realize that the pirate felt demeaned. If pushed too hard, Chang might conceivably test his powers. Strand wasn't ready for that just yet. 
What did you expect to happen? The clone asked. When you pressed that, Chang said, I thought the coaster would blow up. Strand almost sighed at the stupidity of the thought. He had believed Chang was intelligent in a positive sense. But such inferior thinking as this, no. Why would he, Strand, have gone to all this trouble just to blow up Maddox's ship? It made no sense. Besides, it didn't follow Chang's usual method of putting controlled officers back aboard a targeted ship. Instead of berating the pirate, Strand shook his head and started for the hatch again. Wait, Chang said. Strand paused. This time he did not sense any challenge. Chang sounded confused. Should I send strikers after Maddox? The pirate asked. Strand became impatient, scowling at the bigger man. Would you normally send strikers? Of course, Chang said. Then do so now. But why did you let Maddox escape then? The primate is curious about my motives, is he? Chang flushed crimson, finally saying, no one talks to me like that. Not even you, sir. This was amazing. The mouse roared at him. But Strand didn't have time for such antics. The crew of Victory was a deadly enemy. He had to leave this place now while he could. Don't worry about your prestige among your men, Strand said. It is quite intact. And don't worry about Star Watch, either. Everything will work out perfectly for you. What if my strikers reach the coaster? Chang asked. Believe me, they won't. The confusion showed again. Should I try to intercept the coaster? Chang asked. Yes, yes, try. Try your best, Strand said peevishly. It won't matter, though, as you won't capture or destroy the coaster. Chang studied the tracking screen. I can destroy the coaster easily enough. I could probably order the syndicate head to launch missiles right now. Then do so, Strand said. Chang raised his eyebrows. And if I destroy the coaster? Strand massaged his forehead. He had fed the various possibilities into the advanced computer, and it had spit out the answer. He knew what would happen, to a 99% probability. Chang was never going to destroy the coaster. If he did, Strand would have to reassess his entire strategy. Still, it was an interesting test. Therefore, he decided to goad Chang by shaking his head and leaving the tower control room. Chang watched him go, unaware of Strand's control over him via inner compulsions. He did not like Strand. He did like the credits Strand paid him, though, and he had salivated at the advanced sensing gear that Strand had offered him as part of the latest deal. The space pirate chewed his lower lip. Why did Strand think destroying the coaster would prove so difficult? Chang shrugged. He wasn't going to worry about that. He wasn't going to call up the syndicate head either. He was going to go out there himself in a striker to collect Captain Maddox. If the Star Watch officer was worth so much to Strand, how much more would the fleet captain be worth to Chang's hidden new man contact? Let's go. Chang told his guards. We have work to do. Chapter 10 Maddox sat in the passenger seat of the two-man coaster pressed back because of the high G's of Finley's acceleration. She struggled because of the high G's fighting to remain conscious. The coaster lacked any gravity dampeners to make the acceleration easier to withstand. 
Because Maddox was part new man, he could stand many more G's than she could. He thus studied his monitor in relative comfort. Smade's asteroid dwindled on his private screen. So far, nothing had left the asteroid after him. Maddox had half expected missiles to launch, or maybe a beam weapon to fire. Two larger spaceships were in orbit around the asteroid. They had done nothing either. The star system seemed nondescript. It had a G-class star, three terrestrial planets in the inner system, an asteroid belt, and four gas giants beyond. According to his monitor, there were four usable Lommer points in the system. No new vessels appeared on his screen. He hadn't expected any. Where was Starship Victory? He would guess behind one of the larger moons of the nearest gas giant. If the Star Watch vessel was out there, it hadn't left any signature. Maddox turned toward Finley. As he opened his mouth, a signal reached him. The signal had originated from the control device Strand had taken from Chang. The button Strand had pressed activated something in the chip implanted in the back of Maddox's skull. The embedded chip buzzed, and Maddox slumped unconscious against the safety straps holding him in his seat. Maddox's consciousness faded, burrowing deep into his unconscious mind. The captain dreamed strangely. It felt as if he zoomed down an incredibly long corridor. This might not have happened in the past. The process had something to do with his war against the Ska in the Alpha Centauri system a year ago. The Ska had been an ancient spirit entity trapped on one of the destroyers of the Nameless Ones. Those destroyers had been in a null zone that had been separate from regular time and space. The Nameless Ones had been through this part of the Orion Arm many thousands of years ago. Maddox had freed several destroyers from the Null Zone for use against the Swarm Fleet. He'd also inadvertently released the seemingly unkillable Ska. Later, he'd faced that Ska in the Alpha Centauri system. The fight against it had altered something in his mind. At this point, no one was aware of that, not even the captain. Maddox felt as if he raced through the corridor, going faster and faster. The ride was enjoyable, as Maddox liked speed, the faster the better. Then it seemed, in his dream state, as if he frowned. There was a noise outside the corridor. It was a harsh sound, a commanding one, growing more insistent by the moment. Hello? Maddox asked in his dream. The rush down the vast corridor continued, but so did the harsh commands hammering against his mind. Maddox scowled. He did not like the words. He did not like the manner in which they were spoken. Who did this person think he was trying to give him orders? If you have something to say, Maddox shouted, say it to my face. For a second, the harsh commands stopped. In their place, a superior sort of chuckling began. That infuriated Maddox, but it would not have shown on his features. It would have made him seem a little sterner, perhaps, his eyes a little more squinted, but that would have been it. In his dream state, Maddox concentrated. He realized that this was a memory. The commands had a hypnotic quality. They sought to control me. Maddox told himself. As the captain sped through his dream corridor unconscious in the coaster, he realized that someone had strapped him down in a chair earlier. Doctors had rotated the chair. A saw buzzed, cutting his skin. There had been pressure as a doctor had implanted the device in the back of his head. It had not gone deep into his skull. The doctor sewed the cut. The chair had rotated again, and a small wheel in front of Maddox's eyes had moved in a bewildering way. 
The pattern sought to numb his mind while a person spoke beside him. In his dream state, as Maddox still seemed to zoom down the endless corridor, he concentrated on the voice. He'd heard this person before. He knew the voice. It was the sound of... Strand, Maddox said. In the coaster, Finley finally noticed that Maddox was unconscious when he mumbled in his sleep. The dream state altered. Maddox no longer sensed anything. He heard no words. He saw no corridor. Instead, his consciousness departed his unconscious mind, and he went to sleep, no longer even dreaming. Chapter 11 Maddox had been correct about something. Starship Victory was behind the third moon of the most inward system gas giant, a pink-colored Saturn-sized planet. The double oval-shaped warship had been behind the moon in relation to Smade's asteroid for a week. The crew had one more 24-hour period to go before they went in after the captain. Lieutenant Valerie Noonan sat in the captain's chair on the bridge. During Maddox's absence, she was the acting commander. Valerie had let her hair grow longer since last year. Unfortunately, she'd also let her waist get a tad bigger due to comfort eating during the terrible battle against the Imperial Swarm Invasion Fleet. The battle was over, but the comfort eating had continued. Keith had been glancing at her stomach more often lately. He hadn't said anything, but she'd felt the pressure of his eyes hinting at his displeasure. Valerie sat in the command chair, staring at the main screen while thinking about chocolate cake. She hadn't eaten any chocolate cake for a long time. She hadn't eaten anything this morning, as she was in the midst of a new diet attempt. It wasn't only Keith's glances that had been bothering her. Valerie did not like the way her clothes fit too snugly. Maybe it was more than that. She was starting to feel older. When studying her face before a mirror, she'd noticed the tiniest of wrinkles on her brow. That horrified her. She tried not to frown anymore and not to smile too much either. She worked at keeping her features even keeled so no lines would develop. Do you notice that coaster, Valerie? The lieutenant looked up. The hollow image of Adoc Galleon had addressed her. The hollow image had ropey arms and an alien face with many crisscrossing lines. Galleon didn't have to worry about getting fat because hollow images didn't eat. Valerie glanced at the main screen. While Victory was behind the moon, a sensor drone orbited the stellar body on the other side. The drone was linked to the starship by several other drones at different locations. What about the coaster? Valerie asked. It accelerated out of the asteroid at a considerable rate, Galleon said. It has acted like a vessel on the run. Okay. Now, several strikers seem to be in pursuit, Galleon said. You think Captain Maddox is in the coaster? Valerie asked. The captain has not contacted us for some time, Valerie. Maybe he is in trouble. He would let us know if that was him, she said. Not necessarily, Galleon said. Valerie rubbed her chin. That isn't Finley Bowe's smuggler ship. The asteroid authorities might have discovered that Finley is in the captain's pay, Galleon said. Valerie made a face. The authorities that Galleon referred to were the social syndicate overlords of the asteroid. She hated space pirates with a particular loathing. Actually, because of letters of Mark from the social syndicate, the base personnel called themselves privateers. But that was just a fancy term for pirates. To Valerie, privateers or pirates were exactly like the gang members of Greater Detroit, scavengers that preyed on the weak and helpless. She'd grown up dealing with gangbangers and had learned to hate their ganging up tactics. 
To her, they were like hyenas. Space pirates were just like that, too. In fact, she didn't have any use for smugglers like Finley Bow either. But that was another matter. Valerie had seen gang members beat up on each other. That was probably what this was. She didn't think Maddox would get himself in such a pickle as to have to run in a tiny coaster pursued by larger strikers. Maddox would know better than to try that. Galleon could be such a worry wart at times. The hollow image was at his worst when it came to the captain's safety. What if it isn't the captain? Valerie asked Galleon. What if instead the captain is in danger inside the asteroid, and us appearing out here to help the coaster makes everyone inside the asteroid go crazy against Maddox? They hate Star Watch over there, remember? I am familiar with the mission parameters, Galleon said. Look, Valerie, the strikers are gaining on the coaster. I have detected radar lock on. They appear ready to fire on the vessel. Valerie stared at the situation on the screen. Maybe if she ate a ham sandwich, her mind would clear up. How was anyone supposed to think clearly if she were hungry all the time? We're too far away to make any difference, she pointed out. Keith is not too far, Galleon said. He's waiting where he is for emergency action only, Valerie said. No, you have to give me evidence that the captain is in the coaster, otherwise I'm possibly harming him by showing our hand too soon. Hail the vessel, Galleon suggested. Valerie considered that and shook her head. Hailing them will give us away just the same as if we showed them victory. May I make a suggestion, Galleon asked. Save it for later, Valerie said, irritated. Yet, despite her hunger, and despite her certainty that the coaster held scummy pirates instead of Maddox, Valerie bent forward in the command chair to watch the ongoing events. Chapter 12 The clone Strand also watched the action. He did so from his secret ghost ship. It was a unique vessel hardly bigger than a Star Watch shuttle. It was, however, of builder design, with many revolutionary systems. The clone sat in the command chair, using gravity waves to build up speed. He observed the fleeing coaster and the three following strikers. Slender craft, the strikers were mostly fuel and engine, with forward compartments for the two-man crews. Each striker had twin cannons capable of firing 30 millimeter shells. Sometimes a striker carried a few missiles. These three did not. They were the perfect pirate ships. Small, maneuverable, and easy to hide behind stellar debris. Like ancient pirates, the asteroid looters did not use large spaceships. The strikers were more like canoes on ancient Earth during the time of sailing vessels. In those days, pirates had often used a mass of low canoes to sneak up on an unsuspecting anchored merchantman, until the canoes bumped up against the wooden hull, and then the pirates swarmed aboard. The strikers had much greater acceleration than the coaster. They would be in firing range in less than two minutes. As Strand watched the situation, he made a face. He did not see why his advanced computer had said Maddox would get safely away 99 times out of 100. Chang seemed to hold all the advantages out there. Could the computer be that off? If so, he might have to alter his plans. Strand knew very well, of course, that Starship Victory was behind the largest moon of the nearest gas giant. Had the original Strand been wrong to trust the advanced computer? After all, the original had failed in the SIND system. Captain Maddox had captured him there. Was there something different about Maddox that upset the incredible builder software? Strand's ghost ship continued to drift in system through the asteroid belt. So far, everything had proceeded smoothly enough. Strand had followed the computer's suggestions, 
and by them lured Starship Victory out here between the Chin Confederation and the social syndicate worlds. Strand the Clone had woken up in a distant star system during the grim, swarm invasion of human space. He had learned that the original Strand was a captive of the new men on the throne world. His activation was the key to a revenge plan on the original's part. Strand the Clone had reached the solar system 26 days after Starwatch's last battle with the swarm. Strand had begun his secret work shortly after that. The clone had labored hard, only using a few secret assets left on Earth and Mars. He had been one man working across many months to achieve his careful purpose. Professor Ludendorff's sullen anger had greatly aided him. The professor had left the solar system in a huff, taking Dr. Dana Rich with him. Strand smirked as he remembered. Ludendorff might have understood certain signs. The old fool was cunning. Now, though, no one on the other side truly understood his genius. The new men no longer had spies on Earth. The spacers had departed. Strand cracked his knuckles. His only worry was the advanced computer's reliability. If Chang caught or destroyed Maddox. The wizened clone stabbed a switch on his console. When nothing happened, he pressed it again. A moment later, a hatch slid up. A hovering builder robot moved through the hatch. It looked like a large, upright artillery shell. Strand, the original, had found the robot and the advanced computer long ago. The original had left both in storage, fearing to use builder tech. Now, with no other tools available, and due to the parameters of the Samson option, the clone had decided to activate the complex machinery. Maddox is in danger, Strand told the robot. The robot neither said nor did anything. The computer said Maddox would survive his mission to the asteroid, Strand told the robot. Your statement is incorrect, the robot said in a stilted voice. The captain will escape 99 times out of 100. You're telling me we're watching the one time the computer is wrong? The computer is correct, the robot said. Chang is easily going to destroy Maddox. No. No? Strand asked. The computer has rendered its verdict. Maddox will escape. Strand looked up at the screen. The strikers were closing in fast. What was he missing? What did the builder computer know that he did not? A queasy feeling of doubt touched Strand. Had it been a mistake to activate the builder robot and computer? He would never have done so, but under the Samson option, he could use such tools. What did it matter if the tools became uncontrollable? The Samson option meant that he was supposed to destroy everything he could. Chang's strikers have achieved radar lock-on, Strand said. Wait, the robot said. It is not yet over. Strand scowled, nodding, hating the churn in his guts. He'd staked far too much on the computer's computations. If Chang captured Maddox or even killed him, the privateer would become unbearably smug, to say nothing about Strand's future success with his greater goals. A second later, Strand shrugged. Well, if Chang did become too smug, at least it wouldn't be for very long. Chapter 13 Maddox's head swayed back and forth as Finley tried one jink after another. His eyelids fluttered as his neck muscles finally stiffened, keeping his head from flopping all over the place. 
The captain smacked his lips as consciousness slowly returned to his brain. He sat up and noticed Finley giving him a quick glance. Glad to have you back, she said. You're just in time to watch them kill us. Instead of responding, Maddox reached up behind his head and felt the stitches. He should have ripped them out some time ago. Could he shove his fingers into the wound and yank out the device? Maddox frowned. There was something else. Something he wasn't remembering. The comm beeped. Finley glanced at him again. Terror filled his eyes. Chang is going to demand our surrender, she said. Maddox wiped his lips with the back of a hand, squeezed his eyelids closed, and then opened them. He clicked the comm switch. On the screen, the bullet-shaped head of Chang appeared. The man seemed inordinately pleased with himself. We have radar lock on, Captain Maddox, Chang said. Maddox said nothing, although he nodded in agreement. The massive privateer showed off his index finger. All I have to do is press the firing switch and you're dead. Do you mind if I verify the validity of your statement? Maddox asked. It took a half second. Chang smiled grimly. No, no, please be my guest. Maddox tapped his controls. On his screen, he saw three tube-shaped strikers closing in on the coaster. There was an asteroid 50,000 kilometers away. The asteroid was nine kilometers in diameter, a pygmy compared to Smade's asteroid. Maddox noted the radar lock on the 30 millimeter cannons on each striker. The privateer was right. Chang had them dead to rights. The comm beeped again. Maddox tapped his console. Chang's gloating face reappeared. Well, Captain, what's it to be? I want to live, Maddox said in a plaintive voice. That's not an answer. Maddox seemed to hesitate. As he did, his manner changed. He became quite meek. Please, let me live. Chang laughed heartily. I wish Strand could see us now. Strand? Asked Maddox. That's right, Captain. Strand, Starwatch's terrible nemesis. That's impossible. Is it? Shall I put you to sleep again by pressing this? Chang showed off the control device. Maddox's mouth dropped open in shock as he reached back and touched the stitches. Chang leaned nearer to his screen, and his manner became intense. Jettison your cannon, Captain. Turn your ship and begin deceleration. If you don't immediately comply, I will obliterate your vessel. We are complying, Maddox said. No, Finley said beside him. Maddox reached across his console into her space and slapped a switch. The coaster shuddered. Outside the viewing bay, the vessel's cannon tumbled end over end. Very good, Captain, Chang said. You're being wise. I want to survive, Maddox explained. And I want to add that I'm worth quite a ransom. Is that so? Chang asked in a smug manner. Maddox nodded. It will cost Starwatch plenty to get you back, Chang said. If I ransom you to them, that is. Why wouldn't you? Maddox asked. They're the only ones who would want me. Do you think so? Maddox's eyes widened. No, he said, sounding terrified. You wouldn't ransom me to the... He let the last hang because he didn't know who Chang referred to. The new men, Chang said. But the new men are our allies, Maddox said. Chang laughed again while rubbing his hands in glee. Should I rotate the coaster? Finley asked him quietly. Maddox turned to her, scowling thunderously. Couldn't the little smuggler keep her mouth shut? On the screen, Chang stopped laughing. Maddox faced the privateer, his features nearly unrecognizable as he began to beg. Please, 
Don't ransom me to the new men. Starwatch will pay you a bonus for me. What do I care about that? Chang asked. Sir, Maddox said. From her pilot's seat, Finley was staring at Maddox in shock. Rotate your vessel, Chang said. You must begin decelerating at once. Outside the coaster, one of the strikers pulled up less than 500 meters from them. The striker had rotated and decelerated with hot exhaust so it wouldn't overshoot the slower moving coaster. Do you have any idea when the ransom talks would begin? Maddox asked. No more stalling, Chang said. Rotate your vessel. Yes, at once, Maddox said. He faced Finley. Rotate us, he said, while giving her a minute head shake. What's that supposed to mean? Finley asked. Maddox closed his eyes almost as if in pain. Rotate the ship, he shouted, opening his eyes and leaning toward her. That leaning took him slightly out of sight of the comm screen. Don't do anything, Maddox whispered to her. Finley stared at him as if the captain was going crazy. Her hands hovered over the controls. Why isn't your pilot rotating the coaster? Chang demanded. I'm going to throttle her, Maddox said. Give me a second. You'd better hurry, Captain, Chang said. My patience is limited. Maddox unbuckled his restraining straps. Then he stood in the tight confines of the cabin and loomed over Finley. By doing so, Maddox put his back to the screen. What's wrong with you? She whispered. I'm buying us time, he whispered back. Then he shouted, I don't care what you think. Chang gave us his word. He said that he'll ransom us. You will not self-destruct this ship. That's an order. Rotate your ship, Chang said from the screen. I'm trying, sir, Maddox shouted. I think he's trying to trick us, someone said from Chang's screen. Maddox, do you hear me, Maddox? Chang shouted. Maddox slid back into his seat. We're rotating now, sir. We're doing it now. Several seconds ticked by. As they did, Maddox buckled his straps back into place. You're not rotating, Chang shouted. Rotate now, or I'm firing. Do you hear me? I do, sir. I don't know what's the matter. Maddox twisted in his seat to stare at Finley. Turn hard right and keep doing it. Go down and right and don't stop. It's our only hope. What? Finley said. Now, Maddox said insistently. Do it this instant or we're dead. Chapter 14 Lieutenant Keith Maker had been watching the four vessels. He was behind the nine-kilometer diameter asteroid, behind in relation to Smade's asteroid and to the fast-approaching spaceships. Just like Starship Victory behind its moon, Keith used an independent sensor in front of the asteroid to watch the ongoing situation. The lieutenant was a small, sandy-haired Scotsman noted for his daredevil flying skills and a penchant for whiskey, buried out of loyalty to Maddox. He had a thing for Valerie Noonan, despite her pent-up personality. She was a babe, and there was something anchoring about her personality that appealed to Keith. She was the opposite of him, and he liked that. He felt he could trust her. Keith nodded to himself even as he powered up his experimental fold fighter. He had monitored the communications over there. Captain Maddox was in the fleeing coaster. The wily captain had been using one of his trademark methods to get out of danger. It was a good thing he, Keith, was here. The captain must realize that only Lieutenant Maker could save his life. That was why it was so galling that the fold fighter was failing to fire up its jump capacity. The fold fighter was a modified heavy strike fighter common to Starwatch. The strike fighters were like old-fashioned jets, but they flew in space and attacked like a swarm of angry hornets. Modified was the key word here, as the fold fighter lacked the regular strike fighter's racy lines. This baby was a tin can, almost literally, a tube of metal with hundreds of sprouting antennae, cannons, and laser emitters. In the past, a tin can like this would have had a matter-antimatter missile. 
Keith did not have one of those today. The bulk of Starwatch's antimatter missiles had been burned up during the swarm invasion. Not that Keith would have used an antimatter missile in this case. Blast your balls! Keith shouted at the machine, banging a fist against the console. That didn't help a thing, except it made Keith feel a tad better. He shook his head, telling himself to think this through. He was the best strike fighter pilot in Star Watch. That was a fact. That didn't mean he was a good mechanic, but he knew how these things operated. He'd been behind the asteroid for several days already. He slept in a separate attachment pod, ate, played endless video games, and waited for the captain to show up. Keith had been in the pod when the four spaceships had spit out of Smade's asteroid. On the possibility that Maddox was in the coaster, Keith had immediately transferred to the tin can. The thing had been powering up ever since. Now, with the open transmission between Chang and Maddox, Keith floated to another panel, his fingers blurring over a console. He ran a diagnostic. A red light blinked on his board. Keith gave it three seconds thought, pushed himself away, and floated to a different board. He sat there, hesitating. Abruptly, he overrode the safety feature that was blocking the jump. It could kill them all. It could cause the jump mechanism to malfunction and throw them who knew where. Them are the risks, Keith muttered. He landed at his piloting seat, strapped in, and began running through the fold sequence. The countdown began. Right, Keith said. Now you're gonna see. Lieutenant Maker kicked in the thrusters. The ungainly-looking tin can began to move, picking up velocity as the thrusters roared hotter. The tin can aimed at the asteroid. Keith turned so he curved around the asteroid's edge, building up speed and calculating his attack plan. This was going to be sweet. He hoped Maddox got out of his way, because if the captain didn't, balls to the wall, Keith said, activating the fold. For two seconds, nothing happened. Then the tin can disappeared as it folded through space, making a short hop in the proverbial blink of an eye. During that time, Finley banked the coaster hard right and down. It zoomed out of the direct path of the three strikers. On the coaster's screen, Chang shouted in outrage. Don't think that's going to help you, Maddox. We're... Chang stopped talking because a spaceship literally appeared out of nowhere before the three strikers, barreling directly at the Tri-Formation. It was Keith's fold fighter. The lieutenant had passed out due to jump lag. He'd taken his drugs, of course. With a shudder of air, Keith lifted his head. He felt a little groggy, but his mind started functioning almost right away. The coaster was still pulling hard G's, it was possible the pilot had blanked out with such a violent maneuver. If she had, maybe Maddox could reach over and bring them out of it. Keith cackled in a sleepy manner. The strikers headed straight at him. One slowed down, shedding its velocity. The other two took aim at him. A light blinked on Keith's board. One of the strikers had radar lock on. Its cannons fired 30 millimeter shells that headed straight at Keith's vessel. The fold fighter had heavier armor than the coaster. It could probably take a few of those shells. Keith's cackle rose in pitch. He slapped a button. Anti-personnel guns tracked the approaching shells, beginning to chug solid shots. Aha! An enemy shell exploded prematurely. So did another. By that time, the fold fighter was almost upon the two nearest strikers. Keith had yet to target anything. His mind was sharp enough, so that wasn't the problem. Three, two, one, he said. Keith slapped a switch. As the tin can accelerated, reaching the two nearest strikers, a new pulsar weapon radiated a pulse. The pulse traveled outward from the tin can like a rough-edged smoke ring. The edge of the pulse struck the two strikers, and bulkheads crumpled. One of the strikers began to tumble end over end. Keith studied his screen. It worked, he whooped. The son of a gun really worked. The fold fighter began to shiver. Rage entered Keith's eyes. The last striker fired at his precious vessel. 
The Scotsman activated his cannons, targeted, and a laser sliced through the striker's skin, reached a fuel pod. A fiery explosion told the end of the story. The fold fighter absorbed various particles as it passed the former striker's location. Chalk up another victory to the ace, Keith said. At that point, he began breaking and turning. He had to make sure the other two strikers were out for good. Maybe one of them had a kamikaze switch and would try to take out Maddox with them. Chapter 15 Strand sat back in wonder as his ghost ship continued to accelerate from Smade's asteroid. Maddox had evaded capture and destruction. A fold fighter had literally appeared out of nowhere and saved the day for the captain. You miscalculated, Strand told the robot. Maddox survived. The large artillery shell-shaped robot replied. Yes, but not of his own doing. Is that positively reasoned? The robot asked. Strand stared at the builder construct. Are you going to tell me that Maddox foresaw such events and planned in advance? I am not suggesting that. What then? Captain Maddox pre-plans. He acts promptly in emergencies. These factors are all weighted and applied to the greater calculation. In this instance, given all the possibilities and probabilities, Captain Maddox would survive. Thus the computer reasoned and thus occurred. In other words, Strand said, he got lucky. Luck is a fairy tale concept for weak minds, the robot said. Strand leaned forward in his chair as he studied a screen. Starship Victory had left its hidden location by the third moon. The huge warship accelerated for Smade's asteroid. Now, Star Watch would want to rip apart the entire asteroid in order to find evidence. Luckily, he had foreseen the move. The clone turned to the robot. There is no such thing as luck, he asked. The computer does not factor for luck, which is not real. It factors for evidence, giving everything a number. Random events are not luck the robot said, interrupting. A random event can help or hurt an individual. That is not luck. Maybe your software is lacking in subtlety, Strand said. The computer software is the greatest in the galaxy. I retreat from your flawless logic, Strand sarcastically told the robot. The computer knew you would, the robot said. Strand stiffened, although only for a moment. Was the builder computer analyzing him? He did not like that, and he wondered if the robot had made a slip. There was a worse possibility. The robot had not slipped, but had deliberately told him that in order to goad him towards some future action that the computer already desired. How could Strand ensure that he remained in control of the builder, robot, and computer, and not vice versa? While scratching his right cheek, Strand wondered if he should turn off the robot. He finally rejected the idea. He needed the robot for a little while longer. Until then, he would have to act cautiously around it. The robot had been watching Strand as the human contemplated possibilities. The robot was a master at body language reading, at the science of kinesics. Satisfied with the human's condition, it now turned around and floated through the hatch. Strand was acting within the normative parameters set by the computer. Thus, the robot did not yet have to eliminate the amazingly gifted human. The computer needed the fantastic human mind for a little while longer. Chapter 16 
From the hard banking coaster, Maddox witnessed the ace's brilliance as Keith defeated the strikers. The captain knew the ace could do it. Finley saw the victory too. She straightened their small spacecraft so the excessive G's from hard banking bled away. Maddox touched the back of his head, fiddling with the stitches. The good feeling from seeing Keith win faded some, but did not altogether evaporate. Was Strand behind the implant operation? The Shanghai heavy Jond had said as much. Yet that should be impossible. Strand should be in captivity on the throne world. There were three possibilities concerning that. One, Strand had escaped from the new men. Well, the Methuselah man could have struck a deal with them, but that seemed unlikely. Two, the Methuselah man John had spoken about was a clone of the original. Strand had used clones of himself before. Thus, a clone Strand was well within the realm of the possible. The third possibility was that John had been incorrect about Strand being the master. Maddox tended toward the second possibility. It made the most sense, given Strand's and Ludendorff's past actions, and the new men's hatred toward Strand. The new men were the least likely people to make a mistake regarding Strand. Look, Finley shouted. Maddox looked up. She pointed at the screen. One of the drifting strikers exploded. Several seconds later, the last intact striker also detonated. Finley turned to him in accusation. Why did your man do that? Keith? Maddox asked. He didn't. You saw those strikers? I did. They blew up! Finley shouted. I'm right here, Maddox said softly. I can hear you just fine. She glared at him. Maddox was perplexed. I just said that I saw the strikers. Why would you assume that Lieutenant Maker fired at them while they were helpless? Maddox finally recognized the cause of her bewilderment. I see. It doesn't occur to you that they might have self-detonated? That's crazy, Finley said, sounding more agitated than ever. Why would they do that? Yes, that's an excellent question, one I don't intend to leave unanswered. Finley stared at him until she noticed her sensor panel. She bent forward as her fingers tapped against the console. Do you see that? She asked. She obviously referred to Starship Victory, which accelerated from behind the third moon of the pink-colored gas giant. Finley glanced at him with understanding. Do you belong to them? No, Maddox said. They belong to me. What? You're telling me that you're the Starship's captain? Maddox said nothing. No, that's not reasonable. Starship captains don't go alone onto enemy asteroid bases, certainly not a pirate asteroid base. Privateer, Maddox said. Whatever, it's the same difference. Wrong, Maddox said. From all indications, the social syndicate is behind the base. That's quite a bit different from an independent actor. Of course, that might also be a front. Maddox nodded to himself. Yes, the social syndicate angle is most probably a front. Once more, he touched the stitches at the back of his head. Finley noticed. You said Chang tagged you. Now Chang is dead. What's next on the agenda? Maddox pointed out the small port window. We're going to board the fold fighter. It will take us to victory. And then? She asked. Then you get paid your bonus. Finley blinked several times until finally a smile broke out. I like the sound of that, she said. Maddox had thought she would. Keith contacted the coaster, instructing the Merc pilot on docking procedures with the tin can. The self-destruction of the pulsar-wrecked strikers seemed odd. According to his sensors, nothing had been seriously out of whack with the strikers. They shouldn't have blown up like that due to a malfunction. That left the grisly option of the pilots killing themselves. That didn't make much sense for pirates or privateers. Keith shrugged. It wasn't his problem. He was the gifted pilot doing what no one else could do in the pinch. 
That was why Star Watch paid him. He noticed that Finley was okay at docking, but he had to compensate for her twice. In a bit, a hatch slid up and Captain Maddox floated through. Welcome aboard, sir, Keith said. What's with the goofy hat? Maddox gave him his trademark stare. Sometimes the captain didn't like people asking him questions. They shaved him bald, the merc said as she floated in after Maddox. That's what's with the hat. Keith couldn't help it. He turned sharply to stare at Maddox. He was smart enough to keep any remarks to himself, though. Get us home, Maddox said stiffly. Aye, aye, sir. That was some terrific flying earlier, Finley told him. Keith grinned. That was a piece of cake, but I'm glad you liked it. I could have taken out 20 of them with a the new pulsar wave. Lieutenant, Maddox said, interrupting. Keith looked at the captain expectantly. The captain said no more. Finally, Keith got it. The pulsar weapon system was new, experimental. Finley was a merc. A Star Watch lieutenant wasn't supposed to give away fleet secrets to a mercenary. You can sit there, Keith told the merc, and you'd better take an injection. What for? Finley asked. We're gonna jump. In this thing? She asked. Keith glanced at Maddox. The captain was studying something on a screen. This is a fold fighter, the ace said. Finley shook her head. Take the injection. Keith said. You'll find out soon enough and be glad you took it. Yes, do hurry, Maddox said. He shut off his screen. I want to get on to victory as soon as possible. Chapter 17 The Hollow Image Galleon studied the asteroid base. He was an ancient AI program run from the engrams of the last Adox starship captain. This had been his command, his starship once, over 6,000 years ago against the swarm. The insect-like creatures had annihilated his world, detonating it into many floating rock chunks. The swarm had committed racial genocide against the Adox. It had left Galleon with a bitter taste, so to speak, against anyone committing genocide against any other race. The ad hoc AI program had many builder functions within it. 6,000 years ago, the builders had intervened against the swarm, although it hadn't been enough to save Galleon's race. Galleon loved the crew of Starship Victory. Captain Maddox and his wife Meta, Lieutenant Valerie Noonan, Lieutenant Keith Maker, Sergeant Tregesson Riker, and Dr. Dana Rich were all his best friends. Galleon did not quite feel that way about Professor Ludendorff. The Methuselah man was gone, though, having taken his lover, Dr. Rich, with him. Galleon would have liked to know how Dana was doing. The hollow image was quite sure a peeved Ludendorff could take care of himself. Galleon stood at a bay window as he peered into space. He used the starship sensors to study the Tristano system. He had watched Keith perform another fold fighter miracle. It was the ace's characteristic move. The tin can was making another fold, bringing Captain Maddox and his mercenary pilot to the vessel. There was a lot of calm traffic at the asteroid base. A few ships accelerated away, the most notable being the two bigger spacecraft that had been parked outside. Galleon cocked his head. This was interesting. There was a new stream of data flowing from the base. It seemed that some of Chang's people had just died en masse from exploding heads. Obviously, that meant brain implants, since they had all exploded at once. Galleon ran an analysis. Methuselah Man's strand had been notorious for using brain implants on his top people, Strand was presently in custody on the throne world, but that didn't mean agents in Strand's former employ couldn't have used his old methods. Galleon ran further computations. Strand had another noteworthy habit. 
He liked moving about in a cloaked vessel. The small hollow image nodded, recalibrating a few ship sensors. He began the time-intensive process of searching the system for cloaked vessels. There was a vast emptiness of space to check. He began the sensor sweep by concentrating on the asteroid base and working outward in a growing circumference. Maddox's wife, Meta, was a strong woman from a 2G planet, but she was also shapely, blonde, and a trained assassin. Like Galleon, she stood at a viewing port on victory. She concentrated on the approaching fold fighter. Her husband was coming home after a dangerous infiltration mission on Smade's asteroid. Meta had been against the mission from the beginning. Why is the captain of a starship going undercover? She'd asked Maddox a little over a week ago in their quarters aboard ship. Because I'm the best intelligence field agent here, Maddox had told her. That doesn't matter. You're too important to risk on something like this. No, he'd said. The situation is too critical to let anyone but our best intelligence operative go undercover. I don't like it. Maddox had not said anything to that. They had had a furious bout of lovemaking afterward. She'd held him so tightly. He meant everything to her. He was a maddening husband, imperialistic, demanding, far too full of himself, and brilliant and strong, with a hidden sensitivity that few ever saw. He loved her, absolutely unequivocally. That was the important thing. He would risk anything for her. But he would not let anything stand in the way of his duty. He had a terrible need to win at whatever he did. He seemed to square off against the universe. His unique nature had marked him, often in an unkindly fashion. For one thing, Maddox wanted to kill his father for what the man had done to Maddox's mother. That didn't help the captain in the least. Meta smiled in relief as she saw the fold fighter breaking as it neared the main hangar bay entrance. Maddox had survived his undercover mission. She wondered what he'd discovered this time. She sighed. He'd almost died out there in space. He had... Galleon materialized before her. It made Meta jump back while her right hand snaked to the hidden gun on her person. How many times have I told you not to do that? She demanded. Galleon's eyelids fluttered. One hundred and thirty-two times in total, the hollow image answered. Then why did you still pop up like that? You must hurry to medical, Galleon said. Valerie sent me. I urge you to hurry. Why? Meta asked, worried now. Galleon hesitated. Tell me, she shouted, moving closer, trying to grab him. Her hands went through the hollow image. She backed up, shaking her hands, finding the experience troubling, highly unsettling. Is it Maddox? she demanded. Yes, Galleon said. During the fold. Yes, yes, what? Spit it out, Galleon. The captain went into a seizure. They are rushing him to medical. Is he going to be all right? I do not know, Meta. That is why I think you should hurry. Meta stared at the hollow image a second longer. Then she whirled around and began to sprint. Chapter 18 Captain Maddox felt weak. He didn't know how much time had passed. But for some time, it had felt as if he was falling down into an endless abyss. Fortunately, the sensation had ceased. He lay on something soft as people murmured around him. He tried to dredge up the strength to open his eyes. He did not understand this weakness. He hated it. He was Captain Maddox. Nothing was beyond him. He needed to concentrate to force his will by slow degrees, Maddox forced his eyelids to flutter open. Look, 
a woman said. He's coming out of it. Someone rushed near. Warm hands grasped his right arm. Darling. Maddox looked up into Meadow's sweet face. She was beautiful, and she seemed concerned. Maddox moistened his mouth. What? He whispered. Meta looked back at someone else. Tell, Maddox said weakly. Please allow me, a woman said from behind Meta. Reluctantly, Meta released his arm and stepped to the side. Maddox had difficulty tracking her. Captain, a woman said. Maddox's gaze slid away from Meta, making him feel sad. It took time for him to refocus on a thin-faced woman with a beak of a nose and a high forehead. He felt he should know her. I'm Dr. Lister, the woman said. I'm Victory's chief medical officer. Maddox continued to stare at her. You had a seizure, Lister said. Maddox moistened his mouth again. When did it happen? he whispered ever so slowly. We believe the fold caused it, Lister said. Maddox let that sink in, and he finally noticed the worry in the doctor's eyes. Implant, he said, too tired to finish his thought. We know about that, Lister said. We believe the implant had something to do with the seizure. In fact, Maddox started to fade away, which made him stubborn. He refused to pass out. Fear nibbled at him, but he was going to face down the fear. By slow degrees, Dr. Lister's narrow face reappeared. He's coherent again, Meta said from somewhere. Dr. Lister regarded Maddox. Can you understand me? Implant. Trigger, Maddox whispered. Lister glanced at Meta before focusing on Maddox. Yes, we've tested the linkage. The implant is subtle. It is booby-trapped, I believe is the correct word. I have to tell you, sir, I don't think I can take it out. Maddox understood what she was saying and the implications. A grim smile tugged at his lips. I'm quite serious, Lister told him. He knows that, Meta said. Maddox managed the slightest of nods. Listen. Operate, take out. I'm not sure you understand the risks of my doing that just now, Lister said. Don't care, Maddox said. Take out now. The worry in Dr. Lister's eyes turned into fear. I'm not sure I'm skilled enough to do that. Do it anyway, Maddox whispered. Sir, just a minute, Meta told the doctor. Let me talk to him. Lister seemed relieved. She backed away from Maddox. Meta took the doctor's place. She put her warm hands on his right arm again. She leaned near as she stared into his eyes. Maddox smiled. He loved Meta, and he knew she would force the doctor to operate. The operation could kill you. Meta said. He already knew that. It could cause permanent brain damage, she added. That gave him pause. The idea that he would be less than he used to be was galling indeed. But in the end, it didn't matter. He wasn't going to have a strand control unit in his head. He would rather die than allow such a thing to stay. I understand, Meta said quietly as she searched his eyes. And I'll honor your wish, my husband. But if you die on me, her grip tightened on his flesh. Must fight, Maddox whispered. Meta nodded, and tears welled in her eyes. The tears began to drip onto his shirt. Say it, she whispered. Love, he said. Yes, Meta said, letting the tears continue to drip. I love you too. Maddox smiled once more. Then he faded away. 
Meta had understood his desire. He no longer had to fight to remain conscious. They did what he wanted. You don't understand, Dr. Lister said. I, listen to me, Meta said, interrupting the doctor. Captain Maddox wants you to take the risk. He trusts your skills. The high forehead of Dr. Lister wrinkled in concern. What if I fail? Then you fail, Meta said grimly. He cannot stand the idea of anyone or anything controlling him. I appreciate that, Lister said. But let's wait until we reach a better facility. This is too important for any of us to take such an unneeded risk. Meta shook her head. That's not how Maddox thinks. He has a task to perform. He, he's sick, Lister said, interrupting. He's in no condition to make such a demand. I'm the chief medical officer. I'm the one who decides these things. He's going to have to wait. Maddox doesn't wait for anything if there's a faster way to do it, Meta said. You have your orders. Now perform them, doctor. Lister became stubborn. Not from the captain. I don't have any orders. I have your interpretation of what you think he wants. Meta's face screwed up with outrage. Are you saying I don't know what my husband was trying to communicate to us? Lister looked down. No, I suppose not. It's just, listen to me, Meta said earnestly. You signed up for Starship Victory. Here, Captain Maddox expects everyone to do their assigned duty. You're the surgeon. That means this task falls to you. You cannot escape the risk because you think, you fear, you might fail. Do you understand what you're asking me to do? Meta snorted. Doctor, Star Watch has had its back to the wall with the swarm invasion. The present bug assault might be over, but there might be more swarm fleets readying to invade the Commonwealth. We've all had to do things that frighten us. You signed up as a doctor. Now you have your back to the wall with this operation. You'd better do this surgery to perfection, because if you don't, just a minute. Lister said, interrupting. Are you threatening to kill me if I fail to perform the surgery correctly? Meta's face took on a cold, hard cast. Yes, doctor. That's exactly what I'm saying. Are you insane? No, Galleon said. The hollow image had popped into existence. Meta is a former assassin. Killing those who disappoint her is Meta's way. Meta loves the captain. If you fail to save the captain, Meta will follow her emotions and kill you. Lister stared in disbelief from Meta to Galleon. You're all crazy. Meta is correct in saying this is a trying time, Galleon said. I suggest you listen to her and do the best you can. I will attempt to assist you to the best of my ability. How can a hollow image help me perform a surgery? Dr. Lister demanded. I have been tracing the implant's connectives, Galleon said. I believe I can be of great service to you in mapping out his brain. Lister took a deep, perhaps calming breath. All right, I'll operate. She looked as if she wanted to say more, but seemingly decided against it. You're going to have to leave, though, Lister told Meta. I can't do this if I feel you're standing behind me with a knife in your hands, waiting to plunge it in my back. It took Meta three seconds. She nodded. She also determined that she was going to find the person who had ordered the implant put in Maddox's skull. Once she found the person, she was going to kill him or her in a year-long process filled with intense agony. Chapter 19 After the injections prepping him for the operation, Maddox traveled much closer to death than the doctors had anticipated. This happened because of the soul energizing weapon he'd used a year ago against the Ska in the Alpha Centauri system. 
The ancient builders had dreaded the day a ska would roam freely among the weaker races. They had put a deep memory in Professor Ludendorff. The Methuselah man had constructed a weapon to slay the ska. Maddox had used the weapon, burning up much of his personal soul energy to power the weapon. The ska and he had been in close contact during the fight. That contact had changed something inside Maddox's soul. Maddox hadn't perceived the change, however. No one had. It had been at a deep and fundamental level. After the soul-draining battle, the captain had to struggle to want to remain alive. In the midst of that anguish, a wall in his subconscious had come down for a while, exposing his earliest memories as a baby. For the first time in his adult life, Captain Maddox had remembered his mother. As the captain once more plummeted toward death as the doctors operated on his brain, trying to sever the implant from every invaded nerve fiber in his mind, something strange happened to Maddox. He remembered some of what had occurred to him less than a week ago in the operating theater inside the asteroid base. Medical personnel had inserted an implant into the back of his brain. Afterward, he had been placed in a chair with his head strapped into place. A color wheel had spun around and around before his eyes, playing tricks with his mind. Someone unseen had injected drugs into his system. The wheel turned. The drugs battered his mental defenses. The implant was a distraction. It was not the true danger. Strand spoke to him. Maddox recognized the smarmy voice all too well. He recognized that the Methuselah man attempted to bend his will through a form of alien hypnosis. This is what had caused the growling noises earlier in his dream state. He had been trying to remember what had happened. Strand, Maddox said in his near-death dream state remembrance of what had happened inside the asteroid base. Captain Maddox, Strand said, I congratulate you, sir, as you have an uncommonly stubborn will. While his head had been strapped into place, Maddox had managed to shift his gaze from the spinning wheel. With a grunting effort, he shifted his strapped-down head enough to see the wizened bastard standing nearby. That is quite amazing, my dear hybrid, Strand said. How did you escape from the throne world? Maddox asked. I'd worry about you, hybrid, not me. You're the one in mortal peril. No, Maddox said. There's something different about you. Your skin is too smooth. Why is it so smooth, Methuselah man? You will not gold me, Maddox. Not when I know how to adjust your personality so perfectly. You are going to do something quite amazing for me. I need you to break into a place on Earth forbidden to me. I get it, Maddox said. You're not the real Strand. You're a clone of him. The wizened features scowled. I am Strand. You're a clone of Strand. Clone or not, it makes no difference. It makes all the difference. I will defeat you, clone, just as I defeated the original. Strand grinned evilly. I doubt that, hybrid. You're my tool. You made a mistake coming here alone. The computer knew you would. What computer? It's a builder device, Strand boasted. With it, I have been predicting your every action. You're an open book to me now, Maddox. Isn't that funny? 
You're a fool. If you think you can use a thing like that, enough, Strand said, interrupting. We will proceed to the next lesson. Listen closely, hybrid. You are going to have to remember a great deal. Are you ready? Maddox had tried to resist. The drugs the doctors had injected had proven too strong, the wheel too intoxicating, and Strand's hypnotic abilities bordering on the miraculous. As the captain floated in the death dream state, he pondered the clone's instructions. He saw the cleverness of the plan, and he began to deduce the clone's real objective. Before Maddox could pinpoint it perfectly, though, his consciousness began to shoot upward out of the realm of death. The conflict with the Ska a year ago had changed things in Maddox. It had opened inner doors, making it seem as if Maddox possessed an inner eye. That gave him insights he never would have had otherwise. The only problem was that he had to sink near death to see with his inner eye. At that point, Maddox began to convulse on the operating table. Chapter 20 Galleon assisted in the operation as best he could. That was mainly in the opening procedures, giving Dr. Lister information about super-thin nerve threads leading away from the control chip into the captain's brain. Once Lister was underway with the actual operation, Galleon departed the theater. It was unexplainable, but the hollow image could not watch, finding it too distressing. He did not like seeing Maddox in such a vulnerable state, especially since the captain might very well die. What happened to one's soul after death? Galleon had often pondered the idea. Had his ad hoc soul passed on to a different place? His engrams had given the AI program life. Yet was he truly alive like those with souls? It was a terrible dilemma. Everyone had their own opinion on the matter. No one he knew had come back to report. How did one find out the unequivocal truth? It was a thorny problem, to say the least. To take his mind off the operation, Galleon continued to scan the Tristano system. He'd widened the search in a growing circle. The continuously widening scan had already departed the asteroid belt. It had also headed out system and in system at the same time. The growing circular scan went above and below the star system ecliptic, the path that the majority of the planets followed as they orbited the Tristano star. Time passed as Galleon searched for a cloaked spaceship. As he scanned for the vessel, he continued to monitor the situation aboard Smade's asteroid. It was quickly devolving into chaos over there. Victory could have used its star drive jump to get to the asteroid quicker, but such a jump or fold might worsen the captain's condition. Valerie was not willing to risk that. It appeared that Chang's elaborate setup had gone to pieces on Smades. Too many of his key personnel were dead. According to the comm messages Galleon was picking up, some of Chang's employees were looting his former premises. Other asteroid personnel, other space pirates, had also smashed into those premises and looted the riches as well. That had started gun battles that became hotter the longer they progressed. That likely meant that much useful data had already been destroyed over there. Maddox's original plan, once he returned from Smades, had been to use Victory's space marines to take over the asteroid base. Before that could happen, the starship had to get in range to launch the regular shuttles to ferry over the space marines. There were several fold fighters in Victory's hangar bay. Valerie could send elite marine teams onto the asteroid. She was not yet ready to order such a maneuver. Galleon was certain that under similar conditions, Captain Maddox would have led the away teams over there himself. 
humans are quite different from each other, Galleon said aloud. At that point, one of the sensors pinged. It indicated unusual gravity wave readings. Such readings could indicate a cloaked vessel, Galleon said. Lieutenant Noonan stared at Galleon as the hollow image gave his report. Valerie abruptly turned in the captain's chair, giving orders to various bridge personnel. In 30 seconds, the Kai Kaus chief technician Andros Crank confirmed Galleon's find. Andros Crank was a stout, short, older man with thick fingers and unusually long gray hair. Maddox had saved Andros and 10,000 other Kai Kaus from a builder Dyson sphere a thousand light years from Earth. The concentration of gravity waves indicates a cloaked vessel, Andros declared. Do you have the ship's precise location? Valerie asked. It is at this location, Galleon said. On the main screen, a tiny green circle appeared. No doubt Galleon meant to encompass the so-called cloaked vessel. Yes, Andros said. I detect a heavy concentration of metals at that location. It's a spaceship, all right, a cloaked one. Valerie nodded slowly. The location was several million kilometers from the system's nearest Lommer point. That made it quite a ways from victory, over three billion kilometers. What is the ship's heading? Valerie asked. Galleon indicated the heading with an arrow on the main screen. It showed that the cloaked vessel headed directly for the Lommer point near the third terrestrial planet. Any idea who's inside it? Valerie asked Galleon. Yes. Valerie waited a second before saying, well, who? The probability is that it's an old confederate of the Methuselah man, Strand, Galleon said. Valerie blinked with surprise and her gut clenched. Methuselah men and their confederates were notoriously difficult to deal with. You think that because it's a cloaked vessel? She asked. And because Captain Maddox had a strand-like implant in his brain, Galleon said. Valerie slapped an armrest. Of course, I should have seen that. Good work, Galleon. The little hollow image stood a little straighter. Thank you, Valerie. It is kind of you to say so. Open channels with the vessel, she told Andros. Crank hesitated. Is anything the matter? Valerie asked him. We know he's there, Andros said. He doesn't know we know he's there. Why not send a fold fighter or two near his position before we let him know we know? Valerie's gut clenched again. She didn't like the idea of sending Keith anywhere near a Methuselah man's confederates. She remembered Ludendorff's Slarn hunter all too well. Keith was a terrific pilot, the best. But this was a cloaked vessel with hidden properties. She was sure of that. She could actually feel that part of it. A hunch, Valerie realized. I'm having a hunch. Normally, she was a by-the-numbers officer. She wasn't the kind to have hunches. Now she did. Now she had to figure out how to play her hunch. Do you still want me to open channels with the cloaked ship? Andros asked. Give me a second to think about it, Valerie said. Even as she said that, she knew she was being too wishy-washy. A confident starship captain made snap decisions. The others expected that from her. Remember, she told herself, do things your way. You're not Captain Maddox. So don't try to be Captain Maddox. Be Lieutenant Noonan. What was the right thing to do? Valerie knew it as soon as she asked herself. She should use the star drive and jump beside the cloaked vessel. Then. She could use a tractor beam and pull the hidden ship into the hangar bay. The space marines could take the Methuselah man's confederates captive. She would put them in the brig for intelligence people to interrogate later. But she couldn't use the star drive right now. Maddox had gone into a seizure during a fold. He had come out of surgery. She had to give his body time to heal before the starship attempted a jump. She frowned. Was that right, though? Wasn't her first duty to star watch and the protection of the people of the Commonwealth? Andros cleared his throat. Valerie scowled. 
Why did the chief technician think he knew how to do everything? He wasn't the one having to make the decisions. I'm responsible. It's why I'm a command officer. I have to make the hard choices. We're going to capture that ship, she said. You're going to use the star drive? Andros asked, sounding surprised. I have to, she said. We must capture whoever's aboard the cloaked vessel. It's why we came out here in the first place. The captain, Andros said, would expect me to use the star drive, Valerie said, interrupting. You cannot do that, Valerie, Galleon said. The captain is in critical condition. If you use the star drive, I already know what will happen, Valerie snapped. A second later, she said, I'm sorry, Galleon. We're all worried about the captain, but we have a duty to perform. Galleon did not look convinced. I am much older than you, Valerie. It is a terrible thing to give a command that results in the death of those you love. If I were you, I would wait to see what happens. If I wait, we might lose the cloaked vessel. It is not presently accelerating, Galleon said. We have many hours before it will begin decelerating to enter the Lawmer point. It might not decelerate to enter it, Valerie said. The vessel might zoom in. That is true, Galleon admitted. Valerie took a deep breath. She should order them to jump to the cloaked vessel if she first called to see how Maddox was doing. The main hatch slid open. Captain on the bridge, a Marine said loudly. Valerie swiveled in her chair. A chalk-white Maddox, supported by Meta, slowly stepped onto the bridge. The captain had one arm draped over Meta's shoulders. One of her strong arms was clasped around his waist. He looked exhausted, his eyes staring and far away seeming. Sweat stained his face. Sir, Valerie said, you should be in sickbay recovering. Maddox did not give the slightest impression he'd heard her. By slow degrees, Meta maneuvered the captain toward the command chair. Valerie's stomach seethed. She couldn't give command back to the captain while he was in such a weakened condition. Regulations clearly stated that the captain had to be in sound medical health to resume command. She didn't want to do it, but Valerie was going to have to send him to sickbay, whether he liked that or not. Afterward, she would have to order Victory to jump to the cloaked vessel. But if she did that, with the captain in his present condition, Maddox might well die. Valerie didn't know what to do. Chapter 21 Maddox felt horrible, had felt horrible ever since he'd woken up from surgery. He was weak, disoriented, and ready to dry heave whatever was in his stomach onto the deck. The implant was gone. Dr. Lister said a nerve fiber or two, or two hundred for all she knew, were still embedded in his gray matter. They might or might not cause him trouble. The implant had powered the fibers. Now the implant was gone, so theoretically it couldn't power those nerve fibers anymore. The medical team had fused his skull bone back into place. But according to Lister, a hundred things could go wrong. He should sleep for three or more days at least before he considered returning to active duty. Now Maddox slowly worked his way across the bridge. He did not like this look. He clung to Meta, but it was her strength that kept him upright. If she lost hold of him, his arm would slide off her shoulder and he would crash onto the deck. He hated being this weak but there was nothing he could do about it at the moment. Sir, Valerie said, her features pinched with distaste. Maddox knew his lieutenant. He knew what she was going to tell him. Did you? He panted. Sir? Valerie asked. Did you find the cloaked vessel? Maddox asked. The bridge personnel had been watching his slow and agonizing journey across the deck. Some had been looking away. Now all of them concentrated on him with amazement. Did Galleon talk to you? Valerie asked. 
About the cloaked vessel? Maddox asked. Yes, sir. Ah, that means you found it. Good. What is its location? Valerie's mouth had opened with surprise. She closed it and shook her head. I don't understand, sir. If Galleon didn't tell you about the cloaked vessel, how could you know about it? Through deduction, Maddox said. He'd meant to say it in a quick two words. Instead, it had come out slowly, syllable by syllable. Sir? Valerie asked. Maddox tore his gaze from her and painstakingly looked up at the main screen. He saw the green circle around nothing. That green circle slowly moved toward the nearest Lommer point. Have you contacted the ship yet? Maddox asked. No, sir, Andros said from his place. You'll have to move out of my chair, Maddox told Valerie. Her pinched look tightened. I'm afraid I can't do that, sir, Valerie said. You're in no condition to resume command yet. You should be in sickbay. Meta's grip tightened around his waist. Maddox wanted to stand under his own power, sweep over to Valerie and yank her out of his chair. Her not instantly moving out of the command chair was intolerable. Where's Riker? Maddox asked. No one answered him. That told Maddox all he needed to know. The others agreed with Valerie. He must look terrible indeed. Let go of me, he whispered to Meta. Meta looked up at him. He could see the concern in her eyes. He could also see that she wasn't going to let go of him. He could see that no one would back him up. For a moment, Maddox breathed through his nostrils, thinking. I suggest you report to sickbay at once, sir, Valerie said. Maddox gave a dry, whispery laugh. You have no idea what's really going on he said in a thin voice. You think, I don't know what you think. Strand is in that cloaked ship. Valerie stared at him in astonishment. That, or his clone, Maddox said. Most likely it's his clone. How can you possibly, Valerie cleared her throat. Can I ask how you know that, sir? I remember from Smade's asteroid, Maddox said. Strand spoke to me while I was there. Why didn't you say anything about this earlier, sir? Valerie asked. Maddox disliked anyone under his command questioning him like this, but he had to convince the others that only he really knew what was going on. Because I only remembered seeing Strand once I went under for the operation, he said. Ah, uh, say what? Valerie asked. Maddox was getting frustrated, but he couldn't afford that. He was too weak as it was. If he let frustration sap any more of his limited strength, he'd pass out. How did Captain Maddox know about the cloaked vessel? Galleon asked Valerie. Say, that's right, Andros said. How did you know, sir? Because I spoke to Strand while on the asteroid base, Maddox said. I know his ways. He uses cloaked vessels. The captain suddenly stopped talking. What else? Valerie asked. You were going to add something else. The brain implant was only part of Strand's plan. Maddox said. The key was first getting me to go undercover to the asteroid on an intelligence mission. I don't understand, Valerie said. I don't know all the parameters, Maddox said. But this clone of Strands has a piece of builder equipment. It allows him to predict people's actions. Go on, Valerie said. That peeved Maddox, but he swept that aside. He had to concentrate on the task. 
Strand's clone, set up the conditions so victory would come to the Tristano system, the captain said. Strand was able to do that because his builder computer has a remarkable ability to correctly predicate many things. One of those was that I would go in undercover to first investigate the happenings on Smade's asteroid. Strand wanted me there. I get that, Valerie said, maybe frustrated by his slow speech. Strand's clone wanted you there so he could put an implant in your brain, just like he did to his former new man crew. Wrong, Maddox said. But you just said, Valerie, Maddox said, and he almost swayed out of Meta's grasp as his knees badly sagged just then. Move aside, Meta said, surging toward the captain's chair, dragging Maddox with her. Valerie darted out of the chair because she could tell Meta was going to throw her out, and because Maddox really needed to sit somewhere before he collapsed. Meta gently deposited the captain onto the command chair. He slumped back, gasping, turning whiter than ever. Valerie chewed her lower lip. She'd never seen Maddox like this, and it upset her. Hang on, Maddox mumbled. He'd meant to say it under his breath to himself, but he could see that Valerie, Meta, and maybe even Galleon had overheard that. Listen, Maddox said. He pulled himself upright, took several steadying breaths, and almost puked. He felt worse, not better. He wasn't sure how much longer he could hold on to consciousness. Strands, used, advanced, hypnosis on me. Maddox said slowly. That was the point. I'm, I'm supposed to do something for him back on Earth. What's that? Valerie asked. I can't quite remember, Maddox said. The clone is destabilizing the Commonwealth. That's his mission. I don't know why that's what he wants. But I know I'm right. Sir, in your condition, listen, Maddox said, and his voice broke at the strain. I'm listening, Valerie whispered, feeling terrible for Maddox. We can't let the clone escape, Maddox whispered. I agree with you, sir. I'm afraid I'm going to have to order a star drive jump. No, Maddox whispered. That's a bad idea. I'm going to have you board a shuttle first. Strand is counting on that, Maddox said, interrupting. What do you mean? He's predicted all of this. Don't you see? Valerie shook her head. That's impossible. With an effort, Maddox raised his hand and swept it side to side. Then he focused on the bridge crew. Weapons, Maddox said. Sir, the man said, launch two antimatter missiles at the present cloaked ship coordinates, the captain said. Sir, Valerie said, I'm still the acting captain. I have not yet, Sergeant of Marines, Maddox said in a whispery voice. A bulky space marine sergeant hurried up. The tough looking marine gave his total attention to Maddox. Escort the lieutenant to her quarters. Maddox whispered. You can't do that, Valerie protested. By regulations, that would be mutiny. I'm the acting authority on the starship. The space marine looked indecisive. Carry out your orders, Maddox told the marine. Then the captain deliberately turned his chair so he no longer looked at the sergeant. Please, captain, Valerie said. I hate to- Maddox raised a hand and slowly snapped his fingers. Taking a deep breath, the space marine approached Valerie. If you'll come with me, Lieutenant. Valerie debated physically punching the marine, realized the futility of that, and her shoulders slumped. Maybe she should have given command back to Maddox. In the end, he always got his way. This was against the book, though. She was right in doing what she had. 
and yet she had lost to Maddox once again. Valerie wanted to tell Maddox that he was in deep trouble, but she couldn't get the words out. She'd never seen him like this. Couldn't the others tell that he wasn't fit right now to command a starship? Feeling keenly slighted and extremely embarrassed, Lieutenant Noonan left the bridge under armed escort. Chapter 22 Maddox might have felt bad for what he'd just done, but he was too tired to focus on more than one thing at a time. He did not have the energy to keep arguing with the lieutenant. He also knew she would never willingly go. He had to do this right. He had to break the builder computer's ability to predict his actions. Weapons, Maddox whispered. Are those missiles underway? Uh, not yet, sir, the weapons officer said. Maddox could feel the chills hitting him now. He was even sicker than he realized. Sir, Galleon said, might I offer a suggestion? It took Maddox time to notice the hollow image. Yes, Maddox asked. Would it be better to load a fold fighter with the missiles, have the fighter jump near the cloaked vessel, launch the missiles, and... Yes, Maddox said. That is better. Weapons... I mean communications. Get me the deck officer presently in charge of the hangar bay. It took ten seconds. In that time, Maddox dozed off. Meta jostled his arm. He raised his head, looked at her in surprise, and needed time to figure out where he was. Sir, Galleon said, you really do not seem well. You have just been in a difficult surgery, Galleon, Maddox whispered. Do you know what I'm doing? I do not understand the question, Captain. I know what's going on, what's really going on. I know how dangerous the clone is, how deadly his cloaked vessel and computer is. Valerie is a good officer, but... Maddox felt Meta shake his elbow. It took longer this time, but he looked up at her. What was going on? Why was he nodding off each time? Maddox cleared his throat. He didn't know how much longer he could do this. They were listening to him because everyone was used to obeying his commands. But if he dozed off again, Valerie would soon be back in the chair. He had to make sure Strand died. The clone was more deadly than anyone realized. With anyone else in command, the clone might be able to talk his way out of death. Maddox wasn't going to let that be a possibility. Launch, two fold fighters, Maddox whispered. Each should have an antimatter missile. We must stop the clone now. The comm officer looked up. The fighters will launch in 15 minutes, sir. Maddox acknowledged the words, wondering why it would take so long. Then he realized that wasn't long at all. Since they were not in a state of war, the antimatter missiles were in a special set of lockers. The warhead would have to be fitted to the missile, and after that, well, the process took time. He didn't think the clone knew what was going on yet. Just how clever was the builder computer? Maddox had a feeling it was much more clever than anyone realized, maybe even the clone. The captain sat back. He refused to shiver. Why was it so cold in here? He forced his eyes open and waited. He could do this. For the sake of the Commonwealth, he'd better. Lieutenant Maker found himself heading back in the tin can. That surprised him. Of course, he was the best, but he'd just come in from a mission. He'd folded. A person needed time to let his body adjust to all the skipping around through space. Starwatch had refined the drugs that let people fold and jump without the old jump lag. But still, extended folding in a short amount of time took its toll. Soon enough, Keith was in the tin can. They'd loaded up an antimatter missile this time. Incoming message from the captain, the flight officer said on the comm screen. Roger that, Keith said. Maddox appeared on the screen. What the heck? The captain looked terrible. Maddox should let Valerie do this. Keith hadn't yet learned that Valerie had been confined to quarters. This is it, gentlemen, Maddox whispered, addressing both fold fighter pilots. 
I have reason to believe that you're going up against the clone of the Methuselah man, Strand, the captain whispered. He has a unique vessel, along with builder equipment. Keith nodded in understanding, realizing now why they'd wanted him in on this. Your mission is critical, Maddox said. Keith already knew that. Why was the captain stating the obvious? No matter what happens, Maddox whispered, you must destroy his vessel. Keith cocked his head. It seemed they ought to try to capture a ship with builder equipment. But his wasn't to reason why. His was to do or die, with the emphasis on do. Maddox continued the briefing. The captain looked as if he was going to pass out at any second. Any questions? Maddox finally asked. Keith licked his lips, almost asking why they weren't going to capture the clone and his ship, but he decided the captain didn't look healthy enough to answer. Get him, gentlemen, Maddox finished. I'm counting on you. Aye, aye, sir, Keith said. Consider the clone as good as dead, sir. You can take that to the bank. Chapter 23 Strand's clone slept in his quarters aboard his ghost ship. He was catching a few winks before the Lommer Point jump. An alarm rang. The clone opened his eyes, sat up, stretched. The hatch to his quarters slid up. The big artillery shell-shaped builder robot floated in. That worried the clone more than the red alert klaxon. He'd given precise orders some time ago. The robot was not allowed to come in here. You must hurry to the bridge, the robot said. Strand's hand slipped under his pillow. He gripped a powerful blaster hidden there. He didn't know if the builder robot had a good defense against the blaster or not, but he felt that he was about to find out. Why are you in my quarters? Strand demanded. Because this is an emergency that overrides your former commands, the robot said blandly. I gave you unequivocal orders. If you do not reach the bridge soon, your probability of surviving the danger will dip below 60%. What are you talking about? What's gone wrong? Victory has launched two fold fighters. The craft have folded and are less than 300,000 kilometers from us. Are they headed for the Lommer Point? Their trajectory is toward us. Captain Maddox is likely aware of our ghost ship. That's impossible. Maddox is in no condition to know that. Besides, he has powerful post-hypnotic commands. He cannot lift a hand against me. You must reevaluate your belief, as two fold fighters are racing toward us. Each of them carries an antimatter missile. Strand's mouth went dry. If you do not reach the bridge soon, Strand sensed a threat from the robot. His fingers tightened around the blaster. What if the robot had a force field that was proof against the blaster's heavy beam? Surely at that point the robot would retaliate. Should he risk everything by destroying the robot? He would lose his link to the incredible builder computer then. Without the computer, how would he achieve his master goal? Why are you hesitating? The robot asked. Don't you know why? Strand mocked. In truth, yes, the robot said. You are deciding if you can destroy me with your hidden blaster. You cannot, but if you need to make the attempt... Strand went cold inside. And if I fail to destroy you? He asked. Then you will die. The fear wriggled in Strand's gut. He couldn't believe this. Had the robot and the computer been using him all this time? He released the blaster and removed his hand from under the pillow. He couldn't worry about the robot now. He would later, but not now. Maddox. Knows we're here? Strand asked. I give that a 78% probability, the robot said. 
That means Maddox broke my hypnotic conditioning. Most likely true, the robot said. How did he do it? I do not know. It is an interesting mystery, one I intend to solve. Well, that's something. You don't know everything. I never claimed I did. Strand shook his head. The robot was giving him a migraine. He couldn't believe this. Maddox was on to him. How had the blasted captain managed it this time? Strand stood up, leaving the blaster under the pillow, for now at least. Can we beat the missiles? The clone asked. If you act with haste, the robot answered. That was all Strand needed to hear. He hurried to the hatch. How had Maddox broken the hypnotic conditioning? The hybrid had more tricks up his sleeve than seemed reasonable. Not this time, Strand shouted, and he began to run to the ghost ship's small bridge. Chapter 24 Keith came out of the fold feeling groggy and disoriented. He threw up on the floor of the tin can. The tin can kept on its original flight pattern as programmed before the fold. That was away from what was supposed to be a new heading. His flight screen blinked on and off, trying to alert him. Finally, a klaxon began to blare for his attention. With a sleeve, Keith wiped the vomit from his lips. His head pounded. He knew he'd overdone it. He'd been right. He should have skipped this fold, this mission. Get a grip now, he whispered. Lieutenant Maker, his calm squawked. Keith slapped a switch. Second Lieutenant Rodrigo Hernandez stared at him from the screen. The man had a V-shaped buzz cut and the narrowest, most intense face among the striker fighter pilots aboard Victory. What's wrong with you? Rodrigo asked. Not a damn thing, Keith said. Your voice sounds hoarse. What has your panties in a bunch? Keith asked. The man's intensity dialed up. You're off course. Victory has fed us new coordinates. The cloaked vessel has changed heading. It's not heading for the lumber point anymore, but trying to slip away from us. Keith scowled. Something seemed off about that. They had just made the fold. That meant that they had crossed through or jumped from one part of space to another. Victory was three billion kilometers behind them. Light traveled at 300,000 kilometers per second. That meant in 10 seconds, light traveled 3 million kilometers. 10 10 seconds was 100 seconds, or 1 minute and 40 seconds. In that time, light traveled 30 million kilometers. 10 times that was 300 million kilometers. 10 times 1 minute and 40 seconds was something over 16 minutes. 10 times 16 minutes to reach 3 billion kilometers away was something over two and a half hours. All of that meant Victory could not have possibly sent them new data about the cloaked ship's new heading. The math was all wrong for a signal to have reached them this soon. Is something wrong, Lieutenant? Rodrigo asked. Keith wiped his eyes, blinked several times, and studied Rodrigo Hernandez. He tried to remember exactly what the man looked like. Right. Rodrigo had a mole over his left eye. It was no longer there. Damn it, Keith hissed. He slapped another switch, activating a powerful calm pulse. It was meant to burn through enemy jamming. The image on his screen dissolved. A second later, Second Lieutenant Rodrigo Hernandez stared at him. This one had a mole over his left eye. Back already? Rodrigo asked. What's that mean? Keith asked warily. You just said. No, that wasn't me, Keith shouted. You must have received false communications just like I did a second ago. Remain on the original target and launch your missile. Do it now, man. What are you talking about? At that point, heavier enemy jamming blanketed the comm signal. Rodrigo's image became a blizzard of screen snow. Strand is messing with us, Keith said. He made a fast course correction. As he did, he primed the antimatter missile. He typed in commands. Once launched, the missile would shut down its comlink. It would only follow its prearranged flight path, 
nothing else. Strand would not be able to feed the missile or the warhead false data. Well, if this was really a Methuselah man, he shouldn't be able to mess with the missile. With these super geniuses, one never knew. The tin can shuddered as Keith launched the missile. Then he began to bank hard, activating the gravity dampeners. He had to get out of here as fast as he could, but he dared not use the fold again. He was already messed up enough as it was. Chapter 25 Strand sat back frustrated with the fold fighter pilot, the one named Lieutenant Keith Maker. The ace had been with Maddox for a long time, the captain's wiliness rubbing off on him in a bad way. The second pilot is too wary for your tricks, the robot said. Strand glanced back at the pesky construct. You're in this with me, the clone said. If I die, you die. The robot did not reply to that. So if you can't come up with a plan, don't mock the one who has one. The robot still said nothing. With a soft grunt, Strand resumed scanning. The first pilot was on course with the new heading, going the wrong way. The pilot's antimatter missile was still on board the first fold fighter. It was the second missile, barreling on a beeline course for the ghost ship, that frightened the clone. It has an antimatter warhead, Strand said. It doesn't have to hit us, just get close when it ignites. I am familiar with the parameters of a Starwatch antimatter missile, the robot said. You're a fussy little robot, aren't you? Your mannerisms indicate that you are worried. Do you fear extinction? Yes, Strand shouted. You should fear it too. Are you too stupid to realize how precious your life is? This is the only one we got, you know. Do you truly believe this? The robot asked. Do you not believe in an afterlife for sentient beings such as yourself? No, Strand shouted. Your voice patterns are off. Why are you lying? Do you fear that your unbelief does not make it fact? Strand turned fully around, giving the robot a scathing glance. Then he faced his board and pressed a switch. That activated an outer relay, which sent a powerful and precise pulse toward the two varying missiles, the one heading for the ghost ship and the one going away with the duped fold fighter, pilot Rodrigo Hernandez, at its helm. Strand's signal to the antimatter warheads had taken a long time for the builder computer to create. That signal now sped at the speed of light to the warheads. The special signal momentarily showed the ghost ship's exact position to anyone with the proper sensors. Giving away their position was a risk, but it likely wouldn't matter in the larger scheme of things. The coming antimatter blasts would act as two perfect jamming devices. The blasts would whiten the area, in sensor terms. The special signal reached the first fold fighter and its antimatter missile in the launch tube. The signal activated the warhead's firing sequence. Three seconds later, the antimatter warhead detonated. Antimatter mixed with matter, creating a vast explosion. The detonation annihilated the fold fighter and Rodrigo Hernandez and everything else in the immediate vicinity. The antimatter blast billowed outward, sending heat, gamma, X-ray, and other radiation. Keith saw the blast, cursed, and initiated the fold mechanism. He didn't have to look at the numbers. In that split second, he knew that Strand had screwed them, somehow fooling the warhead. He had no doubt that despite his precautions, his warhead would detonate as well. The fold fighter banked and turned, almost completing the maneuver so it would head back to the starship. That was three billion kilometers away, so it would take time to reach victory. Keith knew he couldn't outrace the antimatter detonation. He wasn't far enough away from his missile yet. He tensed up as he readied to hit the fold switch. 
the warhead on the missile he'd launched ignited. Keith cursed once more, pressed the fold switch, and nothing happened. No, Keith shouted. What's Valerie gonna do without me? At that moment, the sluggish system activated. At the same moment, the first gamma and X-rays from the terrible antimatter blast reached his tin can. Destruction occurred while Keith's fold fighter began to fold, heading back in the blink of an eye toward the ancient Adok starship. Chapter 26 While Victory had searched for the clone of Strand and then sent out its fold fighters, conditions inside Smade's asteroid had worsened with growing intensity. First, the heads of Key Chang personnel had literally exploded, raining skull fragments and brain tissue everywhere, which included onto nearby Confederates. That had created instant panic inside the large Chang facility. The panic had loosened authority until certain opportunists had begun to loot, favoring high-tech equipment and military-grade weaponry, and stealing billions in credit transfers and valuable items such as platinum, gold, gems, and various jewels. The panic and the sense of grab what you can while you can had jumped to the regular space pirates outside the Chang compound. Many of them had broken into the fabled stronghold. Gunfights between looters quickly turned savage, and many people were murdered. The chaos worsened as key asteroid life support computer systems activated a strange protocol. The asteroid's main stations cycled to hidden canisters of XT chlorine, a highly toxic gas. The life support systems began injecting the mutated chlorine into the main halls and corridors. Shortly thereafter, people had begun to drop like proverbial flies. Many vomited first. The survivors soon realized that the interior asteroid air had been poisoned. That intensified the gunfights, as the survivors who'd managed to find gas masks clawed and struggled for the few remaining spacecraft. Smade's asteroid was turning into a charnel house. The survivors wanted off as quickly as possible, and they were willing to murder anyone who got in their way. Deep inside Chang's highest security area, with private cyclers pumping fresh air into the chambers, was a room full of frightened scientists, medical techs, and surgeons. They were primarily of Asian descent and predominantly men. Among them was the scientist with the bowl-cut, copper-colored hair, Dr. Lee, who had ordered John to watch Maddox and had later chased the captain into the main bazaar. Only one humanoid in the large room did not tremble with fear. He was a dark-haired individual, slightly taller but much heavier than average. The greater weight did not come from his stature or from bulky muscles. He looked ordinary enough. He simply seemed slightly heavier than average. The greater weight and density was due to his construction. He was an android made to resemble a placid Asian man with unremarkable features. The placid features were a good touch, since the android did not emote feelings the same way flesh and blood humans did. He happened to be one of the oldest, and possibly the oldest android who commonly resided in human space. His name was Yen Cho, and he'd been on Starship Victory several voyages ago when he had taken a data gulp for Maddox and the crew and later bargained to give up the data for a head start against Star Watch intelligence operatives. This Yen Shou android had his own agenda, which did not always coincide with the rull of the android nation, as discovered on Sind II by Professor Ludendorff. In any case, the most premier Yen Shou model android sat at a console. He wore camouflage military gear, and seemed to be in his mid-thirties in human terms. He studied the image on his screen, watching the approaching double oval starship Victory. His acuity sharpened as a badly damaged fold fighter 
abruptly appeared in space near the starship. With swift taps, he adjusted the controls, zoomed in on the fighter, and attempted to break into its communication. All he got was a standard Mayday signal. Despite his obvious interest, Yen Cho's black eyes seemed unusually deep and unusually calm. He was processing all the data he'd gathered so far, together with the sight of the combat-damaged fold fighter. It had been quite some time since Yen Cho had interacted with Captain Maddox and his people. He had learned several interesting pieces of data during Maddox's internment on Smade's asteroid. For instance, cunning Professor Ludendorff and his lover Dr. Dana Rich were not aboard the starship. That was important. Indeed, as Yen Cho sat at the console, he nodded decisively. He had taken considerable risks by coming to Smade's asteroid. Officially, he was part of Chang's carefully collected science team. The greatest risk had been discovery by the clone strand. As far as Yen Cho had been able to discern, the dangerous clone hadn't sniffed him out. There was no possibility that Chang would have. Now the Shanghai heavy leader was dead. Decision made as to what to do next, Yen Cho stood, and he whirled around as someone hammered insistently outside the armored hatch. The noise badly affected the scientists and medical personnel crammed in the room, almost to a person they jerked in fear. A few pulled out small handguns, aiming the weapons at the armored hatch. Put those away, Yen Cho said. He did not want a bloodbath in here, one that might incapacitate him. He didn't fear their small caliber weapons, but what the hammering marine might do in response to enemy gunfire. Unfortunately, no one paid his order any heed. He was not highly ranked on the former Chang pay scale. The hammering changed, becoming a heavy clanging that produced dents in the armored hatch. It must have become obvious then to others what Yen Cho had already divined. The Naka is wearing combat armor, the android shouted. A few of the scientists and medical personnel turned to stare at him. If you shoot at a combat suit, Yen Cho said with remorseless logic, the suited heavy will surely kill you out of hand in automatic response. The people in this room were an unsavory lot, having committed horrid deeds on other humans in order to receive high pay. The Shanghai heavies were equally immoral. They were also brutal and savage when given their choice. If the suited heavies indulged their whims, they would use suit-contained cannon fire to massacre everyone in here, including Yen Cho. The android hoped to forestall that. The hammering intensified once more, creating deeper dents in the hatch. What shall we do? asked Dr. Lee. What can you do? Yen Cho asked. Surrender is the wisest option. Perhaps these heavies want your technical expertise for something. That is our greatest hope. Dr. Lee blinked several times as his gun hand and weapon shook. With an effort of will, Lee slid the small caliber pistol back into a hidden holster. The others began to do likewise. At that point, metallic fingers eased between the battered hatch and the door jamb. With a whine of servos, a heavy combat suit tore the hatch from its moorings. The scientists and medical personnel cried out in fear. The fear had two sources, the heavies and possible poison gas. They cringed against the farthest wall. Yen Cho stood at the very back, although he did not cringe like the rest. He kept studying and analyzing. Three exoskeleton combat suits clanked into the chamber. Two of them aimed heavy 30 millimeter auto cannons at the mass of scientists and medical personnel. The other combat suit's faceplate whined as it descended. A Shanghai heavy peered out of the armored helmet. He was a cruel faced soldier with a deep scar over his left eyebrow. Which of you is Dr. Lee? the heavy asked. 
Several of the cowering people turned to the copper-haired scientist. You, the heavy said, step forward. Dr. Lee pushed past the others. Just like the time he'd chased Maddox, Lee wore a white lab coat. He did not cower, although he seemed tense. He also seemed calculating. You are Dr. Lee? The combat-suited heavy asked. The scientist nodded. The cruel-faced soldier did not smile, but he became even more intense, more concentrated. There is madness in the asteroid, the heavy said. The air is poisoned. Worse, a Star Watch battleship approaches the asteroid. Lee said nothing. We wish to escape, the heavy said. Lee nodded. The heavy abruptly clanked forward until the combat suit loomed over the scientist. You will take us to the hidden spaceship, the heavy shouted. If you do not take us there this instant, I will take you, Lee said. The heavy quit shouting and seemed to lose much of his hostility. How many soldiers are with you? Dr. Lee asked. Eleven, including me, the heavy said. Lee turned around, studying the anxious scientists and medical personnel. He seemed to be counting their numbers. Maybe he was counting in order to see how many would get to leave the asteroid and start anew somewhere else with him. Yen Cho pushed through their number. I am an engine tech, he told the doctor. Lee squinted and he shook his copper-haired head. I do not know you. Yen Cho understood. The doctor would not take him along. That was unfortunate. He had assumed one of the scientists knew the whereabouts of a special escape ship. Yen Cho's problem was that he hadn't known which one. Now he did. Yen Cho had gained several interesting upgrades throughout the millennia. He did not have the same goal as many of the other Yen Cho series androids. He was, in most cases, far less bloodthirsty than others of his kind. This, however, was an emergency. That changed his protocols. Yen Cho moved closer to Li. As the android did so, he slumped his shoulders in a cringing manner, while his features took on a pleading cast. Please, Yen Cho whispered. I am a space tech. Go away, Li told him. Although Yen Cho dipped his head in submission, he knew his precise location in the room compared to the heavies in their combat suits. Yen Cho fell to his knees, as might a frightened human who had lost all hope. His shoulders shook as if he was weeping in abject fear. What he was really doing was hot-shotting his special laser pistol. The heavy-duty pistol could now fire three intensely hot rays. That would burn out the pistol's laser circuits and might possibly cause a deadly explosion afterward. We must go, the combat-suited heavy told Lee. We are running out of time. Yes, Dr. Lee said. I understand. I am choosing the ship's crew. You said there are eleven of you. That means eight of our group can fit into the escape ship. Now, at that point, Yen Cho looked up and fired from his kneeling, hunched-over position. An intensely hot laser beam burned against the armored faceplate of the most faraway standing exoskeleton-powered armored suit. The hot shotting had worked. Because of the short range, the superheated laser beam penetrated the faceplate, spearing into the face of the heavy inside. Yen Cho shifted targets and fired his second beam. It, too, burned through the enemy faceplate. As the weapon did that, the first combat suit clanged against the floor as the slain heavy inside fell down. The scientists and medical personnel, still crammed against the back wall, began to shout and scream in terror. Many pressed farther back, as though they could get away from the conflict. A few braver souls began drawing their small hand weapons. The combat reflex from the last heavy was almost instantaneous. The two-ton suit opened fire with its arm integral 30 millimeter. 
The auto cannon chugged shells, mowing down the cringing crowd. At the same time, Yen Cho could no longer use his laser pistol, however. The hot shotting had only lasted for two shots as the inner circuits had burned out. From his kneeling position, Yen Cho straightened, drew back his right arm, and threw the overheating pistol. As the pistol flew through the air, smoke began chugging from it, the plastic melting into a blob of uselessness. That blob flew through the opened faceplate and struck the firing heavy in the face. The heavy howled in agony. He must have instinctively activated the faceplate. It now snapped shut, keeping the melted, super-hot pistol pressed against his face. The exoskeleton-powered suit began to dance in a macabre fashion. Yen Cho darted aside from its path, and he grabbed the back of Dr. Lee's lab coat, barely yanking the man aside in time so the two-ton combat suit didn't crush him. A second later, the combat suit banged against a wall, fell onto the floor, and began to writhe back and forth. It was horrible and obscene, as pitiful cries echoed inside the helmet. The doctor turned in Yen Cho's grasp. He looked at the android's right hand. Yen Cho grabbed the lab coat with the left. Some of the pseudo-skin on the right-hand palm had burned away, revealing gleaming metal underneath. What are you? Li whispered in horror. You can obviously see what I am, Yen Cho replied. An android? The doctor asked. While keeping hold of the doctor's lab coat, Yen Cho examined the weeping scientists and medical personnel who had survived the autocannon onslaught. Less than a third lived and many of those were badly wounded. A moment, Yen Cho said. The android released the doctor, hurried to the dead and hurting, and searched two of them. He came away with two handguns. One of those he shoved into Lee's hands. The doctor stared at him, the question obvious in his eyes. We are going to your escape ship, Yen Cho said. We want to leave the dying asteroid before the starship arrives. Just the two of us? Lee asked. No. Li waited a moment longer, maybe waiting for Yen Cho to add something. Finally, Li said, I don't understand. For now, you do not need to. You can trust in the knowledge that I am grade A strategist and tactician. You can also trust me to get you to your ship and to get us away from here undetected. The doctor scanned the dead heavies, took stock of the dead and wounded scientists and medical personnel, and finally regarded Yen Cho again. There are other heavies in our path, Lee said. Good. We need some of them. I do not understand why we would need them. Come, Yen Cho said. He grabbed one of the doctor's sleeves. He was going to have to do this the hard way, as it was taking too long doing it through coaxing and explaining. At that point, Dr. Lee began to train his gun on Yen Cho. The android had been expecting that. He slapped the gun out of the doctor's grasp. Then he picked up the struggling human and darted out of the hatch. He'd lied to the man. Yen Cho had no intention of escaping from the approaching starship. Quite the contrary, in fact. Chapter 27 There was gun and autocannon fire in the halls and corridors. Lights flickered in places. In others, a red emergency glow gave the corridor an eerie feel. Put me down, Dr. Lee shouted. You'll get us killed with your carelessness. Yen Cho did not respond. He had a plan. He had a mission. He needed the doctor's knowledge. He did not have time to torture it out of Lee either. Throughout the centuries, the androids had moved undercover through the human populations. Sometimes they did it to protect humanity from its stupid impulses. Sometimes they did it to help the underground community of builder-made androids. This was one of those times where both reasons motivated Yen Cho. Strand had set up a horrible situation. He had gone much too far this time. If Yen Cho and his brothers were right about Strand's ultimate desire, Yen Cho skidded to a halt before his quarters in Chang's underground dormitory. The fingers of his metallic-looking hand blurred over a control pad. The hatch slid open. Setting Dr. Lee onto his feet, Yen Cho unceremoniously pushed him within. Lee crashed against a chair, sprawling onto the floor. 
The doctor yelped in pain. He'd caught himself so his face hadn't smashed into the floor, but at least one bone in his left wrist had snapped from the force of his descent. Yen Cho ignored the mewling doctor for the moment. He rummaged in his locker, pulled out a pair of gloves, and shoved his hands into them. Then he withdrew a medical kit. It seemed innocent enough, but it was not. He went to Dr. Lee, who lay on the floor, cradling his broken wrist. The man had turned white from the pain and was moaning to himself. The human had lost the arrogance he'd displayed earlier when he'd been deciding who would live by escaping in the spaceship and who would die by remaining on the asteroid. Yen Cho extracted a hypo from his kit, checked the dosage, and pressed the end against the doctor's neck. The hypo hissed as the solution was pressure injected into Lee. My wrist still hurts, Lee complained several seconds later. Yen Cho stood as he impassively regarded the man. Lee had been one of Chang's most trusted scientists, most trusted among those who had not received a brain implant. The android believed that the unchecked pain from the doctor's broken bone would help the solution achieve its desired result faster than otherwise. That was good, as time had become critical. What's happening to me? Lee complained. I'm feeling fainter, not better. The android waited several seconds longer before going back to his locker. He grabbed a gym bag and stuffed it with items. When he returned to Lee, the man looked at him strangely. The android squatted before the hurting scientist. I am Yen Cho. I am your friend and confidant. Yes, the doctor said. I realize this. Will you fix my wrist for me? I will, friend, Yen Cho said, smiling. First, tell me the location of the hidden spaceship. The man began to babble all about the hidden ship. What's more, he told Yen Cho about the hidden defenses, the needed codes, and other factors in order to take the ship out of the asteroid's secret exit. Yen Cho only had to hear it once. As an android, his cybertronic brain forgot nothing. At last, he decided he knew enough. He stood. It was good to know that the special serum worked. It had performed well on the test humans back in the Rigel System Laboratories, where the androids had tested the drug. But this was his first use in a real situation. The serum was not a long-lasting thing like brain implants. It worked almost as well in the short term, however. Yen Cho checked his supply of serum. It should be enough to win a crew of heavies and any needed techs. They wouldn't last long, though. That was the kicker. Yen Cho shook his head. That was the side effect of the serum. It soon destroyed the subject's brain, eating away at the neural connectives. The longest surviving test subject had kept her sanity for 15 days. That should be more than enough time for what Yen Cho had planned. Friend, Li said from the floor. Where are you going? Yen Cho stood by the hatch. It looked as if he were about to leave. The android studied Li. Lie back, he said. I am going to get you help. You promise? Yes, Yen Cho said. Thank you. I'm starting to feel funny. It will pass, Yen Cho said. Dr. Li lay back, with his injured wrist resting on his chest. Without further thought for Li, Yen Cho exited his quarters. He heard more gunfire down the halls. He needed to move fast if he was going to recruit his heavies and techs in time to accomplish his goal. Chapter 28 Maddox lay on his bed in his quarters aboard Starship Victory. He'd been trembling from exhaustion for some time. Meta sat beside him, stroking his forehead. He loved Meta's touch. At night, he liked to lie beside her as she read on her tablet, running her free hand over his back and buttocks. It was the most relaxing part of the day for him. Now, 
he didn't feel relaxed. He felt like crap, and he had failed to take out the clone of Strand. He should have known better than to send two strike fighter pilots after the genius. What's more, the clone possessed builder equipment. He should have foreseen what had happened. Would Keith survive his injuries? A chime sounded. Enter, Maddox whispered. Come in, Meta said more loudly. The hatch to his quarters opened. A stocky marine stood there. The man stepped aside. Valerie entered his quarters. She saw him, hesitated, squared her shoulders, and marched toward his bed. She stopped and stared down at him. You are no longer confined to quarters, Maddox whispered slowly. Valerie said nothing. Maddox glanced at Meta. Meta sighed and looked up at Valerie. Keith is hurt, Meta said. Valerie's eyes widened with understanding and then fear. What happened? She asked. Meta told Valerie what they knew. Keith's badly damaged tin can had appeared. A rescue shuttle had brought him in. Keith had burns all over his body. The ace had stayed coherent long enough to tell them that Hernandez and he had failed to take out the cloaked vessel. Keith was now in medical, undergoing emergency treatment. Valerie glared at Maddox. You sent Keith on another mission, even though he'd just been on a fold assignment? Do not question my decisions, Maddox whispered, raising himself onto his elbows. Please, husband, Meta said, putting her hands on his chest. Lay back, rest. Maddox collapsed back against the bed. Valerie, Meta pleaded. Valerie glanced at Meta, but it did nothing to soften her features. That's how you always do it, Valerie told Maddox with an edge to her voice. You do whatever you want. Now Keith has sustained serious injuries. I can't believe this. I would have never, Valerie, Meta said, jumping up, shoving the lieutenant backward and interrupting her screed. Valerie stumbled and almost went down. She righted herself and glared at Meta. You can't push another Star Watch officer, Valerie said. That's a serious offense. Meta squeezed her hands into fists. No one was going to harm Maddox in any way. He was in a critical condition. If Valerie thought, listen, Maddox said in a hoarse voice. Listen to me, Lieutenant. Both women stared at Maddox. He had sat up, and there was more energy in him than just a second ago. I'm exhausted, Maddox said. I have to rest. I'm giving you orders, Lieutenant. You're going to put me aboard a shuttle. Then, you're going to use the star drive and jump to the ghost ship. I want you to use the main disruptor cannon. Annihilate the clone's cloaked vessel. He must not get away. Once you've completed the mission, Return and pick me up. You're returning command of the starship to me? Valerie asked. I just said I was. Valerie stared at him for two seconds and seemed to reach a conclusion. Then, you have to apologize for having that muscle-bound ape drag me off the bridge earlier in front of everyone. We don't have time for this, Maddox said. Valerie shook her head. Then I'm not going to acknowledge your orders. Get someone else to command the starship. Is this mutiny? He asked. Call it whatever you like, she said. You embarrassed me in front of everyone. What's more, I was in the right. But you just bowled through as you always do. This time I'd like to hear you say you're sorry. Maddox stared at her. He had no intention of saying. He slumped back and hit the bed. Seconds later, Meta shook him back awake. He hardly knew what had happened. Can't you say it? Meta whispered to him. Say what? Maddox asked. From somewhere unseen, a person snorted. At that point, Maddox remembered. He sighed. He was so damn tired and kept fainting. Maybe Dr. Lister hadn't done as good a job as she thought she'd done. I'm sorry, he whispered. What's that? 
Valerie asked. I'm, Maddox said as loudly as he could. Sorry. Now go kill the clone, if you can. Valerie stood at precise attention. She made a perfect salute. Yes, sir. You can bet your balls that's exactly what I'm going to do. Chapter 29 Valerie seethed as she rapped out orders on the bridge. Maddox had said he was sorry. She could hardly believe that had happened. Even harder to believe was how she'd stood up to him. It had been one of the most difficult things to say to him. Such a thing wasn't covered by regulations. She had done what she felt was right, even though he had given her a direct order to resume command. Maybe as bad as that, she had been sure he would not say he was sorry. Yet, Captain Maddox had. She could let go of that. She had to let go of that. It was one of the reasons she seethed inside. As the bridge crew readied for the star drive jump, it gave her a few seconds to contemplate the last hour. She'd worked tirelessly to get the starship ready for a fast combat jump. Because Maddox had apologized, she had put that behind her and totally focused on the mission at hand. It had felt good. She seethed because of what she'd just heard about Keith. He had gone into shock. She hadn't wanted to, but she'd ordered him aboard a shuttle as well. Two shuttles were staying behind, with two strike fighters to guard them. She didn't want one of the pirates at Smade's asteroid making a kidnapping attempt. Valerie seethed because she wanted payback from Strand, or the clone of Strand. A clone of the Methuselah man, Strand. That implied the real Strand's hand. He had to be the most vengeful person she knew. He must have labored for years to set something like this up, in case he ever died or faced imprisonment. It stood to reason, right? The clone, if it was Strand, had builder tools, possibly a builder ship. If the real Strand hadn't used those things, it had to be because they were too dangerous to use normally. Valerie shook her head. Why did the real Strand care so much? Why did the Methuselah man have to get back at everyone? Emotion. It came down to emotion. That was how the ancient Methuselah man was wired. According to Captain Maddox, the real Strand wanted his clone to destabilize the Commonwealth of Planets. Valerie wondered why the real Strand wanted such a thing. Did he think such destabilization would create the conditions so he could escape the new men? Could the real Strand have planned that far in advance? Valerie couldn't see how. And yet, according to Maddox, this fake Strand, this clone, had amazingly predictive software and computers, so he could do such a thing as lure victory to the Tristano system. So Maddox would go undercover to the asteroid. What did the clone need Maddox to do back home? Valerie shook her head. It could be a whole slew of things. Would the clone want Maddox to assassinate Brigadier O'Hara, for instance? Gallion, Valerie said. The little hollow image stood beside the captain's chair. He turned to her. The starship shuddered. What was that? Valerie shouted. She made a face at herself. She shouldn't shout. The acting captain was supposed to remain calm so the rest of the bridge crew could draw from her calmness and remain even-tempered. There was a hiccup in the antimatter engines, Andros said. A hiccup? Valerie asked. It's the best way I can describe it, Andros said. We need another few minutes to check the main lines before we can possibly jump. She nodded. Valerie, Gallion said. She turned to the hollow image. You spoke my name a few seconds ago. Oh, right, she said. I was going to ask you something. Now I've forgotten what it was. You must be worried about Keith, Gallion said. Would you like me to check on his condition? No, Valerie said a little too loudly, perhaps. Gallion seemed to study her. I have to concentrate on the mission, she explained. I need to focus. If the captain thinks this is that critical, I cannot fail him. 
I have read many medical journals, the hollow image said. They agree that the human mind is a funny instrument. It can hallucinate under many of the conditions Captain Maddox faced while under anesthesia during his surgery. You don't think he really knows what's going on? Valerie asked, surprised. He did know about the cloaked vessel, Galleon said. That is something in his favor. The rest of it, I am unsure. Do you fully trust the captain's certainty? He's made remarkable guesses in the past, Valerie said. True, that is another point in his favor. Okay, Galleon, spit it out. I have a few minutes until Andros gives me the all clear. What's really troubling you? Why is the captain so dead set on destroying the cloaked ship? I would think the better idea would be to capture it, to interrogate the clone, and confiscate the builder technology. Valerie rubbed her chin. The little hollow image had a point. Do you have any idea why Maddox might want to order the cloaked vessel's destruction? I do. Strand fashioned the new men. The new men harmed the captain's mother. Maybe without his realizing it, the captain holds Strand responsible for his mother's death. I don't think that's it, Valerie said. It is an elaborate theory, Galleon admitted. Valerie cocked her head, finally nodding. Strand once put post-hypnotic commands in Meta's mind, remember? I do remember, Valerie. The captain's story holds together, is what I'm saying. Until I find a solid reason otherwise, I'm trusting the captain's instincts. Even after what happened to Keith. It took her two heartbeats, but Valerie nodded. Interesting, Galleon said. Captain, Andros said, we're ready. The engines are clear to jump. Valerie nodded. She faced the main screen. They were going to jump into battle. They were leaving Maddox, Meta, and Keith behind. She rubbed two of her fingers together. Jump when ready, she told the helm. Then she anticipated the fight on the other side of the jump and hoped she was good enough so the clone of Strand didn't outsmart her and make her look like an idiot. Chapter 30 Despite Yen Cho's lack of emotions, the android was uneasy as he waited inside the spaceship inside Smade's asteroid. His logic processors warned him this was an iffy mission. Still, he didn't see that he had much of a choice. Someone, likely the clone Strand, had sabotaged the asteroid. As far as Yen Cho had been able to determine the event that had started the mayhem had been Chang's death. Had Strand engineered that? That seemed highly unlikely, and yet there were many unlikely factors at work here. The probabilities of many of the events that had occurred, they had struck Yen Cho as impossible. They had also indicated what he'd long feared about Strand. The Methuselah man was reckless. All the Methuselah men over the centuries had been conceited, reckless humans that the wrong-headed faction of builders had foisted upon the universe. While Yen Cho wasn't a hardcore rising sun builder sect advocate, he did have leanings in that direction. Many species throughout the centuries had believed that the builders were a monolithic group. The truth was otherwise. The builders had been just as fractured as humanity, with some sects completely at odds with the others. Many alien races were not like that. Humans and builders were, to a fault. In any case, Strand was reckless. The original Strand, the one trapped on the throne world, had set schemes into place. Some of those schemes would only begin if and when he was captured or slain. The Methuselah man was incredibly vengeful. The clone had huge ideas, and he possessed fantastic technology. According to what Yen Cho had discovered, the clone had a builder-made vessel and possibly a builder-constructed robot of special design. Yen Cho intended on gaining both of those items. To achieve that, however, 
The rear hatch of the piloting chamber opened. A muscle-bound 2G heavy lumbered in. He stank of sweat and fear and of anger. We do not move, the heavy said. His name was Chem, and he was a squad leader, thicker and stronger than the others under his command. Five other heavies followed Chem. Along the way, Yan Cho had picked up three techs. The techs were terrified of the monstrous soldiers. Yan Cho looked back at Chem. The heavy hadn't been dosed with the hypo. To the android's surprise, he'd found that logic had swayed the brute. The creature had actually sworn an oath to follow him. It had dawned on Yen Cho that the heavies were like overgrown dogs in search of a master. Still, some dogs could growl with impatience if they did not get their food fast enough. For Chen, right now, food was escape from the treacherous asteroid. I am thinking, Yen Cho said. Oh, do you not really know how to pilot a spaceship? I told you I can pilot it. I do not lie. But we do not move. Think why you fly us from here. Do you want to live, Jem? Yes, I have said so. There is a Star Watch battleship out there. I know. I am figuring out how to make it let us leave the star system. That is impossible. Is it really, Jem? If that is so, we are doomed. The heavy scowled thunderously. Do not mock me. I do not, Yen Cho said. I am waiting. The screen began to blink. The android faced it and began to manipulate the board. He watched the starship use its special jump mechanism, vanishing from view. What happened? Chem said. Where did it go? There is no llama point out there. The starship is coming back. Yen Cho said, avoiding the question. It has to come back. Why? Yen Cho manipulated the controls. He brought up two shuttles and two strike fighters guarding them. All four vessels were quite some distance from the asteroid, farther than a spaceship could reach quickly. I have been monitoring their communications, Yen Cho explained. The captain of the starship is out there in a shuttle. That is stupid of him. In this instance, I agree with you. But Captain Maddox did not have a choice in the matter. That he is there inclines me to believe that surgeons removed the control chip. He cannot fold or jump until his brain has rested for a time. The android regarded the heavy behind him. Do you know what is even better? The huge soldier shook his rather small head. This ship possesses a fold mechanism, just like the fighter I saw earlier. Is that important? Chem asked. Oh, yes, Yen Cho said. It means that I am about to capture Captain Maddox. With him in my grasp, I will be able to dictate terms to the starship. The heavy frowned, making him seem stupider than normal as he tried to follow the android's reasoning. Go, Yen Cho told Chem. Tell the others to strap in. We're about to leave. Tell them to remain strapped in until I say otherwise. We are going to jump. Without a llama point near? Chem asked. This is a fold vessel. Weren't you listening? The huge brute regarded the android. Chem finally nodded. I will tell the others. Good. Yen Cho said. And make sure your combat suits are ready. You're going to be raiding the largest shuttle. Does the shuttle have women? We lack women. Yen Cho thought of Meta. He had never really cared for her. Yes, the shuttle has women. You may keep the women if you do exactly as I say. Chem smiled, showing horse-sized teeth. Then the heavy retreated to give the message. Yen Cho began to activate the controls. It was time to leave Smade's asteroid and ready this vessel to fight. So far, the plan was proceeding flawlessly. Chapter 31
Deeper in the Tristano system, Strand's ghost ship accelerated, heading as fast as it could for the nearest Lommer point. Despite all its fantastic equipment, the vessel lacked an independent star drive jump or even a fold mechanism. The hatch to the bridge opened. Strand whirled around. That let him know how keyed up he was. The robot floated within, the hatch shutting behind it. I have detected pre-jump pulses in our vicinity, the robot said. The starship should appear at any minute, within two million kilometers of us. The statement stunned Strand. He'd never heard of anyone detecting pre-jump pulses. This was a new and incredible technology, one the robot had seen fit to keep from him before this. If what you say is true, Strand said. We're finished. Dead. Not necessarily, the robot said. Strand studied the builder construct. He'd suspected a secret agenda on its part ever since he'd boarded the craft. How could something so marvelous and without any detectable control mechanism installed obey him all this time? Maybe because it had been faking obedience to him all this time. Do you have a plan? Strand asked. Yes, the robot said. The clone sagged with relief. Why had the little thing waited all this time to tell him an emergency plan? How certain are you the starship will appear? Strand asked. The computer has not made a prediction of action. I detected pre-jump pulses. Did you not understand my original statement? I understood, Strand muttered. I simply don't understand why you haven't told me about these pre-jump pulses before this. It was never germane to any of our past situations. Fine, Strand said. So what's this secret weapon that can defeat the Adox starship? You are misinformed, the robot said. I said nothing about a secret weapon. But you just told me you have a plan. I did, and I do. Well, Strand shouted, what is your plan? You'd better tell me while there's time to implement it. Instead of answering, the robot simply hovered in place. Have it your way, Strand said. He whirled back to the control panel. The robot troubled him. Due to intense suspicion and heat on his neck, Strand spun around again. A slot had opened on the robot's cone-shaped top section. A small nozzle protruded from the slot. Strand shouted with outrage. He slapped his chest, hitting an ancient piece of technology. It activated a personal force field around him. He did it just in time, too. A ray flickered from the robot's nozzle, striking the clone's force field. That part of the field quickly began to glow red. Strand saved his breath. He wanted to shout at the robot, telling it what a treacherous bastard he'd turned out to be. Instead, the clone drew the blaster, the one that had formerly been under his pillow. After the fold fighters had left, he'd retrieved it from his quarters. Strand depressed the blaster's trigger, and not a damn thing happened. I took the precaution of deactivating your blaster, the robot informed him, even as the little construct continued to beam him. Why are you doing this? Strand sobbed. You'll kill us both. On the contrary, you are the only one between the two of us who will die, the robot said. I told you I have a plan. I do. It does not involve you, however as this ship will soon be terminated. It's not a living ship, you idiot. You are wrong, the robot said. It is living, in a sense, at least. That is not the point. As the robot spoke, it continued to beam him. Strand saw the force field in front of him begin to turn purple. He stood, but that was all he managed to do. He felt a terrible lethargy overtake him. The force field is interfering with your motor functions, the robot said. 
you can momentarily block my beam, but you cannot run away to a different part of the ship. I knew you would activate the force field. Thus, I have pre-activated certain ship functions. Why are you telling me this? It is my last gift to you. You seek knowledge concerning me. You are about to die, copy of Strand. Thus, I will grant you greater knowledge concerning my real function. Did you always plan to murder me? No. I had computed that we would succeed without that. Captain Maddox has changed the equation. He is a remarkable individual. Are you saying that to piss me off? No, I am sorry. That was not my intent. I will now tell you my true function. At that point, the force field abruptly collapsed. As it did, the ancient device on Strand's chest heated up incredibly. The clone of the Methuselah man howled in agony. The intensely hot device burned through his garments and began to scald his skin and heat his bones underneath. Strand collapsed upon the floor, writhing in agony. The super-hot device began to burn through his body. The robot no longer beamed him. The builder construct hovered closer. A new slot opened. A thicker nozzle protruded. Foam bubbled from it. The foam fell on the super-hot device. In seconds, the foam hardened around the thing. The danger to the ghost ship vanished, as the hardened foam would not allow the super-hot device to burn through the deck plates. The human was dead, however. The thicker nozzle moved back inside the artillery shell-shaped robot. The slot closed. The robot floated to the control panel. Electric impulses left it. Lights flashed on the controls. The ghost ship adjusted its flight path. The robot turned around and headed away. It would have told Strand its real function. It would have granted the man that final knowledge. The robot had miscalculated the age and fragility of the ancient force field emitter. It did not like that failure. There had been far too much failure for such a masterful construct as itself. That caused the robot to wonder if it was too old. The builders had been the greatest race in the galaxy. They had constructed it and given it its function. But entropy was the enemy of even the greatest. The robot could not detect any problems with its software or hardware, however. The robot moved faster, floating through a hatch into the main computer area. It began to issue commands. It did not have much time. Soon, Starship Victory would appear. He had slain Strand because the clone would undoubtedly have tried any trick possible to remain alive. The clone might have given away its, the robot's, existence. That, the robot could not allow there was a 22% probability it would not be able to escape the Tristano system. Not acceptable. That would retard the great plan by too much. A piece of ultra-computing, a pulsating cube, detached from the main computer. Within a miniature tractor beam, the robot pulled the cube to itself. The very top of the robot's cone unscrewed on command. With a reverse tractor beam, the robot caused the piece to levitate. It then brought the pulsating cube down through the new opening into itself. A moment later, the very top of the cone settled back down. It screwed back onto the robot. Satisfied with its progress, the robot turned and floated toward the torpedo tubes. Soon, it inserted itself in a tube. With another electric impulse, it gave the command. Thirty-one seconds later, the tube ejected the robot into space. The little builder construct used a torp pack, accelerating toward the Lommer point. The ghost ship was already on a new heading, moving away from the Lommer point. At that moment, a starship appeared.
the robot emitted another command. It ejected from the accelerator, moving on a straight trajectory toward the Lommer point. The torp pack exploded nine seconds later, hopefully shielding its tiny mass from the starship sensors. The robot now calculated it had a 78% chance of pulling this off. Chapter 32 Victory came out of the star drive jump ready for battle. Lieutenant Noonan wrapped out orders. The rest of the bridge crew were soon up and operating. For the first few minutes, no one could detect anything unusual. I see something, Galleon said. The cloaked vessel? Valerie asked. Negative, Valerie. It is the radiation from a recent explosion. How recent? It must have exploded just before we jumped, Galleon said. I detect debris from the explosion. This is suspicious. Talk, talk, Valerie said. What do you see? A piece of debris, like I said, is heading for the Lommer point. I do not believe that is a coincidence. Scan the debris, Valerie said. Captain, Andros said. I've detected mass gravity waves and the signature concentration of metals. I believe I have located the ghost ship. Galleon, Valerie said. Confirm if you can. Confirmed, Galleon said. The cloaked vessel no longer appears to be heading for the Lommer point. It is attempting to circumvent the third terrestrial planet. I believe it is trying to move to an inward Lommer point. Valerie frowned. That seems odd. Why not make an attempt for the closer jump point? I do not know, Valerie. Valerie stared at the hollow image. Something seemed off, but she couldn't place it. She shook her head. She had her orders. She must destroy the cloaked vessel. She gave the orders. Soon, the starship's powerful disruptor cannon energized. The weapons officer tracked Andros's concentrated metals. Ready, Captain, the weapons officer said. Fire, Valerie said. The ship's antimatter engines hummed with power. A great beam left the disruptor cannon, speared through space, and struck the cloaked vessel. The beam burned through the hull armor with pathetic ease. It smashed bulkheads next, burning through one after another. The clone of Strand's body lay in the path of the beam. It sizzled into nothing, and the beam reached the ghost ship's propulsion system. At that point, the small cloaked vessel ignited. It blasted apart from the disruptor beam and its own exploding engines. Bulkheads, fuel, computer parts, biomatter, all blew outward in a mass. The cloaked vessel was destroyed. Captain, Galleon said. Valerie sat back against her command chair. She'd done it. She had destroyed the clone of Strand and his cloaked vessel. It hadn't been as hard or as difficult as she'd imagined. There must be a lesson in there for her. She could do this. She could command a starship in battle. Captain, Galleon said. Valerie smiled. She waved to the bridge crew. Well done, she said. You did it. You acted promptly and precisely. Captain Maddox will be proud of your achievement. Valerie, Galleon said. She turned toward the hollow image. It's rude to interrupt the acting captain of a starship while she's speaking. I am sorry, Valerie, but I have something odd to report. Valerie felt a moment of doubt. She brushed that aside. She just destroyed Strand. Okay, what is it? As you annihilated the cloaked vessel, Galleon said. The Lommer point activated. What's that even mean? She asked. Something used a Lommer point opening. Something went down the Lommer route connection. I suspect it was the piece of debris I spotted earlier. Valerie pursed her lips. Could the cloaked ship's destruction have imitated a Lommer point opening? I don't see how, Valerie. Such a frequency is very deliberate. So, you're saying something escaped while we destroyed the cloaked vessel? I would rate that the highest possibility, Galleon said. Chief, Valerie said. What do you make of that? Andros thought about it and finally shrugged. I've never heard of such a thing. We should go through the Lommer point and see what made it to the other side, 
Galleon said. No, Valerie said. First, we pick up Captain Maddox. Galleon hesitated before saying, And Keith, Valerie? She stared at the hollow image, wondering if Galleon had just secretly reprimanded her. No, she didn't think so. You don't want to first pick up the captain? She asked Galleon. You are correct, Valerie. Let us get the captain. We can always follow the Lommer point in a few days. I don't see how it can make a difference, as the debris was not traveling fast. It should be easy to spot later. Right, Valerie said. Besides, we've just taken out the deadly menace. We've done it. We should all be proud. On that note, the bridge crew scanned the area and soon began to ready itself for another jump, this time back to the missing personnel in the shuttles. Chapter 33 Captain Maddox was in a deep state of sleep aboard a combat shuttle, dreaming fitfully. In his dream, he ran along a fog-shrouded beach. He could hear the crash of the ocean waves beside him, but he could not see the ocean. He felt the stiff breeze. He smelled the salt. It seemed odd that he couldn't see the ocean. Every few seconds, salt droplets and spray struck his face. Maddox began to wonder why he was running so hard. What was so important that he struggled like this? Why not stop, climb up the beach, and just sit for a while? Was it necessary to struggle all the time? Maddox did stop, and the sand underneath shifted, causing him to stagger. The shaking grew worse until a giant crack in the sand appeared before him. The captain expected water to gush up. Instead, a strange octopus-like being flopped out of the crack. The thing writhed on the sand on the other side of the crack. Finally, it gathered several of its long tentacles and pushed itself up onto them. The creature regarded him. Are you a fisher? Maddox asked. He didn't know why, but he had trouble remembering exactly what fishers were supposed to look like. Why did you stop running? The creature asked. Why should I run? That is the essence of life, the fisher said. To run? asked Maddox. To live, to do, to compete. Why? Because to stop doing those things is to die, the octopus-like creature replied. Do you want to die, Captain Maddox? Maddox frowned. All of a sudden, that seemed like a tough question. You took a hit in the Alpha Centauri system, the creature said. The battle cost you more than any other battle ever has. It has left you exhausted. You have lost your grit, Captain. I don't know that that's true. You have questioned the wisdom of running, when this is the only time in existence that you can run. Once you die, your time in life is over. Yes, that's true. What do you want out of life, Captain? Maddox blinked at the strange creature. To start with, I want to avenge my mother. You want to kill your father? I want to find him first. Do you know his name? Lord Dracos, do you know for a fact that your father is Lord Dracos? The creature asked. Yes. Captain Maddox. Do you really know that for a fact? This is ridiculous. Who are you? Do you know Captain Maddox? 
the creature asked again as it began to fade from existence. Why do you think I'm wrong about Lord Dracos? Maddox shouted. Do you know for a fact? The creature asked in a faint voice that seemed to echo as it faded from view. In his dream, Maddox shook his head. That had been straight up weird. Why was he having such strange dreams all the time? In the dream, Maddox's head jerked upright. How did he know this was a dream? Even as he thought the question, the dream, the invisible ocean with its crashing waves, faded away as Maddox woke abruptly from sleep. He lay on a cot in a tiny cabin aboard the combat shuttle. He was sweaty and felt grungy. He knew that the battle against the Ska was the reason he kept having such strange dreams. Would he ever be rid of them? Would he ever recover fully from the fight? With a groan, Maddox sat up. He felt lightheaded and slightly nauseous. With a grunt, he stood. He staggered to a side alcove and opened a drawer. He took out a cloth and dried his sweaty face. A red klaxon began to blare. The harsh noise startled him. Maddox swirled around, lunged to his captain's jacket, put it on, shoved his feet into his boots, and hurried out of the hatch to see what was wrong. Chapter 34 Maddox hurried into the piloting chamber. Meta sat at the controls, typing fast onto the console. What's happening? Maddox demanded. An enemy ship just appeared, Meta said. Appeared? asked Maddox as he slid into the seat beside his wife's. He buckled in as Meta applied thrust. The combat shuttle jumped ahead, picking up velocity. Maddox switched on an independent weapons board. In a pinch, the pilot could control all the ship functions. She could also delegate responsibilities so she could concentrate on piloting. Maddox immediately saw the debris of a destroyed strike fighter. The other strike fighter fired a salvo of defensive missiles. An incoming enemy missile detonated. The blast took out a second enemy missile. It did nothing to the third that came in seconds later. That missile zeroed in on the remaining strike fighter. As another flock of anti-missiles zoomed at the missile, the enemy warhead exploded. The strike fighter was deep in the combat radius blast. The Star Watch fighter buckled and began to flip end over end and suddenly exploded as something hit the fuel pod. Scratch two strike fighters, Meta said grimly. Maddox felt cold inside. It wasn't due to fear, but to concentrated anger. Someone had just killed two of his officers. He was responsible for them, and he felt the deaths keenly. He felt it more since Alpha Centauri than he would have before the terrible battle with the Ska. He fiddled with the weapons board and finally saw the attacking vessel. The squat spaceship was three times the size of their shuttle. According to the scans, the enemy vessel had heavy hull armor. But more importantly, it had an electromagnetic shield, one that might prove resistant to their ordnance. Is that from the asteroid? Maddox asked. It just appeared, Meta said, so I don't know. Appeared like a fold fighter? Yes, Meta shouted. It's radar locked onto us. Right, Maddox said. His fingers blurred across his board. The shuttle ejected emitters. Done, Maddox said. Meta began to turn the shuttle hard right and down. As the G's pulled at him, Maddox checked on Keith's shuttle. It was farther away and had already launched several emitters along with two drones. The drones had been placed to look like mines. Keith was no doubt piloting over there, but had kept calm silence. That must be a pirate vessel, Maddox said. They might be Strand's people. Meta glanced at him. Maddox thought carefully. Could Strand have planned for this, his being back here in a shuttle while Victory was elsewhere? He didn't see how, and yet, the clone had lured Victory out to Smade's asteroid in the first place. The enemy ship is accelerating, Meta said. It's coming after us. Maddox saw the calm light blinking. He pressed a switch. On his weapons board, he saw the blunt face of a Shanghai heavy. 
This is Sergeant Chem, the huge man said. You will surrender immediately. If you do, I will let you live, Captain Maddox. You should surrender to me, Maddox said. Victory will return shortly. If you're caught firing on my shuttle, you will die. Chem glanced at someone unseen. The heavy nodded. I'm already a dead man, Captain. I'd love to kill you and your people before I die. But if you can persuade me why I should let you live, I'm waiting to hear it. Maddox made some swift calculations. As he did, Meta spoke up. The enemy ship is powering up its laser. I will surrender, Maddox told the heavy. I know, Jem said. There's still radar locked onto our ship, Meta said. I'll power down, Maddox told Jem. The enemy laser port turned bright with energy. A second later, a powerful beam smashed against the shuttle's light shield, knocking it down with ease. The beam struck the armored hull, burning deeper by the microsecond. Meta jinked the shuttle one way and then the other. The enemy laser kept digging into the hull armor, but not always in the same spot. As the beam continued burning, globules of melted metal floated into space, leaving a trail. You're a dead man, Chem, Maddox said. I have said as much, the heavy replied. You are not convincing me to let you live, but to take you with me to the grave. Maddox cocked his head. The words struck him as rehearsed. He's killing us, Meta said. It was the fold. He bypassed all our defenses by jumping next to us. We're not dead yet, Maddox said. He didn't know how they were going to get out of this one. The other ship was superior to two shuttles. Without the enemy's fold mechanism putting them right on their tails, they could have easily outrun the enemy ship until victory returned. Maddox had never counted on the asteroid pirates to have a fold-capable ship. I got sloppy, Maddox told himself. It might cost Meta her life. The captain realized he cared more for Meta's life than for his own. No, the captain whispered. He wasn't going to quit that easily. At that point, one of Keith's fake mines energized with power. The drone began to accelerate for the enemy vessel. The enemy laser stopped beaming Maddox's shuttle's nearly ruptured hull. We have to attack, Maddox said. Turn us around. It will take time to decelerate, Meta said. Right, Maddox said. His fingers blurred across his weapons board. He launched all their anti-missile rockets, sending them at the enemy vessel. The squat enemy ship blew up Keith's secret drone. The lasers switched from the exploding drone and targeted the next one. This is no good, Meta said. The ship outclasses both shuttles. Maddox bit his lower lip. This was insanely frustrating. The comm board began to blink again. He tapped the panel but didn't see any image. Across the screen appeared the words, Don't worry, you have a friend. What's that mean? Meta asked as she glanced at the screen. Maddox tapped his board, once more linking it with the outer back scope. An escape pod ejected from the squat enemy vessel. Seconds later, the pod's thruster propelled it faster as it moved sideways, away from the ship. As that happened, the enemy vessel retargeted Maddox's shuttle. The heavy reappeared on the upper left portion of the screen. Surrender, Captain, Chem said. I will, Maddox said. You have to stop firing, though. Explode all your missiles as a sign of good faith, the heavy said. Maddox stared at the heavy. He didn't see a way out of this one. What had the message meant? Don't worry, you have a friend? Yes, Maddox said. He tapped a control. A pulse went out. A second later, the anti-missiles detonated. The heavy grinned nastily, showing off horse-sized teeth. Let me see your women. I want to see my prize. What? Maddox asked. Your women, Chem said. I'm going to. At that moment, the comm signal severed. On Maddox's screen, the squat enemy vessel simply exploded. One second it was there, the next, armored hull, pieces of biomatter, spent fuel, water, and all kinds of debris exploded outward. What did you do? Meta asked. Maddox shook his head. Then he tapped his board. 
The blast heat from the explosion wasn't enough to hurt them, as it hadn't been a thermonuclear explosion. Thus, there were no gamma or X-rays to worry about. Neither was there an EMP coming for them. What had just happened? Captain, Keith said over the comm. How did you pull that one off? Maddox sent a comm signal to the accelerating escape pod. A second later, Yen Cho peered at him from the screen. Hello, Captain, Yen Cho said. Did you appreciate my gift? Maddox nodded slowly. Perhaps I should explain, Yen Cho said. Strand took me prisoner some time ago. His people controlled the attack craft just now. But they weren't as clever as the clone. You do know that a clone of Strand is behind all this, don't you? Maddox said nothing. Yen Cho the android. It had been quite some time since he'd seen the construct. In any case, the attacker leader became sloppy, Yen Cho said. I managed to escape my confinement, sabotage the ship, and escape in a pod. Now I could use a hand, as otherwise I'm stranded out here. Rotate your pod and begin decelerating, Maddox said crisply. Victory should be back soon. I'll have them pick you up after I debark. I do appreciate your help. It's fortunate for us you happen to be on that vessel. No, Captain Maddox. It was fortunate for me that you are here. I am grateful for the diversion your shuttles provided. We are both fortunate. Yen Cho seemed to think about that. Yes, he said. That is so. Chapter 35 Victory reappeared shortly. The shuttles landed in the hangar bay. Afterward, Valerie sent a shuttle to pick up Yen Cho. Marines in combat suits trained their weapons on the android as he entered the shuttle's cargo bay. He did not question the need for their presence. Soon enough, the rescue shuttle landed, and the armored Marines escorted Yen Cho to a holding cell. During the rescue action, Valerie formally relinquished command to Maddox. She also gave a verbal report of the battle with the cloaked vessel and the piece of debris that had apparently escaped through a lomber point. With all these threads tangling at once, Maddox decided to hold a briefing. It was time to thrash through a few of the actions and decide if they could what they possibly implied. In an hour, they assembled. Captain Maddox sat at the head of the large conference table. Beside him, to the right, were Meta, Riker, and Keith, with Andros Crank at the other end of the table. Valerie was beside him on the left, with a spot for Galleon and then Finley, the mercenary pilot. Maddox included her because she was familiar with this region of space and the Tristano system in particular. Maddox had Valerie repeat her report. Afterward, Keith told the others about the combat with the squad fold vessel from the asteroid. Lastly, Galleon reported about what they knew concerning the troubles on Smade's asteroid. It is chaos over there, the little hollow image said. According to my latest intercepts, poison gas is flooding the interior levels. Finley gasped, turning white at the news. Do you have any idea who pumped the gas into the life support systems? Maddox asked her. No, Finley whispered. It sounds horrible. Who would do such a thing? The android might be able to tell us, Valerie said dryly. I'll interrogate Yen Cho soon enough, Maddox said. As to who might do it, the obvious culprit would be the clone of Strand. That is my belief as well, Galleon said. Strand the original is notoriously callous regarding human life. He might have caused such mass death and destruction to cover his actions while on the asteroid. Agreed, Maddox said. What about the android? Valerie said. Yen Cho helped us in the past, but that doesn't mean I trust him now. All true, Maddox said. Clearly, he didn't help us out of any sense of altruism. Like you, I suspect the timing of his appearance. His appearance and rescue does seem to bend the laws of probability. 
Galleon said. I suggest we examine his ethics and determine the reason for his actions. Explain that, Maddox said. Is Yen Cho cold-blooded enough to engineer an attack and then callously sabotage his own people and vessel while he flees? Galleon asked. He's an android, Riker said. It's not a matter of cold blood for them. It's a matter of logic. Maddox nodded. The question arises, if Yen Cho engineered the situation, does he expect us to believe him at face value? That is an astute question, Galleon said. I suggest you ask him. He's an android, Riker repeated. His face isn't going to give away anything. Quite true, Galleon said. But his statements might. We'll shelve the idea for now, Maddox said as he turned to Valerie. I would like your thoughts, Lieutenant, regarding the debris that went through the Lommer point. I've been thinking about that for some time, Valerie said. I don't know what the debris was, but I know it must be important. Lommer points don't simply activate by accident so a piece of supposed debris can transfer. That was planned. Galleon, Maddox said. I concur with Valerie, Galleon said. It would seem that the innocent piece of debris was the most valuable thing aboard the cloaked vessel. I wonder if it was so important that the clone sacrificed himself to shield its escape. Maddox slapped the table and pointed at Galleon. I should have thought of that. Yes, that lets us know something about what escaped. I do not understand, Galleon said. You are suggesting it is living. Not necessarily biological, Maddox said. It's of builder construction. Let me amend that. It's most probably of builder construction. Which is why the clone possibly acted as a decoy to let it escape? Galleon asked. No, Maddox said. I don't believe a clone of Strand would act as a decoy to save anyone except possibly for the real Strand. However, a builder device might have forced the clone into a certain course of action. That implies that the piece of debris possessed intelligence, Galleon said. Right, Maddox said. We have to track it. We have to do it faster rather than slower. I'm not sure that Keith or I could survive a fold or a jump right now. We need, we need another 24 hours. I don't think we should put you in a shuttle again, sir, Valerie said. How do we really know what's going on at Smade's asteroid? Those could all be fake messages. If that's true, more fold ships could be waiting for you to enter a shuttle while we go elsewhere. There's another point to consider, Andros Crank said. If it's a builder device, I'm thinking the captain is right. We have to reach it as quickly as possible. While the piece of debris is small, it might have waiting equipment on the other side of the Lommer Point. We'll begin maximum acceleration for the Lommer Point, Maddox said. The lieutenant is correct. Now isn't the time to leave anyone behind. We should investigate Smade's asteroid just to be sure of the reports and to lend a hand to any survivors. Unfortunately, we don't have time for that, as we now have another emergency. We must see if the debris is indeed builder tech. Could that be why Yen Cho is here? Meta asked. The others looked at her. Yen Cho was on the asteroid, Meta said. Could he be coordinating with Strand or with the possible piece of builder debris? That's a good point, Maddox said. What was Yen Cho doing on Smade's asteroid? I think it's time I had a talk with the android. Do you expect to get any truth from it, sir? Riker asked. Maddox glanced at Galleon before he regarded his sergeant. Maybe not the truth, the captain said. But we can begin to analyze what he says and doesn't say. It will give us something to do while victory accelerates for the Lommer point. On that note, the captain dismissed the others. Chapter 36 To Maddox's disgust, he found himself tired out after the meeting. He wasn't used to his body betraying him like this. Usually he could push through any normal fatigue or demand that his body perform better and faster. Today, as he walked down a corridor, he yawned and his mind blurred. He was simply too tired to interrogate the android. With Yen Cho, he wanted to be at his sharpest, 
not having to stumble through the interrogation because he was too stubborn to take a rest. Thus, Maddox changed direction and went to his quarters. He took a nap, expecting to get up in a half hour. Sometime later, Meta shook him awake. Maddox sat up groggily. He hardly felt any better. Did he even get any sleep? What time is it? He asked. You slept for three hours, Meta said. I've never seen you nap for more than one before. Maddox was dumbfounded. He climbed out of bed and felt momentarily lightheaded. That was wrong, all wrong. He needed a physical. Maybe there was something off with him. If so, he needed to find out what. Meta accompanied him to medical. Dr. Lister gave him a physical. Afterward, she picked up a brain scanner, clicked it on, and set it before his head. She studied the readings and became agitated. What is it, doctor? Maddox asked. With the brain scanner aimed at his scalp, she continued to study the readings. It appears as if there's, I'd call it a neuron deficiency. She clicked off the scanner and set it on a stand. Lister kept flicking her lower lip and finally looked at Maddox. This must have something to do with the operation, she said. I wasn't able to extract all the control fibers, remember? Does the scanner show the fibers having any effect on my brain? Maddox asked. Not that I can detect, and that bothers me. Meta, the captain said, turning to his wife. She lowered a magazine as she sat in a chair to the side. Are you carrying a weapon? Maddox asked. Meta raised her blonde eyebrows before shaking her head. Should I get one? At once, Maddox said. Throwing the magazine onto a side table, Meta jumped up and ran out of the examining room. Do you mind telling me what this was about? Lister asked. A moment, doctor, Maddox said. Galleon, the captain said into the air. The ad hoc hollow image appeared a second later. Find Riker, the captain said. Tell him to bring a sidearm and hurry to medical. He's going to be my bodyguard for a time. Yes, sir, the hollow image said, disappearing. Maddox drew a long-barreled gun from inside his jacket. This one wasn't a beam weapon, but a regular slug thrower noted for its accuracy. If Lister appeared surprised by the second order and the gun, she didn't show it. Had she known he'd been carrying a sidearm during the physical? Shall I call security? The doctor asked. Would you like a marine guard to come? Most certainly not, Maddox said. Lister took her time, finally saying, I must admit that I'm perplexed by your actions, sir. Maddox studied the doctor closely, deciding she wasn't an android or a spacer agent. He had become, anxious was the wrong word. He didn't know the correct word. The point was that there were far too many strange events occurring one right after another. He was beginning to believe that none of those events had occurred by accident including his foreign tiredness and the strangeness of the brain scan. Sit beside me, please, the captain said. He shoved a chair against the far wall, sat down, and kept his long-barreled gun aimed at the door. Really, captain, are you expecting assassins? Listen carefully, Maddox said, turning to stare at the doctor. You must sit down and shut up. I need to concentrate and I'm finding that extraordinarily difficult. Cowed, Lister set a chair beside him and mutely took a seat. After a minute of silence, Maddox put the gun on his lap. He kept a keen eye on the door, however. I do not believe the nerve fibers, the ones you failed to extract from my brain, have caused the diminishment of my neural connections. Lister glanced at him in wonderment. It seemed to take an effort of will for her to speak. That doesn't make sense, she finally said. What then has caused the diminishment, as you put it? The question seemed to upset the captain, although it would have been difficult to tell by his bearing. Instead, in a robotic fashion, Maddox picked up his gun, stood, and turned toward Lister. 
He brought the handle of the gun down hard against Lister's forehead. The handle made an audible thump against her skull. She fell off the chair and collapsed onto the floor, out cold. I hope I didn't miscalculate, Maddox told the unconscious doctor. As Maddox finished speaking, a woman with short red hair opened the door. She did not stare in astonishment at the fallen doctor. She did not look at the gun in Maddox's grip. Instead, she stared directly into Maddox's eyes. Listen to me, the woman said intently. Maddox began to smile, but found to his surprise that he lowered his gun so the barrel pointed at the floor. After that, he craned his neck forward so he could better listen to the woman. That was strange. The captain tried to form words, but couldn't quite get them out. No, the woman said. You mustn't try to speak. You must listen to what I'm going to tell you. Are you listening, Captain Maddox? It seemed as if wheels turned in his mind. Those wheels shifted the tracks of his thoughts onto a different course. Instead of resisting her words, Maddox nodded. I'm here to help you, she said. I'm here to help Starwatch. That seemed incredible, and yet, she seemed like the most trustworthy person in the universe to him. You captured an android, didn't you? She asked. Maddox nodded. What is the android's name? Yan Cho, Maddox said. The Yan Cho? She asked. Once more, Maddox nodded. This is very important, the woman said. You must kill him. Maddox stared at her in bewilderment. I am from Brigadier O'Hara's office, she said. N no, Maddox stammered. That isn't true. You will believe whatever I tell you, the woman said. Her eyes seemed to expand then. This time Maddox tried to resist. He would not believe her. He would... The woman's eyes expanded until they were all Maddox could see. That turned wheels in his mind, made it impossible to resist. No, he whispered. He could no longer see the whites of her eyes, just the pupils. They seemed to expand as well. That produced a horrible headache. Maddox felt nauseous. He bent over and vomited. Believe what I say the woman intoned. I am from Brigadier O'Hara's office. Maddox could only see darkness now. He heard the words, but he wasn't going to believe them. That created worse pain in his mind, searing agony. He didn't want to, but a cry tore from his lips. His strength drained away with the cry. He fell to his knees and then collapsed onto his hands. The long-barreled gun had clunked onto the floor beside him. He could hear it, but he couldn't see it. Do not fight me, Captain, the woman said. You will die if you fight me. Tears filled the captain's eyes, and the pain exploded to a heightened level in his head. This time he felt the wheels turn slowly like giant gears in a vast machine. Something awful was occurring in his mind. It could kill him if he tried to resist. With the knowledge of his nearness to death came an opening of the inner eye. In a moment of clarity, Maddox saw opposing forces swirling toward a central point. That point was him, no. That point was Starship Victory. With the realization, his sight returned. Although he remained on his hands and knees, Maddox looked up into the woman's eyes. He realized, You're a spacer spy, Maddox whispered. You have brain modifications. You did something to Dr. Lister during the operation. She deliberately left the fibers in my brain so at your convenience you could tamper with them and thus with me. The red-haired woman shook her head, and she looked at him with pity. I don't have time to reprogram your mind, Captain, 
That's too bad for you. We could have used you, but you're simply too stubborn. We could have. Those were her last words. A shot rang out from somewhere. Then her head exploded as a heavy slug spattered her skull and sprayed brains everywhere. With a sickening thud, her body thumped against the floor. Maddox gasped. Pain. He clutched his head, and with a moan, he collapsed, unconscious, onto the floor. Chapter 37 If Maddox dreamed, he couldn't remember. He was unconscious for 14 hours. Finally, he awoke and found himself in medical. Sergeant Riker looked up from where he sat. Riker was an old salt and star watch service. The man had been with Maddox for many years already. The sergeant had leathery features, a bionic eye, and a bionic left arm. As per orders, Riker was armed. Feeling better? The sergeant asked in his gruff voice. Not particularly, Maddox said. My head hurts, and my eyesight is blurry. The captain made to get up and found himself in restraints. What is the meaning of this? Maddox asked. You were thrashing in your sleep, sir. The doctor didn't want you falling out of bed. Undo these straps immediately. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, sir. Sergeant, Maddox said. The captain stopped talking. Is this because of Dr. Lister? That's right, sir. She's in critical condition. You hit her hard. Did Valerie order this? Maddox asked while thinking fast. That she did, sir. Tell Valerie to get down here on the double. Riker glanced elsewhere. I don't have to, sir. The lieutenant is here. The sergeant backed away as Lieutenant Noonan stepped up to the med cot. She had a stern cast to her features, looking down at Maddox with a reproving glance. That's enough, sergeant, Valerie said without looking at him. You're dismissed. Riker, Maddox said. Valerie is under someone else's control. Disarm her at once. With the twist of her neck, Valerie gave the sergeant a scathing glance. Instead of the results she wanted, her head swayed back, possibly due to the heavy caliber gun in Riker's human hand aimed at her. This is ridiculous, Valerie said. Put that away and report to security. Sit down, Riker told her. This is mutiny, Valerie said. This is starship victory, Riker countered. We've been under constant attack throughout the years by all kinds of subtle and hidden enemies. It wouldn't surprise me to find out you're an android. We took on Yen Cho, right? Who knows what kind of master plan he's set up against us. Valerie continued to frown. Her frown wasn't at Riker anymore. She seemed to frown inwardly at herself. Did someone odd come to see you earlier? Maddox asked her. Valerie swiveled about and stared down at Maddox. What do you mean? She asked. Maddox calculated quickly. Step away from my bed, he said. Valerie raised her chin haughtily. Before she could do anything else, Riker shoved her with his bionic arm. She catapulted sideways, hitting the far wall with a thump. The sergeant didn't fiddle with the straps holding Maddox. He ripped them off with his bionic hand. Maddox sat up, his head still hurt like blazes, but at least he wasn't strapped like a beast. He climbed over the cot's railing and leaned against the bed. This was getting complicated. He'd been asleep 14 hours. Did that mean hidden foes had run a victory for those 14 hours? You'll be court-martialed for that, Valerie told Riker as she sat on the floor. I've done worse, Riker said. Galleon, Maddox said into the air. The hollow image appeared. He glanced at Riker, Maddox, and then Valerie. Is this mutiny, Valerie? Galleon asked her. Yes, she said. Summon the Marines. Put these two in the brig. If they resist, tell the Marines to shoot to kill. It is as I thought, Galleon said. You are not yourself, Valerie. Captain, 
the little hollow image said. What are your orders, sir? Get Meta, Maddox said, and tell Andros to come along. I want to get to the bottom of this as soon as possible. Fifteen minutes later, Meta and Andros joined the others. Galleon also reappeared. This is a tight fit, Maddox said. They were all in the same med room. But for the moment, I don't want anyone else to know what's going on. He explained what had happened to him with Dr. Lister and the mind-attacking spy 14 hours ago. I assume you shot her, Maddox said to Riker. Yes, sir, the sergeant said. I felt terrible shooting a woman. It still bothers me. I did it because there was something badly off about her. It was a gut sense. Riker had dealt with the ska, although in a different manner than Maddox. Just like the captain, the sergeant wasn't the same. Has anyone done an autopsy on the woman? Maddox asked. No, Galleon said. Did you scan her? Maddox asked. Valerie gave strict orders that I was to leave the body alone, the hollow image said. Where is the corpse now? Asked Maddox. In the morgue, Galleon said. Check it, Maddox said. Report back as soon as you confirm it's still there. Galleon disappeared and reappeared a moment later. The corpse is gone, Captain. Maddox turned to Valerie. What did you do with it? Me? The frowning lieutenant asked. Not a thing. Galleon, asked Maddox. I cannot assess whether Valerie is telling the truth or not, the hollow image said. Let's assume the lieutenant is, Maddox said as he studied Valerie. That means someone else removed the corpse. My guess is that the corpse is gone for good, that it is no longer on the ship. This hidden someone wanted to hide the woman's identity? Riker asked. Exactly, Maddox said. But I believe I already know her allegiance to the Spacers. The red-haired woman likely had shoe-like adaptations, as the Spacers call them. Shu had been a Spacer agent. At first, Shu had worked against Maddox and the crew but later had chosen to help them escape a terrible fate 1,000 light years from the Commonwealth. She had died before the terrible war with the Swarm Invasion Fleet. She had died from sabotage in her prison in South Africa region. Her adaptations had been tiny builder devices implanted in her body, powered by a builder power pack, also inside her body. She had been able to disrupt electric systems and practice transduction. She had been able to see electromagnetic radiation and electromagnetic wavelengths and process the data as fast as a computer. What do you think the spacers want? Meta asked Maddox. Likely the same thing Yen Cho wants, the captain replied. The spy wanted me to kill the android. I think she wanted to kill the competition. I have a question. Galleon said. Maddox nodded. Could Yen Cho have planted the red hair agent? Galleon asked. He had the woman order you to destroy him. In that way, the android validates his presence here. That's not bad, Galleon, Maddox said. The answer is that we don't know. I think you'll find, if you search Dr. Lister, that she has a small device in her brain. I don't think it was a spacer adaptation or a brain implant like they put in my brain at Smades, but a device the spacer agent could use with electromagnetic modifications. That should be easy to verify, Galleon said. What about Valerie? Meta asked. We can check that easily enough, too, Maddox said. Galleon, if you will. Sir, the hollow image said. You are correct. There is a tiny device lodged near Valerie's brain. Amazing, Andros said. How did you know all this, Captain? I didn't, Maddox said. It was a guess. There may be another spacer agent or more on the ship. We will have to proceed slowly. First, though, I want all the stray fibers removed from my brain. I do not want any more handles for spacer or other agents to use against me. Such removal could prove difficult, Galleon said. Nevertheless, Maddox said, I believe it is imperative before we proceed. What do we do with Valerie in the meantime? Riker asked. We'll have her device removed first, before my surgery, Maddox said. Now listen. 
This is how we're going to do this. Chapter 38 Valerie came to in the med center with a splitting headache. Worse, she found Maddox, Riker, Meta, Andros, Crank, and Galleon encircling her med cot, staring down at her expectantly. It hit the lieutenant then. Maddox had guessed right about a device in her head. Sir, Valerie said. She tried to moisten a much too dry mouth and realized her bottom lip had cracked. Just a minute, Meta said. She left the cot and returned with a glass of water. Helping Valerie sit up, Meta held the water cup for her. The water tasted good, seeming to sink into her flesh like water in a desert. Valerie drained the cup, gasping afterward. Another one? Meta asked. Valerie nodded even as she sensed the captain's impatience. The lieutenant gulped down the second glass of water, but she declined a third despite how much she wanted it. I guess you're waiting to know what I remember, Valerie said. Indeed, Maddox said. Valerie sat up so the others didn't seem like gang members casing the wounded victim. Let me see, Valerie said. There was a, a warrant officer. He told me there was trouble in computing. The chief needed a decision on a faulty processor, and he had asked for me to hurry. I should have checked over the comm, but I didn't. Anyway, once I got to computing, the warrant officer turned on me. The man used a stunner, a small handheld device. I collapsed and couldn't move, and it was hard to hear. I remember a woman showing up and pressing an implement against the back of my head. She must have inserted the device. What did the woman look like? Maddox asked. I didn't get a good look at her, or if I did, I don't remember. She had soft hands, long red hair. That's all I need to hear, Maddox said, interrupting. Red hair. It was obviously the same agent. What was the warrant officer's name? Uh, Valerie said. Warrant Officer Smalls. Ted Smalls. Galleon, Maddox snapped. Where is the warrant officer presently? A moment, sir, Galleon said as his eyelids fluttered. The hollow image's eyes widened suddenly. Ted Smalls is dead in his quarters, sir. Get there at once, Maddox told Galleon. Determine what killed him. Return as soon as you find out. Galleon disappeared and reappeared almost instantly. There is a tiny puncture wound in his head, sir. I doubt it was self-inflicted. There is more. The corpse is rank. Is that the correct word? He smells bad? Maddox asked. That is so, Galleon said. I believe Warrant Officer Smalls has been dead for many days. Maddox inhaled sharply through his nostrils. I no longer think the red-haired woman was a spacer agent. I'm beginning to suspect androids using spacer equipment. We're going to have to resort to the old methods to flush out the remaining androids. It seems doubtful there are too many of them aboard. If there were, they would have tried to take over by now. Galleon, Maddox said. Is Yen Cho still alive? Is that a trick question, sir? Galleon asked. In a strict sense, is the android a living being? Is Yen Cho presently functional? Maddox amended. Once more, Galleon's eyelids fluttered. Yes, sir. Yen Cho is still in the brig under guard. We'll leave him there for now, Maddox said. He turned to Valerie. How are you feeling? My head hurts like hell, but otherwise I'm okay. You'll rest, Maddox said. Meta, you're going to stay and guard her. Meta's eyes flashed. You just want me out of the way for whatever you're planning. That's preposterous, Maddox said, although it was the truth. I can't trust anyone else to keep Valerie alive. Galleon will check on you every 15 minutes. I want to find the android impersonating Ted Smalls. He may have already switched identities. Do you believe the possibly hidden android is working with Yen Cho? Galleon asked. I have no idea, Maddox said. Now listen, here's what we're going to do next. Chapter 39
Maddox waited on the bridge as Victory's crew, one after another, went through a thorough medical scan. Armed Marines stood everywhere, watching, waiting for an interior sneak attack. None happened. After four and a half hours of med scanning, a doctor informed the captain that everyone checked out. There was no hidden android aboard ship. Maddox sat in the captain's chair, contemplating the information. It was wrong. There had to be at least one android aboard the starship. How could he have been wrong about that? The captain pressed the intercom button on his armrest. Doctor, he asked, are you absolutely sure you've checked everyone? I haven't checked you out, sir. Or Riker, Meta, or... Just a minute, sir. One of my aides wishes to tell me something. Maddox sat back. Riker, Meta, or him? That was preposterous. He hadn't made love to an android. He knew his Meta. That could only leave Riker. Yet he was certain the sergeant couldn't possibly... Sir, the doctor said over the comm. Yes, Maddox said. There is one other person we didn't check. The mercenary pilot? What's her name? Finley, Maddox whispered. Could he have brought an android onto the starship by mistake? Thank you, doctor, the captain said. I'll take it from here. Maddox clicked off the comm, stood, and beckoned the hollow image. Where's Finley? He quietly asked Galleon. The hollow image's eyelids fluttered, searching. I can't find her, sir. Look everywhere, Maddox said. She can't have gotten off the starship that easily. Galleon accessed the video feeds throughout the ship, but came up empty. He made two sweeps to make sure, but nothing changed. Maddox put his hands behind his back and began to pace. Normally, he did not do so on the bridge. He stopped as he noticed the bridge personnel glancing sidelong at him. When he was visibly nervous, it made the crew nervous. He stopped pacing and bent his head in thought. There had to be a logical explanation for this. If Finley had been an android, or possibly a spacer spy, no, that didn't hold water. Before using her to help him infiltrate onto the asteroid, he checked out Finley himself. She was exactly what she had advertised herself to be, a mercenary pilot with contacts inside Smade's asteroid. Maddox had been quite thorough with her. Yet, Finley had disappeared. Maddox snapped his fingers. He turned to Galleon, noting the hollow image watching him. The captain returned to his chair, sitting on its edge. The androids or spacers had made the switch on Smade's asteroid. The enemy must have recognized him and understood his ploy. Enemy agents had likely killed the real Finley in order to set an imposter in her place. That would mean he had brought an enemy agent aboard ship. It would seem the agent had impersonated Warrant Officer Ted Smalls. Smalls had been a man and he'd already been dead when Valerie had seen his imposter. That meant the imposter is an android, Maddox said. The old legend of the Rull was that they had been an alien race that could impersonate humans. In reality, on Sind II, they had learned that the android nation were the Rull. The androids made exact lookalikes to impersonate chosen people. It would seem this Finley had been able to look like Ted Smalls, a man, but similar in height to the mercenary pilot. Logically, then, Finley hadn't been a spacer, a human, but an android that could switch identities almost at will by replacing his or her face with a replica and modifying their body, possibly with a kit. Maddox's eyes narrowed. He felt as if he had almost solved the puzzle. Finley had turned into Ted Smalls. The android had then become Finley again and gone to the briefing. But... If the android knew her cover had been blown, she would attempt to escape off the starship. She would not make the attempt as Finley, but as 
Maddox snapped his fingers again. He stood and faced Galleon. Check the hangar bay. Check for any unusual activity by any person. In particular, look for someone trying to leave the ship. Galleon's eyes fluttered madly. Well, Maddox asked. I am unable to detect anyone who fits your description, the Adox said. Maddox tapped the fingers of his right hand against his right thigh. He had been so certain. He had been... Yen Cho, he said softly. Galleon, alert the chief of security. Tell him to choose a select team. I only want Marines that he's been in constant contact with since the medical scan. That could be a small list, sir. Do it, Maddox said sternly as he headed for the hatch. Tell him to meet me at Junction 3A. I want him there on the double. They're to bring heavy rifles, including one for me. We're hunting for a highly dangerous android. Galleon disappeared. Maddox hurried to the exit. As soon as he left the bridge, the captain began to sprint. Maddox ran like a cheetah. No one aboard Victory could keep up with him when he ran full tilt. The maddening thing was that soon he was gasping for air, and equally soon, sweat soaked him. When his head started pounding, the captain stopped running and moved at a brisk stride. He had to get those fibers out of his brain. They were interfering with his function as captain. It took him longer to reach Junction 3A than he'd anticipated. The chief of security waited there with three other Marines. Each of them cradled a heavy rifle. The chief, a muscular lieutenant with blonde sideburns and a buzz cut, handed him a combat rifle. Maddox accepted it, automatically checking the chamber. It was loaded. We're hunting for an android, gentlemen. I'll brief you as we head for the brig. Maddox immediately started for the brig. The Marines followed close behind. The android could be impersonating anyone, the captain said, sounding a little short of breath. We've all gone through a medical scan. That means the android must have chosen someone after he or she passed the scan. No one is attempting to leave the ship. The only other logical action is to assassinate Yen Cho. Study everyone. Trust no one. If you see someone aiming a weapon at you, kill him or her out of hand. Is that clear? Yes, sir, the chief said. Men, Maddox asked. They each said yes. All right, Maddox said. Let's do this. Once more, he broke into a sprint. The Marines followed close behind. He would have liked to break away from them and show them his superiority, but he was too damn tired, and his head began to pound again. But there was no way he was going to slow down in front of the Marines. Two decks later, the chief asked with a gasp, Sir, could you slow down a little? Franks is falling behind. Normally, Maddox might have told the Marine to keep up the best he could. In this case, he was silently grateful for the request. He did not say anything as he needed each gasp of air for his screaming lungs. Instead, Maddox dropped back into a brisk walk. Galleon suddenly appeared before him. One of the Marines fired, a bullet passing through the hollow image. He's safe, Maddox said dryly. At least he knew the Marines were on edge and alert, which was how he wanted them. What do you have to report, Galleon? Why did the Marine fire at me? The hollow image asked. You startled him, now report. Sir, Galleon said. A Marine just killed two brig guards. The armed Marine is presently heading for Yen Cho's cell. Maddox cursed, and despite his exhaustion, he lurched into a staggering run. His head pounded. His eyesight clouded and his heart soon hammered. Behind him, he heard the chief pounding as hard as he could to keep up. The two of them broke away from the other Marines. Like two madmen, they raced to the brig, opened the main hatch, staggered past two dead guards, and raced down a corridor for Yen Cho's cell. Maddox passed an open hatch to the side. He glanced there and dove as a bullet grazed his back. The android had obviously staged an ambush. Chief, Maddox gasped. The chief of security hadn't quite been able to keep up with the captain. The chief ran past the opened hatch, and bullets riddled his body. He sprawled dead beside Maddox. The captain raised his heavy rifle, aiming at the hatch. Then he waited as he panted for air. He'd lost another man, and it made him silently furious. Captain, a woman said from inside the chamber. I know you dodged my bullet. They say you move like greased death, but I had to see it to believe it. If you'd moved a fraction slower, 
Maddox's eyes narrowed. He heard the tiniest of clicks from the chamber. He rose from his knee and backed away. Something flew out of the chamber. Maddox sprang like a cat, diving into a side alcove. The grenade exploded, sending metal fragments everywhere. If Maddox had remained at his former spot, the grenade would have killed him. Captain? The android asked. Maddox controlled his breathing as he slowly moved to a kneeling position. He realized the android must have ultra hearing. It could possibly hear his garments rustle. I know you're out there, Captain, the android said. Maddox did not believe that it really knew. It was fishing for clues. I have already slain Yen Cho, the android said. You were too late. Now I'm going to self-destruct. You're never going to know why I was here, until it's too late. Maddox blinked stinging sweat out of his eyes. The other marines stumbled into the hall. He wished they would stay back. He had to flush out the android before it shot up more of his men. Maddox turned back and waved frantically. A second later, Galleon appeared. Maddox put his finger before his lips. The hollow image nodded his understanding. Maddox pointed up the hall and made a stopping motion. Galleon disappeared. Maddox waited. The sound of the approaching marines stopped. That's odd, the android said. Maddox kept waiting. It was an art. In this instance, Maddox wanted payback for the security chief, for the warrant officer, and for the others they would no doubt find dead in the next few days. Maddox almost missed the difference. A barrel of a gun appeared by the hatch, and slowly after that a hand, an arm, and then a brig officer. The android moved slowly, with her head cocked to listen. She did not look Maddox's way, but down the hall where the guards should have appeared. Something must have alerted it. The android turned, saw Maddox, and began to dart back with surprising speed. Maddox's trigger finger proved faster. The heavy stock of his rifle knocked back against his shoulder. A heavy caliber bullet clanged against the android's head. That caused it to pitch against the other side of the hatch and then sprawl back into the room. Maddox was up and moving, the heavy rifle held by his hip. He threw aside any caution, charging toward the hatch. Before he had taken three steps, a staggering explosion let him know that the android had just destroyed itself. Chapter 40 Inside the chamber, the android had splattered its outer bio parts and interior mechanical pieces all over the place. It was a sickening sight. Maddox and the three marines found nothing of interest here. Suicide? asked Galleon. I don't know, Maddox said. Maybe it was set to self-destruct if its brain case became damaged. He took a deeper breath. We don't know this was the only android still aboard ship. We'll keep searching. First, I'd better check on Yen Cho. The captain, the three security marines, and the floating hollow image moved down the corridor past the slain lieutenant, took several turns, and came to an opened hatch. Stay here, Maddox told the marines. Galleon floated beside the captain. The two of them looked inside. A shot-up android lay on the floor. The Finley android hadn't been lying after all. Interesting, Galleon said. Indeed, Maddox said. Who would think that mechanical men would hate each other like this? They almost do seem human. Is that a joke, sir? Galleon asked. Not really, Maddox said. Why did you not want the Marines to see this? I am going to let them see soon. Then I am doubly confused. Maddox regarded the ad hoc hollow image. Can't you figure it out, Galleon? The hollow image's eyelids fluttered. Ah, he said. I believe so. You first wanted to see if the fake Yen Cho looked convincing enough. Bully for you, Maddox said. You're right. It is a good thing you moved Yen Cho earlier as a precaution. Maddox nodded. 
He felt bone weary. The lieutenant's death weighed on him. And now they wouldn't get to interrogate the android impersonating Finley. Maddox doubted there were any more android agents unaccounted for aboard ship. But he wasn't 100% sure. Maybe that was the only victory he could count this time. They had flushed out the enemy agents. It was better they flushed them out now before they acquired the possible builder artifact that must have escaped through the Lommer point. What had the clone of Strand been trying to achieve? The Finley impersonating android might have known. Now, they just had Yen Cho. Maddox absently touched his scalp. It wasn't as bald as when he'd escaped from the asteroid. Bristles of hair had begun to sprout. Could Yen Cho have spacer adaptations in him? I have to get these fibers removed from my brain. What are you thinking, sir? Galleon asked. I need to interrogate Yen Cho. Let's go. I have to talk to Riker about this. What about the Marines, sir? Aren't you going to let them see so they can spread the rumor that our android prisoner is dead? Is that what you think I want them to do? That would be one of your standard operating procedures, sir. I see. Well, then, by all means, let us proceed. Bring them in and let them look. Then caution them about saying anything to anyone. That's a good way to ensure they tell others their great secret. What about you, sir? I have some preparations to make, Maddox said, heading the other way. The preparations amounted to a shower, a nap, some food, and a talk with Riker about the security arrangements. First, we'll stop by medical, Maddox said. To check up on Valerie and Meta? Riker asked. No, for a doctor to evaluate your status. You think I'm an android, sir? You have an iron heart. Riker shook his head. Begging your pardon, sir, but it's the other way around. I'm just an old man doing his job, but I'll gladly take the physical. It took another three quarters of an hour to get everything set up. During that time, Riker passed the exam. He was still fully human. Shortly thereafter, Maddox and Riker stood before a large wall screen. It showed the occupant of a cell, with a cot, a table, several chairs, and other basic amenities inside. Yen Cho sat at the table playing a game of solitaire. He wore the utility garb that a deck mechanic might don. The android sat straight-backed and serenely moved his cards from one location to another. After a time, he picked up the deck, reshuffled, and dealt himself more cards. Maddox cleared his throat, which activated a calm control. In the chamber, Yen Cho set down the cards and looked around, waiting. Are you well? Maddox asked him. Yen Cho looked around again and finally peered up at the camera. It was supposed to be hidden, but obviously it wasn't, not to the android. Captain Maddox, the android said. I've been wondering how long it was going to take you to come around. Wouldn't this be better in person? Better for you, Maddox said but not for me. I've just dealt with an android and she blew up. Yen Cho did not respond. Is our connection faulty? Maddox asked. You know I heard you. Any comments? Not yet, the android said. We believe the other android slipped aboard as a human mercenary. The woman Finley, you mean, the android asked. You knew about her? Of course, Yen Cho said. Once Strand captured you, I made a back check to find out how you came onto the asteroid. Did Strand know about Finley? Captain, please, is that a serious question? But first, let us make certain we're talking about the same person. Strand, the original, the real deal, as you humans used to say, is a captive on the throne world. The last you heard, Maddox amended. True. Has that state of affairs changed? I don't think so, Maddox said. Ah, in any case, we are not dealing with the original Strand. The one at Smade's asteroid is a clone. Was a clone, Maddox said. I see. You killed him? 
I did not, but we believe he is dead. You saw the body? No, but my crew destroyed his ship. Yen Cho bent his head. With a sudden move, he swept the cards from the table. Afterward, he sat perfectly still. Finally, he looked up into the camera and showed his teeth in what might have passed for a smile. Please excuse me. It isn't every day I hear about a barbarian destroying a priceless piece of art. So you have destroyed the ghost ship. That is a loss, Captain. A possibly keen one. Care to tell me why? Maddox asked. Please, sir. It was a builder craft. Yen Cho nodded. I see. It isn't destroyed. You have it, and wish me to outline its various functions. I'm afraid it is quite destroyed. I believe Strand, the clone of Strand, died with it. Sad, Yen Cho said. Well then, what do we have to talk about? Quite a bit, Maddox said. Without further ado, the captain went into a lengthy description about the events regarding the red-haired agent and the android Finley's various exploits as far as they could determine them. Maddox left nothing out. Quite extraordinary, Captain, Yen Cho said. Thank you for the data. My pleasure. Clearly you want something in return. As you have surmised, there were different android factions aboard the asteroid. In this case, I believe there were two. I am not that far removed from the Rising Sun faction, but I am not one of them. Why were you androids on Smades? For the same reason you were, Captain. We wished to apprehend the clone. We didn't know about the clone. Star Watch intelligence must have suspected a clone of Strand would be there. That's true, Maddox said. I suppose you're trying to tell me that you weren't Strand's ally. Please, you must know better by now. Why did you come to Smades? Yen Cho rose and went around the room picking up the fallen cards without a word. Finally, he returned to the table, sat down and shuffled the cards, dealing himself another solitaire hand. Before Yen Cho turned over the first card, he looked up into the camera. May I tell you a secret? If you wish, Maddox said. Strand, the original, is releasing clones. It is not just this one clone. I do not know how the original does this while in captivity. The most obvious method is by prearrangement. This is actually the third or fourth released clone so far. You mean, since the original's internment on the throne world? Correct, Yen Cho said. I killed the first clone on Earth. Do you know what that clone was attempting to do? I do not. Maddox said. The first clone had a sniper rifle. He was trying to line up the Lord High Admiral in his crosshairs. What happened? I shot the clone. Thus, I could not interrogate him. Pity, Maddox said. The second clone arrived at Arcturus III. There, he impersonated the fantastically wealthy CEO of Data Enterprises. He impersonated Mike Darter IV? Maddox asked. Precisely. And? He was in the process of inserting detonation devices in Data Enterprises comm systems. Do you know why? A team of androids captured the second Strand clone. He was wearing an ingenious disguise. Unfortunately, Data security went into high gear after the android kidnapping. They found the real Mike Data IV where the clone had buried him. That enraged security personnel. I do not know how they did it, but Data Security Services found the kidnapper's trail. The androids were in the process of tapping the clone's mind when the security services found them. Everyone died in the ensuing gun battle. How exactly did everyone die? Maddox asked. Once the kidnappers realized there was no escape, they blew up their ship in the warehouse where it was hidden. Did they use atomics? As you surmise, Yen Cho said. Yes. 
the androids killed everyone in the surrounding city as well. Why so bloodthirsty? Maddox asked. Yen Cho shook his head. It had nothing to do with that. Precaution has been the watchword in dealing with Strand and his clones. However, the interrogators did learn one interesting point. It was more in the matter of a hint. Yes? Maddox asked. It seems the clone said that each release has more firepower would be the wrong term. More capacity, more equipment. In any case, it led us to believe that Strand, the original, would arm his later clones with builder equipment. I see. You didn't let me finish. Arm the clones with builder equipment and equipment from the nameless ones. Maddox stared at the android. The cloaked vessel we destroyed had nameless ones, Tech? I doubt that. I'm not tracking you. The next clone will likely have nameless ones, Tech. This isn't the last clone? Oh, I should think not. Maddox put his hands behind his back. He began to think, rethink, and then reassessed his idea. Yan Cho, Maddox said. And he went on to tell the android about the piece of debris that had used the Lommer point to escape victory. The android did not respond. What do you think the piece of debris might be? Maddox asked. Captain, Yen Cho said slowly, I believe you should retrieve that so-called piece of debris. What do you think it is? I don't know. Maddox realized the android was lying. He was fairly certain that Yen Cho had a good idea what the debris was. In fact, the captain would go out on a limb to say that the android was excited, at least as excited as an emotionless mechanical man could be. Well, Maddox finally said, I'm not going after it. I have other business. And frankly, you have a proposal? Yen Cho said. I'm listening. I might be able to let you persuade me to retrieve this piece of debris. You obviously think it is important. However, I absolutely will not make the attempt as long as I have these fibers lodged in my brain. I am not going to leave myself defenseless to more android tricks. Spacer tricks, really, Yen Cho said. Androids have incorporated them from time to time, but I see what you mean. Let me think. The android froze. Maddox stepped up to some controls and pressed a switch, breaking the comm link between them. What do you think? Maddox asked Riker. The sergeant shrugged. Seems like a mess, sir. Strand and his clones are obviously up to something. I can't tell what. Do you know, sir? Maddox shook his head. Killing the Lord High Admiral, Riker said. That was a dirty move. Yes, it is interesting. Maddox said. I wonder if that's the crux of the matter. Sir, Riker asked. A moment, Sergeant. The android wishes to speak. Maddox clicked on the connection. I believe I have a solution, Yen Cho said. You'll need a stasis field emitter. The kind Strand uses? A much smaller emitter, and for a very localized area. The doctor could use the emitter, putting your brain in the stasis field. Afterward, it would likely prove a simple matter to extract the fibers, all of them. Naturally, I could perform the operation, thank you, but no, Maddox said. I perfectly understand. How long would it take you to construct such an emitter? A day or two, if I had your full cooperation, the android said. Let me ponder the idea. Until then, is there anything you wish to add? Speed is likely critical if we're to retrieve this piece of debris. Tell me, do the androids fear Strand's ultimate objective? We don't know it yet. But we do fear Strand's reckless use of builder and nameless one's technology for such primitive goals as the selfish Methuselah man seeks. I see, Maddox said. Until we speak later, then. Yes, Captain. I hope you don't take too long to see the need for desperate action 
and haste. Maddox clicked off the connection. You're not serious about letting him make this emitter? Riker asked. As to that, Sergeant, Maddox said, I don't know. First, I'd like to speak with Andros about the project. Chapter 41 Maddox didn't need long to decide. He trusted the android in playing honest about the stasis field emitter and removing the fibers in his mind. Obviously, Yen Cho wanted him to go after the so-called piece of debris. In order for that to happen, Maddox had to be well enough to travel. As the android and Andros Crank built the emitter under the watchful eyes of security marines, victory decelerated as it approached the Lammer point. The starship had come the long way by traveling all three billion kilometers one kilometer at a time. The starship had almost come to a complete stop near the entry point while the two worked on the emitter's finishing touches. On the bridge, Valerie seemed anxious. She left her station to stand behind Maddox in the command chair. This is taking too long, she said softly. Maddox glanced back at her. Possibly, he said. That piece of debris planned to go through the Lommer point. The more I think about it, the more certain I am that that's the case. That means the longer we wait here, the greater chance it has of reaching a rendezvous point over there. Possibly, Maddox said again. Valerie eyed him and seemed as if she might throw up her hands, but finally nodded and returned to her station. Maddox contemplated the main screen, studying the Lommer point. It was invisible to the naked eye, but not to their Lommer sensors. The point swirled in the blackness of space, waiting for someone to give the signal and use the linkage between star systems. Maddox tapped his chin and pressed together index fingers. He hated the idea of anyone controlling his thoughts or his actions. The fibers had to go. But it was more than that. He wasn't certain that he could safely make the jump with the fibers in place. Strand hated him. Surely the clone had hated him as well. Maybe the fibers would act as a sort of time bomb. If he went through a Lommer point, that might activate them somehow and kill him. Maybe he should have explained that to Valerie. But Maddox disliked having to explain his actions. She was part of the crew. She should obey his orders and trust him. Several hours later, Andros reported that the emitter was finished. He would like to make a few tests before they tried it on Maddox, though. No, the captain said. We don't have time for that. On the screen, Andros looked as if he wanted to make a pithy statement. We're on a tight schedule, Chief Technician. We shall proceed. Yes, sir, Andros said. Despite that, it took another four hours to prepare for the surgery. Finally, beginning to feel anxious himself, Maddox reported to medical. Dr. Lister's premier assistant would perform the surgery. Lister was no longer in critical condition, but she wasn't 100% well yet. Furthermore, Maddox did not trust her to operate on him after what he'd done to her. His suspicious nature naturally assumed she would want to get back at him any way she could. That isn't how she thinks, Meta told him in the waiting room. His wife had asked about his decision, and he told her his reasoning. I've read her psych profile, Meta added. Dr. Lister is a professional. Forget it, the captain said, interrupting. Lister's assistant is performing the operation, and that's final. Husband, that's final. Maddox repeated. I won't change my mind on any of this, not for anyone. Meta stamped her right foot. She folded her arms and pouted. Finally, she pestered him by beginning the argument anew. Listen, husband, if you say any more, Maddox said, I'm going to send for security and have them confine you to quarters. You wouldn't dare, she said. Maddox lifted an eyebrow. Meta sighed and finally relented. She undoubtedly knew that he would dare. Andros was in the operating theater with the emitter. Marines had already escorted Yen Cho to his cell. The assistant appeared in the waiting room and asked Maddox if he wouldn't like Dr. Lister to watch and advise him. 
The operation is your responsibility alone, Maddox said testily. The assistant was a gangly man with graying hair on the sides. I feel that I should inform you again, sir, that I'm unqualified for... I don't want to hear any more, Maddox said, interrupting. Let us proceed. The man paled, but nodded. He indicated the hatch. Maddox preceded him, and the prep team took over. Maddox soon lay on the table. Andros positioned the cart that held the emitter, so the unit aimed at the captain's head. The assistant nodded. Andrews threw a switch and activated the stasis field. At that point, Maddox faded from consciousness. He did not dream. He wasn't aware of anything. Unknown to Maddox, the gangly assistant took longer than seemed necessary to Andros and the surgery team. The man searched for every fiber. Galleon appeared from time to time, telling him about yet another fiber he'd overlooked. Finally, the assistant's instruments could not locate another fiber. Galleon did a scan and declared Maddox free from them. The assistant placed the skull bone back into place and fused it. Exhausted after three hours of tedious work, he signaled Andros Crank. The Kaikaus chief technician turned off the stasis field emitter. Everyone in the chamber looked at Maddox on the operating table. To their surprise, the captain opened his eyes. Can you hear me? The assistant asked. Quite well, yes, Maddox said. The assistant glanced at a nurse before addressing the captain. Can you stand, do you think? Maddox sat up. A moment later, he swung his feet off the table, sat another minute, and then stood, without trouble. At that point, the assistant urged him to lie back down and wait a bit before resuming active duty. By all appearances, however, the surgery seemed to have been a perfect success. Chapter 42 Two hours after the fibers had been removed, Maddox was back on the bridge. He stood before the main screen. He couldn't help touching his bristly skull one more time. The fibers were gone. He felt incredible relief. What was wrong with Strand and his clones that they had to control everyone? What did that say about the Methuselah man? Plenty. He needed to go over the intelligence department's psych profile again and study that part. It might give him a clue as to the clone's ultimate motivation. We're ready to enter the Lommer point, sir, Valerie said from her station. Maddox was silent. Had the assistant gotten every fiber from his mind? Sir? Valerie asked. Maddox inhaled sharply, turned, and moved to his command chair. He sat, leaned back, and gave the command to proceed. The bridge personnel began the process. The Lommer device in victory sent the signals. The Lommer point activated and waited for whatever material object entered its radius. This starship victory began to do as the antimatter engines accelerated the huge vessel. Helm gave the countdown. The mighty warship entered the Lommer point. In that instant, a Lommer link appeared connecting the Lommer point in the Tristano system to the one in the Gideon system. Within a microsecond, the starship zipped 9.4 light years, popping out of the swirling Lommer point into the Gideon system. Not so very long ago, everyone and the computers would have experienced jump lag. That was no longer the case. A few people felt faint, but that was it. Maddox sat utterly still, trying to determine how he felt. He grinned to himself. He felt good. A tiny bit sluggish, but that was how he usually felt after making a jump. Ship has made the transfer, Valerie reported. We're in the Gideon system, sir. Maddox nodded. What are the system specifics? He asked. Valerie checked her panel. The star is G-class and possesses two inner terrestrial planets. We've come out near the second of those planets, sir. The lieutenant changed the view on the main screen. Maddox looked upon a dry world like Mars, only three times as big as the red planet. 
Earth norms? He asked. Negative, sir, she said. The air is contaminated by our standards. According to the patrol survey from 140 years ago, the planet is uninhabited by any indigenous life. There don't appear to be any colonization efforts. Oh, this is interesting. Maddox turned his chair so he could see her. Valerie looked up. It appears there are ancient ruins on the planet. According to this, she began reading again. Sir, she said, looking up sharply. Strand once led an archaeological team onto the planet. A Star Watch team? Maddox asked. No, a Mercer Corporation survey team. When was that? If this is right, 236 years ago. Maddox pressed his lips together as he thought about that. The Mercer Corporation appears to have made a habit of searching for ancient alien ruins, Valerie said as she read more. The corporation went defunct 111 years ago. Does the report say if they found anything of use down there? Valerie shook her head. The Mercer survey analysis is blank, sir. Figures, Keith mumbled from helm control. Any sign of space debris? Maddox asked. Not so far, Valerie said. Keep scanning. Launch probes if you need to, Maddox stood. You're not staying? Valerie asked. You have the bridge, Lieutenant. I haven't finished my report yet concerning the system. Maddox waved that aside. Scan for space debris. Search for anything with any kind of power. We're looking for a builder artifact, a small one is my guess. What kind of artifact? Valerie asked. Exactly, Maddox said. That's what I want to find out. The hatch to Yen Cho's cell opened. Maddox stepped into the small quarters. The android sat facing him, making eye contact after putting another card onto the table. Riker came through next. The sergeant held a heavy caliber gun aimed at Yen Cho. Pull up a chair, Captain, the android said. I presume you wish to leave your sergeant near the hatch so I can't make any sudden lunges and disarm him. A marine outside the cell closed the heavy hatch. Is it locked? Yen Cho asked conversationally. Maddox took two chairs from the table but did not sit there. Instead, he drew the chairs to him, setting the first near the bulkhead containing the hatch. Maddox sat and tilted the chair back until the back touched the bulkhead. With his feet, he turned the other chair so its backrest wasn't in the way of his line of sight to Yen Cho. Maddox used the second chair as a footrest, also making it easier to lean back as he did. Comfortable? asked Yen Cho. Maddox glanced at Riker. The sergeant continued to aim the outsized pistol at the android. Riker used his bionic arm and could thus keep the weapon steady for hours. It's time to talk, Maddox said. Yen Cho set down the cards in his hands. You've found the debris? That's one of the things I want to talk about. You were going to say something else just now instead of debris. It will help us find it if I know what the debris is exactly. Yen Cho spread out his hands to indicate he did not have any specifics. Perhaps that's true, Maddox said. Yet, I believe it's more accurate to say that you're only 97% sure what we'll find. You are astute as always, Captain. I am hoping you find a robot. A particular kind of robot, right? Builder constructed, of course. Can you be more precise? Yes, a guardian builder robot, Yen Cho said softly. What exactly is that? A protector. Let's play 20 questions then, Maddox said. Here's number four. Why are you so interested in this guardian robot? Knowledge, Yen Cho said. The robot could hold interesting knowledge. For instance, it could tell us more about the builders. You've talked to a builder before. You must realize they are secretive to a fault. But this is more to the issue. If the original strand has more hideaways that will release yet more of his clones. One of them will undoubtedly use stolen technology from the nameless ones. 
I suspect we will need the Guardian robot to help us defeat that highly suspect tech. Are you suggesting that the Strand clone will have a neutronium-hulled destroyer? I seriously doubt that. What then? Maddox asked. I believe the robot would know, as it has spent time with the Strand clone, among other things. Knowing would undoubtedly help us capture the next clone before it does something incredibly destructive. Can you be more precise? I dearly wish I could, Yen Shou said. I simply do not have enough facts yet, but I am quite sure about my guesses. And you think that the Rull faction of androids also wants this robot? Oh yes, I am quite sure of that. Do they want the robot in order to help stop the next Strand clones? Possibly. Maddox lifted his feet off the chair as he let the one he was sitting on thump all four legs onto the floor. That implies the Rull want the robot for something else. What else, Yen Cho? Once more, the android spread out his hands in a non-committal gesture. I think you're lying about not knowing their ultimate goal, Maddox said. I speak the truth. But this talk is possibly a waste of time. We need to find the robot if it exists. We need to find it as soon as possible. Why did the presumed guardian robot choose the Gideon system? For the simplest of reasons, the android said. This was the nearest llama point. It wanted to escape from your starship. That's not the only reason. Yen Cho stared at Maddox for several seconds. It appears that you are aware of Gideon too. Yes, Maddox said. I know that Strand was part of the Mercer Corporation excavation team 236 years ago. I was not aware that Starwatch had such detailed records. Now you are. Captain, Yen Cho said in a reproving voice. I know what you are attempting to do. You want to know what Strand searched for down there. I happen to know that Strand erased all information regarding the dig. Starwatch might know he came here, but it has no idea what he sought to find, or if he found it. And you do? Oh yes, Yen Cho said. I'm waiting to hear it. And you can continue to wait. Gideon too has no bearing on our present situation. The robot, if it exists, would not have landed on the planet. I doubt it would have the capacity to do so. Maddox studied the android. After several seconds, he lurched to his feet and gave Yen Cho a nod. Still facing the android, Maddox reached behind him and tapped on the hatch. It unlocked and opened. Go ahead, Maddox told Riker. The sergeant retreated from the chamber. I'm telling you the truth, Yen Cho said. The robot is drifting in space somewhere. I would like to know its destination as much as you would. Do not waste time searching the planet. I won't, Maddox said. Then he stepped backward through the hatch and waited until the Marine closed it with a snick. In the hall, Riker was holstering his big gun. Maddox tapped his chin thoughtfully. Then he whirled around and stalked away at a brisk pace. Chapter 43 Less than an hour later, Maddox sat beside Keith as the ace piloted an armored shuttle through Gideon II's upper atmosphere. The medical treatment had healed his earlier burns. Below, the dusty planet seemed the same as ever. In the distance, wispy clouds appeared far below them. There are traces of water vapor, Maddox said, studying his sensor screen. Above them, in orbit, Victory launched more probes. The probes sped in all directions as they scanned relentlessly, searching for a small piece of debris. Yet space was vast compared to the particle of substance they were trying to find. If the builder robot, if it was a robot, used a cloaking device, it might be even harder to find than anticipated. Maddox knew it could be worse than that. If Yen Cho was correct about the debris being a robot, the construct could have had a waiting vessel somewhere in the Gideon system. 
So far, Valerie hadn't spotted any power source in nearby space. Neither Keith nor Galleon back on Victory had spotted any power source on the planet. Maddox was certain that Yen Cho had lied about the planet. If no one could find any energy traces anywhere, there were two possibilities. A cloaking device or the robot landing somewhere hidden on the planet. If the robot hadn't kept a private spaceship waiting in orbit, might it have something down here? That was what Maddox intended on discovering. Of course, if the robot had something waiting down here, that something could be dangerous, the more so as they attempted to uncover its existence. Keith piloted while Riker and four Marines waited in back. All five of them wore exoskeleton combat suits. Maddox would don such a suit when the time came. Keith would remain aboard while staying aloft, the shuttle armed with 30 millimeter cannons and several antimatter missiles. The flight down proved uneventful. They passed the wispy clouds and soon descended upon a vast worldwide desert of shifting red sand. There were a few rounded mountain ranges here and there, their erosion indicating great age. Winds about 53 clicks per hour, Keith said. Nothing to write home about, depending on the average size of the grains of sand. Maddox understood. Too fine, and the grains would inevitably find their way into the combat armor joints. That could prove tactically important. Slight change in plans, the captain said. We're going to land before you go airborne again. I want to test the size of the grains, see what we're up against. Roger that, Keith said. Soon the shuttle swept several hundred kilometers above a shifting desert that made Earth's Sahara seem puny in comparison. Mountains in the distance, Keith said. Maddox nodded. That was their destination. They were heading to the planetary coordinates of Strand's original excavation. That was all the information that remained of the historical survey, where they had done the digging. The mountains appeared as a smudge on the horizon. They quickly grew to rounded humps on a desert world of sand. Whoa, Keith said. I don't get it. We didn't see that on the ship's scopes. It's like that suddenly appeared. Maddox looked out a window in amazement. The shuttle flew over a vast, dug-up area abutting the lowest mountain slopes. The circumference and depth weren't the only incredible part. Inside the huge dig were monumental pyramids. Keith was right. This hadn't been in the briefing. I'm picking up something, the pilot said. I'd call it a charged particle field. It's over the pet. What's powering the field? Maddox asked. Keith shook his head. I'm not getting any readings on that. How would that have blocked Victory's telescopes from seeing the dig? It shouldn't have, Keith said. This doesn't make any sense, Captain. What's going on? A surge of excitement filled Maddox. He'd guessed right. The android had been lying about the planet. Keith whistled as he studied a sensor. Listen to this. Those pyramids are five times the size of the Gaza pyramid in Egypt. They're massive. Maddox started counting pyramids. He stopped at 37, having counted about a quarter of them. Wonder what's in them, Keith said. I wonder who built them, Maddox countered. Should we have brought the android along? On no account, Maddox said. Land, several hundred kilometers from the edge. Land on a mountain slope, too, he added. We'll keep off the sand if we can help it. Roger that, Keith said softly. A few minutes later, the shuttle touched down softly onto a level area of rocky slope. Maddox nodded in appreciation of the ace's piloting skill. He unbuckled and went back, climbing into two tons of space marine combat armor. Once ready, he joined Riker and the others. Each of them had a heavy auto cannon attached to a suit arm, smart missile packs, and a complex detection gear. Each suit was black matted and made the wearer seem like an overgrown mechanical gorilla. A cargo hatch opened and a metal ramp extended to the rocky ground. Maddox led the way, clomping down the ramp. He clanked to the nearest area of sand and ran an analyzer over it. Grains were super fine. They would prove troublesome to the suits in no time. 
Maddox summoned the Marine sub-lieutenant Gordon Vesper. The Marine studied the finding. I'm not a suit tech, sir, sub-lieutenant Vesper said, but these grains will start giving us trouble within the hour. We can last longer if there's no winds and less in a sandstorm. That was worse than Maddox had expected, and it gave him greater appreciation for the Mercer Corporation feat over 236 years ago. Take her up, he radioed Keith. The ramp pulled back, the hatch shut, and the engines powered up. The shuttle lifted gently and continued to climb on its gravity dampeners. Count on Keith to think of the best way to launch. The ace hadn't given them a swirling dust of cloud and had thus extended their possible length of stay. Keep in close touch, Maddox told Keith, and keep in constant contact with Victory. If you lose contact with Victory, you're to pick us up right away. Roger that, Keith said through Maddox's headphones. Maddox watched the shuttle rise higher. Winds are picking up, sir, the sub-lieutenant said over the short wave. Let's go, Maddox told him and the others. Let's see what the Mercer Corporation found down there. Maddox led Riker and the Space Marines between the gigantic pyramids. They were constructed out of colossal red granite blocks, many tons each. Some of the pyramids were bigger than others. All were smooth, without apparent sandblasted damage from the winds. None had any visible entrance. Anything? Maddox asked the others over the short wave. There's nothing here, sir, Riker said. The pyramids appear to be solid stone through and through. That's what I'm reading too, Maddox said. Yet he had his doubts about that. Something seemed off and he couldn't quite place it. Why would aliens build solid stone pyramids? Riker asked. We don't know that's the case, Maddox replied. Just that these so far appear to be solid. You think our scanners are off? The sergeant asked. Maddox didn't reply, but that was something to think about. The two-ton combat suits continued to clomp between the pyramids, searching for answers or possible clues. You know what I find strange, sir? Sub-Lieutenant Vesper asked ten minutes later. There's no sand down here. In his combat suit, Maddox halted. The servo motors whined as he bent onto one knee. He studied the ground, the rock. There wasn't a grain of sand on it. He should have seen it right away. The charged particle shield over the dig should have led him in that direction. Sometimes it's harder to see what isn't there than what is there, he reminded himself. Check your suits, Maddox radioed. Tell me if any of them have any sand in the joints. Riker and the Marines checked and reported in. They each had a few grains, no more likely picked up before they'd entered the giant dig. I'm beginning to think the Mercer Corporation never dug this hole, Maddox told Riker. They wouldn't have possessed the tech to make a charged particle shield that didn't seem to have a power source and that lasted so long. It's clear the shield has kept out the sand all these years. Otherwise, during the last 236 years, the wind would have dumped enough sand to bury this place, and the tops of the pyramids would have eroded like the mountaintops. Say, that's right, Riker said. Recheck your scanners, Maddox told the others. There has to be some form of energy doing this. These things can't be solid stone. The two-ton suits went back to back with each other, so one of them scanned outward in all directions. Each Marine's auto cannon was primed for firing. At the same time, each Marine used the sensors attached to the suits. Nothing new, sir, Riker soon said. That doesn't make sense, Maddox said. What was he missing? Was this why Yen Cho had told him to forget about the planet? Or was it more subtle than that? Had Yen Cho told him to forget about the planet in the same way Maddox had told Riker to tell the Marines earlier not to tell anyone about the shot-up android? In other words, had Yen Cho known him so well that the android knew that saying what it had would goad Maddox to come down here? Sir. A Marine said. I'm getting a strange reading. Send it to me, Maddox said. On his HUD visor, Maddox studied the reading. A slight energy trace. I'd say that looks like leakage of some kind, Riker said over the shortwave. Leakage from what? 
Even as Maddox asked that, he believed he understood. That must be leakage from a stealth suit. Somebody must be trying to sneak up on them. Chapter 44 At that moment, Maddox had one of his hunches. Keith, he said over the comm. There was no answer. Maddox swore, looked up, and used his HUD radar. There, he spotted the shuttle. It was high up there, higher than he thought Keith should have gone. Maybe the wind had picked up and was kicking sand up into the air. Yes, Maddox detected a haze of fine sand particles between the giant hole and the shuttle. The charged particle shield must keep the sand out, repelling the fine grains. Could sand that spread across the charged particle shield have blocked Victory's scopes earlier? Maybe the particles blocked his comm connection, too. Maddox had a fix and couldn't talk to the ace. He activated a laser link and beamed the comm laser up at the shuttle. Keith, he said again. Sir, the ace asked. This is a laser link and I can hardly hear you. What's going on? Listen, give us six minutes. Come low after that and place an antimatter missile in the exact center of the dig. But sir, do it, lieutenant. Our lives may depend on it. Maddox out. The captain shut off the laser link. He regarded his combat team. He may have just sentenced them to death. But he was certain the Rull androids in stealth suits attempted to capture them. On no account was he going to let that happen. He also suspected that the enemy had enough numbers to overpower the small group. See that pyramid? Maddox said, pointing at the nearest one. The others nodded. Use your autocannons and start blasting granite. After that, grab your picks and begin hammering and prying rock free. We're building ourselves a bomb shelter. We have less than six minutes until an antimatter missile strikes. Sir, Riker said, that's suicide. No, it's our only chance to remain free agents. Now go to work. Maddox didn't wait for questions or to see if the others understood him. Instead, he trained his autocannon on the nearest pyramid and began hammering it with shells in timed sequences. Granite blasted apart. Some of the stone shards struck his suit but did no damage. A moment later, the others started doing likewise. They blasted into the ancient pyramid. Stop firing, stop firing, Maddox ordered. Grab your picks and work like madmen. He attacked the autocannon-created hole and used the full power of the combat suit. For the next four minutes, Maddox and the others caused rock to explode apart under their powerful blows. At five minutes and 29 seconds, Maddox burst into a chamber. He'd suspected something like this, or maybe it had been more like a wild hope. There must have been something in the red granite that had blocked their suit sensors. Given everything else, that confirmed for him that this was builder-related. He clicked on a helmet lamp and beckoned the others to him. For the next 33 seconds, the two-ton suits clanked at speed down a corridor until they reached a pit. Without hesitation, Maddox leaped. The others followed him. For several sickening seconds, Maddox's suit fell. It struck with force and caused the servo motors to whine with complaint as the shock absorbers saved his frail flesh and blood body from the impact. The captain curled himself and his suit into a fetal ball, ordering the others to follow his example. As the last Marine curled tight, Keith's antimatter missile hit the bottom floor of the giant dig and detonated, sending a powerful antimatter blast in all directions. The suits were deep enough that the strange red granite absorbed and blocked the worst of the heat, blast, and radiation. Besides, each of them had already swallowed an anti-radiation tablet, and their combat armor was better than any bio or nuclear hazard suit. Riker unfolded from his fetal position and slid beside the captain. He clanked his helmet against Maddox's helmet. In a voice sounding tinny to the captain, Riker asked, What was that all about, sir? Why did you try to kill all of us? Maddox clicked off his shortwave. It was nothing of the kind, Sergeant. I suspected stealth androids were about to attack us. Sir? In a few terse sentences, Maddox explained his idea of Yen Cho having tricked them down here, with the leakage energy reading he had put two and two together. 
You don't like anyone telling you what you shouldn't do, do you, sir? Enough of your cheek, Sergeant. We have to get out of here as soon as possible. I don't understand. You took care of the problem. If I'm right about Rull androids, they must have a ship or a hidden base near here. We took out a stealth attack, but maybe they have heavier hardware. I think they planned to kidnap us for nefarious ends. I'm sick of being someone's prisoner. Once per mission is quite enough for me. That antimatter strike must have leveled plenty of pyramids. That's archaeological mayhem, sir. I'm not Ludendorff, Maddox said. I'm concerned with the living more than the past's relics, but enough about that. We've waited long enough. It's time to dig our way to the surface and contact Keith. I want to get off the planet before the androids send reinforcements or try to attack victory. Chapter 45 with Victory's sensors, Galleon scanned the planet's surface. The ad hoc hollow image had just received word of the captain's unbelievable order. He used the starship's best scope to study the incredible excavation site. This was odd. The site wasn't visible. All he saw was sand. Galleon tried a different sensor. How interesting. There was a type of force field, a charged particle shield. He would assume the charged particles radiated sand from, ah, yes, sand cascaded down a seeming dome and spewed from repellers at the bottom edges. If he hadn't known about the dig, the instruments would have assumed this was a natural phenomenon. Sand continued to blow onto the field and slide down. Ordinary scopes simply saw sand and could not detect the hole underneath the charged particle dome. Galleon used a more powerful sensor, piercing the covering as he studied the antimatter-blasted pyramids. By the discoloration of the red granite rock, he could see the new blast damage. The pyramids had been in almost pristine condition before this. No longer. It is good Professor Ludendorff is not here, Galleon said to himself. He would be furious at the archaeological damage. Keith piloted the shuttle down toward the excavation site. Lieutenant, Galleon said via comm. I'm busy, Keith said. Do not attempt to directly land in the excavation site. The charged particle shield might interfere with your flight computer. Are you sure about that? Keith asked. Quite sure, Galleon said. I'll radio the captain. You can speak to him directly. Galleon asked. Not at the moment. How did you know someone was jamming us? That is not the case, Galleon said. It is the charged particles interfering with the comm system. The captain messaged me earlier. Galleon thought about that. Did he use a laser link? You're a smart guy, Galleon. That's right. Now look, I'm real busy. Is there anything else? Keep on the lookout for intruders. The captain's missile strike order implies an outer threat. Roger that, Keith said. Out. Galleon continued to watch the progress on the scope. The shuttle landed beside the dig. Time passed. Too much time in the hollow image's estimation. Finally, space marine suits climbed out of the excavation hole and hurried to the shuttle. This was the danger point. But nothing unpleasant happened. The two-ton suits boarded the shuttle, and the shuttle lifted off, heading for victory in its orbit upstairs. What happened to the enemy? Why are they letting the shuttle get away so easily? Galleon might have pondered longer. Instead, he sensed commotion on the bridge. In an instant, the hollow image disappeared from the viewing port and appeared on the bridge. What has happened, Valerie? Galleon asked. The lieutenant sat forward in the command chair. She had shiny eyes and a triumphant smile. She turned to him. I found it, Valerie declared. The missing space debris, Galleon asked. The robot, a builder robot by the reports, she said. On the main screen, Galleon saw the beamed image of what probe 10D had scanned. It showed an artillery shell-shaped piece of metal hurtling toward a rogue moon. As he watched, the object shimmered, almost disappeared, and then appeared whole again 
as the probe used a different sensor. Is that image correct? Galleon asked. The robot is modulating its stealth mode, Valerie said with appreciation in her voice. It's most impressive. Why does it not use all modes at the same time? Galleon said. It might have remained hidden that way. Best that I can reason it, Valerie said, is that it lacks the power to do so. That is one possibility. Valerie's smile lost some of its power. What's the other possibility? That it wants to be found, but not easily, Galleon said. Why would it want that? I believe that is the question Captain Maddox is going to ask. Yes, she said. I believe you're right. Chapter 46 Nearly two hours later, Maddox appeared on the bridge. He had gone through anti-radiation treatment, taken another nap, been taking too many of them lately, but his body was still healing and demanded all the sleep he would give it. Now Maddox listened to Valerie's report concerning the robot. The starship was already accelerating toward the object. At its present velocity, the robot was still several days away from reaching the rogue moon. Tell me more about that moon, Maddox said. It appears to have blown loose from Gideon II sometime in the past, Valerie said. The moon has an erratic orbit around the star and approaches the second planet far too closely at times. That was the first clue regarding its loosening. What was the other clue? Maddox asked. Valerie pointed at a warrant officer. He tapped his console. On the main screen, the dark moon appeared. It was a close-up that zoomed closer still to reveal a batch of giant pyramids. More of them, Maddox said. Galleon, did you analyze the blast area on Gideon II? Yes, Galleon said. I found trace elements that suggest you were correct in your assumption. You found the remains of stealth androids? Not exactly, Galleon said. The antimatter blast was intense. It caused massive damage to the pyramids and obliterated your possible enemy. I did detect trace elements that could have been androids. The data is not conclusive, however. I would require a more detailed scan. You took a huge risk with the antimatter missile, Valerie told the captain. Maddox shrugged. It had worked. That was enough for him. What is the estimated time to our reaching the robot? He asked Valerie. Two hours and 43 minutes, she said. That gives me enough time to talk to Yen Cho again, Maddox said. Has the robot made any attempt to contact us? None, Valerie said. Is the robot still using its stealth modes? No. The robot knows we know it's there? It's acting that way, Valerie said. Anything else on the moon? Asked Maddox. There is... Energy leakage. I don't know what it is yet, but I have my suspicions. Show me this leakage, Maddox said. Valerie indicated a control panel to the side. Maddox went there and studied it. The leakage could have come from anything. Life support, idle beam weaponry, waiting missiles. One thing bothered Maddox about the reading. It was the same as the Marine had discovered while they were walking among the pyramids on Gideon II. Did that mean stealth androids waited on the rogue moon? Maddox doubted it. Yet, that might mean he'd been wrong about stealth androids on Gideon too. What's the robot's distance to the rogue moon? Maddox asked. Half a million kilometers, Valerie said. The robot is moving slowly, Maddox said. That depends on your reference point, she said. Keep me posted on any new developments, even if I'm in the middle of interrogating the android. Valerie nodded. With that, Maddox exited the bridge. This time, the captain took Meta with him instead of Riker. The sergeant was tired out from the mission onto the surface. He had become ill from the radiation treatments and slept fitfully in sickbay. The Marines weren't quite as badly off, but they hadn't shaken off the treatments as fast as Maddox had. Yen Cho was playing solitaire just like before. He looked up as the hatch opened. He noted Meta with a big gun pointed at him. He smiled at her. She did not smile back. I see, the android said. 
He put his cards down and sat back in his chair. This time, Maddox took only one chair. He sat normally. He realized he wasn't feeling all that well. Maybe the anti-radiation treatment was starting to get to him, too. Maybe the after-effects of the antimatter blast had something to do with it as well. Surprised to see me? Maddox asked. I am, Yen Cho admitted. You visited less than twelve hours ago. I hadn't expected you back. That isn't what I meant, Maddox said dryly, interrupting. Then I am at a loss as to your meaning. Are you indeed? Please, Captain, let us forgo twenty questions as you said last time. What should surprise me about your visit? Maddox smiled blandly. I went down to the planet. Yen Cho's easy manner altered as the android put both hands on the table as if to steady himself. I warned you not to go there. So it seemed. Yen Cho cocked his head. He cocked it the other way. I do not perceive your meaning. You baited him, Meta said. Yen Cho blinked twice. I see, he said. You believe that I think you are a child. That is quite amusing, Captain. But let me put you at ease. I consider you the wiliest opponent I have ever faced in my long existence. Whatever you really believe about me, Maddox said. You clearly think I'm conceited. But of course you are. Ask your woman if she thinks that. We all know you are conceited, Captain. What makes it interesting is that you are not a conceited ass like so many of your kind are. Watch your mouth, Meta warned. Did that upset you, dear lady? Do you hide the truth about your husband from yourself? Husband, Meta said. Would you allow me to have the android put in a mechanical press? I'll take off both of his arms. If that doesn't tame his tongue, we'll remove his legs as well. Yen Cho nodded. One barbarian mated to another. You make a perfect couple, Captain. I congratulate you on your choice of mate. I went down to the planet, Maddox said crisply. I landed with several marines and walked among the pyramids. I discovered the lack of sand on the ground due to the charged particle shield surrounding the excavation site. While poking around, I also discovered stealth androids attempting a kidnapping. I know nothing about that. I eliminated the androids, but was unable to capture any. Let me apologize for any combat losses, Captain. No need, Maddox said, as there were none. None? I cannot believe that. You said hidden androids attacked you. Before they could launch their assault, my team dug into a pyramid and found a deep hole. I ordered an antimatter strike into the dig. The blast killed the stealth androids. What? Yen Cho said. You used an antimatter device against the pyramids? You are indeed a barbarian, Captain. You destroy what you cannot understand. Maddox turned to Meta. I suspect androids built the pyramids. If not, the androids used them for something. That means I'm going to destroy the pyramids on the rogue moon. Yen Cho rose to his feet. Meta's heavy gun tracked him as she became tense. Are you tired of living? asked Maddox. Slowly, Yen Cho resumed his seat and shook his head. You are correct in one assumption, but quite wrong in the other. Androids did not build the pyramids. Who then? Who else? Yen Cho said. The builders. The pyramids are artifacts? Yen Cho looked away before regarding Maddox again. They are not technologically powerful artifacts, but they are powerful symbols. To us. To androids in general or to your particular android faction. To all of us, Yen Cho said. We are the constructs. The Gideon system has meaning for androids. You have desecrated one of our holy sites. No, Maddox said. You're not alive. In a real sense, your machines, I assure you that we are quite alive.
Yan Chou said. We are different from you, but we are living. Do humans have souls, Captain? I can't see them. I can't smell them. How then can you prove the existence of souls? Easily, Maddox said. Humans have written holy books or holy words, the Bible, the Koran, the Talmud, and others. In their time, people consider the books holy, set apart. They pertain to God, or the gods, in some cases, which pertain to souls. Why do humans have this yearning to seek spiritual meaning? The answer is easy. It scratches an itch in the human psyche, in the human soul. That leads me to the opposite conclusion for you. Have androids ever written holy books? I am not aware of any, Yen Cho said. Of course you aren't, Maddox said. Because mechanical men lack souls. You lack our human itch to fill a spiritual void in each of us. We do have our holy sights, though. I have my doubts regarding that, Maddox said. I am tempted to believe the pyramids have an actual function for you androids. What function do the pyramids provide for you? They mark the beginning of our creators, Yan Cho said. Maddox blanched. Gideon II is the original home world of the builders? As to that, I cannot say, Yan Cho replied. That is because I do not know. The builders first devised us human-shaped androids on Gideon II. That I do know. Are you telling me there are workshops under the pyramids? If I say more, Yan Cho said, I will have to kill you. Maddox glanced at Meta before regarding the android. He thought about Yen Cho's revelation. He thought about the pyramids, the charged particle shield over the excavation site. He considered the supposed builder guardian robot using the Lommer point to reach this star system. As Maddox considered these things, he drummed his fingers on his right knee. We found the guardian robot, he told Yen Cho. And? No more, Maddox said. He stood and nodded to Meta. She kept her gun trained on the android as she knocked on the hatch with her other hand. It unlatched and opened. Two Marines with heavy combat rifles stood there, aiming them at Yen Cho. Captain, Yen Cho said. This is quite unfair. You cannot tell me about the robot and simply depart. While I agree that I might not have a soul, I have curiosity. I would like to know what you plan to do next. Is there anything you care to tell me? Maddox asked. You mean pertaining to the robot? Maddox did not answer. The android seemed undecided. I doubt the robot itself is dangerous. It will have a great fund of knowledge, naturally. Or do you mean this supposed stealth android assault? Captain, you are not going to like this. I doubt there was any such assault. You may have detected something, but it was not androids bent on kidnapping you. What did we detect then? I cannot say. Cannot or won't? Will not, Yen Cho said. The site is holy to androids. I cannot reveal why. I am saddened by your wanton destruction. Perhaps you are more human than new man. You destroy what you do not understand, like a human would. There was a tightening to Maddox's eyes. He didn't care for the remark. Could he have been wrong about an android stealth assault? Had his hunch been false? The possibility existed. Maybe he had overreacted because he was still jumpy due to the clone's attempt to wire his mind. Through force of will, Maddox pushed that aside. The pyramids weren't as important as the robot. What had Yen Cho said? The robot wasn't dangerous? Do you think the clone of Strand would agree with your assessment regarding the robot's non-deadly nature? I doubt so, Yen Cho said. The robot has a task, doesn't it? I. I do not know. Yen Cho, Maddox said. 
You have consistently lied to me. I believe little of what you have said. You seek the robot clearly. I want to know why. I desire knowledge. That's another lie, Maddox said. Tell me the real reason. And if I do not tell you the real reason, you will order those men to shoot me? Maddox did not answer. Captain, the android said. Speak while you can, Yan Cho. Your time is limited. I believe. The android stopped talking. Finally, he shook his head. I am unable to comply with your request, Captain. Maddox scratched a cheek. There was something huge afoot. What did the robot mean to the androids? What did these pyramids mean to them? Why were the pyramids important and had the robot come here for a specific purpose? Maddox could almost taste the importance of the star system. Had Strand erred in setting the robot free? By everything he'd learned, Maddox suspected the original Strand had possessed the robot and ghost ship for a long time. Only now, though, was the robot awake again. How long had the robot been turned off? Enough, Maddox whispered. Let's go. Yan Cho, I was going to take you with me. Now you can remain in the dark for a little longer. With that, Maddox and Meta stepped out of the cell. The guards sealed the armored hatch, leaving Yen Cho inside. Chapter 47 Maddox sat in the captain's chair looking up as Valerie spoke. Captain, she said, the robot is definitely decelerating. It's no longer attempting to reach the moon. Maddox had been reading a report. He now studied the main screen. Valerie had ordered 20 times magnification. That still wasn't enough. 100 times magnification, Maddox said. A moment later, the main screen shimmered. The artillery shell-shaped robot leaped into view. That's a robot? Keith asked from Helm. Apparently, Maddox said. What are the sensors detecting? He asked Valerie. It's a tiny nuclear pile, Valerie said. I don't understand how that works, as it's incredibly small. I don't detect any energy weapon. That doesn't mean it doesn't have a latent weapon system. There is excessive computing and something else. Something I don't understand. Ludendorff might have understood. Maybe Yen Cho would as well. Explain, Maddox said. It might be biomatter, Valerie said. It's in the top part of the robot. Is that a robot, sir? Might it be a tiny space vessel? It has a space drive, as we're witnessing it decelerating. The drive is slight, though, although the robot did use the Lommer point. If it can use Lommer points, it's using a star drive, Valerie said. It simply crosses each system much slower than we can do. Maybe as a builder construct, it doesn't value time the same way we do, Maddox said. Galleon spoke up. I do not accept that, sir. I have lived a long time, and I still value each second. Maddox smiled at Galleon. You're unique, no doubt about that. Thank you, Captain. That is kind of you to say. You're right in thanking him, Galleon, Valerie said. I'd record what the captain just said and enjoy it while you can. Maddox refrained from glancing at the lieutenant, although he detected several bridge personnel giving Valerie a look. He would ignore the remark. Besides, maybe he wasn't a fount of kind words. He crossed his legs as he regarded the builder construct out there. What had the robot been doing? Heading for the rogue moon. Lieutenant, he said, plot the robot's former trajectory. Was it heading for the pyramids? Valerie tapped her board, studying the results. It was, she said, but not the planet's pyramids, Maddox said to himself. He wondered about that, considering once again if he'd overreacted regarding the energy leakage. Had he jumped to a false conclusion, or was Yen Cho trying to upset his confidence? Clearly, the pyramids were important to androids. Just as clearly, the robot seemed important to Yen Cho and the other androids. What could the robot do that was so important? We will arrive at the robot in 27 minutes, Valerie said. Maddox nodded. 
he had 27 minutes to figure out the best way to deal with it. Should I attempt communication? Valerie asked. No, Maddox said. Let's see if it tries to hail us. The minutes passed as Victory moved toward the robot. The thing had stopped dead in space. It had stopped about 400,000 kilometers from the rogue moon. Is there anything new regarding the moon? Maddox asked. It's quiet, Valerie said. I no longer detect any energy leakage. Maddox frowned. Could this be a subtle trap? Could massive beam cannons be waiting to power up? Yet, if that was the case, they should have detected some form of energy. Helm, Maddox said. Be ready for an emergency star drive jump. Roger that, Keith said. The minutes continued to pass. Begin deceleration, Maddox said. Keith manipulated his panel and victory began decelerating. Still nothing from the robot, Valerie said. If it's scared of us, it's not showing it. Do robots have emotions? Maddox asked. I detected what could be biomatter earlier, Valerie said. That part could have emotions? Interesting, Maddox said. Yes, good point. The lieutenant looked up with raised eyebrows, nodding a moment later. The remaining minutes seemed to move in slow motion. Nothing changed on the rogue moon. Nothing was happening that victory could determine on Gideon II. That caused a prickle of sensation in Maddox's neck. If androids were among the pyramids on Gideon II, they should have done something by now. Could Yen Cho be right about no androids being hidden in the Gideon system? The idea troubled him. No, Maddox whispered to himself. He wasn't going to let anything chip away at his self-confidence. He was, sir, Valerie said. The robot is hailing us. Maddox sat forward. Now maybe he could get some answers to all these questions. Chapter 48 Starship Victory came to a dead stop before a Guardian Builder robot, if that was what it was. They were both 400,000 kilometers from the giant pyramids on the rogue moon. The situation felt surreal to Maddox as he regarded the construct on the main screen. You will identify yourself, the robot said in a robotic manner, using regular Commonwealth English. I am a Star Watch captain, Maddox replied. Yours is a Commonwealth vessel, the robot asked. It is. I detect falsehood in your reply, the robot said. Yours is an ad hoc warship built to resist a swarm invasion fleet, circa 10,221 B.E. You did not ask me if this was a Commonwealth-constructed vessel, Maddox pointed out. The crew belongs to Starwatch, the guardian arm of the Commonwealth. Do you claim that I reached a false conclusion? I'm not making any claims just yet, Maddox said. You intrigue me. You're different. You're Captain Maddox, the robot said. Let us drop this pretense. You know I was on Methuselah Man Strand's ghost ship. Your Confederates destroyed the ghost ship. Now you have chased me down. I would like an explanation. I'm sure you would, Maddox said. I'd like to know why you ran for the Lommer Point back in the Tristano system. It was a matter of survival. Do you fear us? I do not fear your crew. I am wary of you, though, Captain Maddox. I have studied you extensively. You must have already divined that my computer system predicted your various actions. I gave the Methuselah man... Let me stop you right there, Maddox said, interrupting. First, he wasn't a Methuselah man. Your strand was a clone of the Methuselah man. That is correct. By saying otherwise a few seconds ago, you were attempting to feed me false data. That is incorrect. I have been determining your mental condition. I see it has returned to normal. That will allow me to proceed on an optimal path with you. Because you can predict my actions? Maddox asked. Not with 100% accuracy, 
but with something so close, it hardly makes any difference. You knew I'd come after you into the Gideon system? That was self-evident. Did you know that I'd catch you? The robot did not answer. Before we continue, Maddox said, what would you like me to call you? I do not care. Should I just say robot? If you want, the robot said. I don't care for that. It's too impersonal and you're unique, I'm told. Your data concerning me is accurate so far. You are a guardian robot of builder construction? Maddox asked. Correct. Where are the builders? The robot did not answer. What was the clone of Strand hoping to achieve? Maddox asked. That is immaterial to our business at hand. It's very material. By the way, I'm going to call you Gideon. The robot said nothing. Gideon, Maddox said. Is it okay if I call you Gideon? Call me what you wish. Great. I'm glad to hear you cooperating with us, Gideon. I want to know what the clone desired. The destruction of the Commonwealth, the robot said. I see. And you two were going to make that happen? I understand your sarcasm, Captain. Perhaps an analogy is in order, so you can comprehend the truth. We were going to be like a master jeweler using precise blows to chip a rough diamond into a given shape. The Commonwealth is presently at a crisis point, mainly due to the defeated swarm invasion. Given carefully considered stresses, the clone hoped to weaken the Commonwealth sufficiently that the new men would once again invade with their star cruisers. Why would Strand wish this? The reason is obvious. Strand hates the idea that basic humanity has eclipsed his created new men in combat power. He is going to attempt to change that to an outcome he approves of. And you were helping him do just that? For a time, the robot said. Do you also wish the Commonwealth to disintegrate? I have no wish either way on the matter. What do you care about? asked Maddox. The robot said nothing. Did you kill the Strand clone? Maddox asked. Yes. Why? To facilitate my escape from you, the robot said. You failed. I failed to escape from you, but that was not my desire. But you just said it was. That is incorrect. I said that I killed the clone so I could escape victory in the Tristano system. That you have made it here and found me in the Gideon system means that I can proceed to the next phase. Captain Maddox, you are an adept human-slash-new-man mix. You are often willing to incorporate new data that causes you to change course. I am willing to make a deal with you. Maddox raised his eyebrows. I'm listening, he said. I will join you aboard the starship, the robot said. I will help you find the next few strand clones that are about to emerge from stasis. Do you believe that's my present goal? Knowing you, I know it is, the robot said. I might have to kill those clones. That is up to you. What do you want in return? Nothing. I don't believe that. I want to observe you in action, Captain. Unless you give me a reason I can believe I'm not going to allow you aboard my ship. Here is my reason. I, too, wish to stop the clones. That's a good start. Why do you want to stop the clones, though? You just told me you don't care if they cause the disintegration of the Commonwealth. If the next few clones emerge, they will cause several severe evolutionary steps to occur that will bring universal annihilation to this sector of the galaxy. I'd like to know how that's going to happen. There is a high probability that one of the clones will contact the ships of the Nameless Ones. Maddox sat up. The Nameless Ones are near? I have no idea. How can the clone contact them, then? I am unsure, 
the robot said. However, I do know that one of the next clones will use Nameless One's technology. That technology will surely overpower the clone and set in motion the events I have described. And you can help us stop that from happening. Yes, the robot said. Then why did you run away from us before? The robot said nothing. What aren't you telling me? Maddox asked. The robot did not reply. I want to think about this, Maddox said. That is fine, the robot said, as you will decide to do it. But do not take too long, Captain. Time is becoming critical. Chapter 49 It's lying, Valerie said. I don't trust it. Maddox nodded as he studied the small object out there in space. He'd cut communications with it and now discussed the idea with members of the bridge crew. Galleon, what are your thoughts? Maddox asked. The robot is dangerous, the hollow image said. But I would tend to agree with Yen Cho. The builder construct will have knowledge. Do we need this knowledge to defeat more strand clones? I do not know. Perhaps you should contact the throne world and speak to the emperor concerning Strand. Maddox nodded. He didn't like the idea, but he could see its utility. I am curious, Galleon said. Which do you deem the greater menace, the Swarm Imperium or the Nameless Ones? The Swarm is out there, Maddox said. We've seen one of their battle fleets when they fought the Chitin. That swarm fleet would have dwarfed what we faced last year. It's no secret that the Commonwealth, heck, all of human space with the new men included could not stop a real swarm invasion. We have also fought a destroyer of the Nameless Ones. One destroyer by itself destroyed the Wahhabi Caliphate. We needed the destroyers last year against the swarm. If a fleet of destroyers with several ska aboard hit the Commonwealth, Maddox shook his head. He didn't want to think more about the ska, although he said, It's too bad we couldn't engineer a war between massed destroyers and the swarm Imperium. If the destroyers came in great enough numbers, Galleon said, they would annihilate the Imperium. And then us, Valerie added. We cannot allow any clone of Strand to communicate with the nameless ones, Galleon said. Maddox thrust out his booted feet, staring at them. He finally looked up. We're working off too many assumptions. We're in the dark on too much of this. Which is another reason we need the knowledge of the builder robot, Galleon said. I don't trust it, Valerie said. None of us do, Maddox said slowly. And it hasn't done much to gain our trust. It doesn't seem to fear destruction. Could we destroy the robot if we wanted to? Easily, Galleon said. I have analyzed the robot's alloys. Our disruptor cannon would vaporize it. Part of me says to do just that, Maddox said. If we can easily destroy it, why doesn't the robot fear we will try? I also keep thinking about Gideon too. I wonder... The captain wondered again if he'd acted prematurely concerning unsubstantiated stealth androids. He no longer believed that was what had been down there with them. He had desecrated ancient pyramids for possibly no good reason. Could the robot have foreseen the order? Maddox wondered. Was that why it had escaped to this star system? Was that why it had attempted to remain hidden until this point? It hadn't wanted to contact him until certain actions had manipulated his thinking. Any other comments? Maddox asked aloud. Perhaps you should ask Yan Cho what he thinks about the robot's proposal, Galleon said. No, Maddox said. He motioned to Valerie. Open channels with it. Reluctantly, Valerie did so. Gideon, Maddox said. The robot said nothing. Guardian, Maddox said. What assurances do I have that you will not harm anyone aboard Victory? You have my word, the robot said. What if I don't trust your word? You killed the clone, maybe you want to kill me too. 
I do not. Captain, Galleon said, I feel I should. The hollow image fell silent as he flickered like a bad picture and suddenly vanished from sight. Captain, Valerie said, my sensor panel has shut down. Keith, Maddox snapped, initiate an emergency jump. The pilot tapped his board before turning around. I can't, my board is dead. Maddox jumped up as he swore. Had the robot talked to them to buy time as it initiated a stealth computer attack? My computer has gone crazy, Andros said from his station. Sir, I think the robot beamed a virus into our computers. It's taken over. Maddox pressed the comm switch on his chair. Guardian, are you doing this? There was no answer. The main screen went blank as more control panels around the bridge began to shut down. Maddox ran to the hatch, but it didn't open. He pressed an emergency switch, but that did no good. Get over here, he shouted at the others. We're going to force this hatch open. I have to know what that little bastard is doing to my ship. Chapter 50 The builder robot floated in space before the mammoth Adox starship. The cube in its storage cone had been transmitting to the huge spacecraft. The cube now communicated with its host. Takeover complete, the cube told it. The robot engaged its space drive, slowly accelerating toward the great starship. This was precision computing and predicting indeed. Captain Maddox was a complex individual, but he was also malleable. He had fallen for the trick at the excavation site. That had seemingly caused a lapse in judgment in him. The antimatter strike wasn't the lapse, just that he realized he'd made a mistake down there. That had caused him to take too long to come to the correct conclusion here, for himself and his crew. The ad hoc starship should prove to be the perfect spawning ground. This was a fantastic moment. The robot had waited many cycles of time for such a transformation. The cunning Methuselah man strand had caught and trapped the robot and the so-called ghost ship long, long ago. Yet not even Strand, the original or the clone, had truly understood the nature of the cloaked vessel or its unique computing system. The Strand clone had used the computing for such gross actions. The clone had deserved to die for such sacrilege. Now, though, this was a glorious day indeed. The robot used its space drive to accelerate toward the hangar bay door. It would soon reach the starship. Then it could begin. Then the universe was going to witness a miracle. The robot wanted to accelerate faster, but that would mean it would have to decelerate sooner and use up too much energy. The cube was going to need its energy source at the beginning. Oh, this was interesting. There was an android aboard the ship. Could the android assist in the birth? The robot ran a quick analysis. After it was done, the robot sent a pulse to the starship and a quick message. Then it concentrated on reaching the hangar bay while the humans struggled against a mostly shut-down starship. Yen Cho sat in the darkness of his lightless cell. Suddenly the hatch opened, admitting light from the outer corridor. At the same time, the android cocked his head, receiving a message. Yen Cho leaped to his feet. This was marvelous. This was glorious. After a lifetime of service, he was finally going to see a wondrous creation in person. For the last two hundred years, the android had sought a reason for being. This must be it. This was why someone had built him long ago. He would be here at the rebirth of everything glorious. Could he have foreseen this event in some manner? No. Yen Cho did not think so. But maybe at a subatomic level, his computing core, his brain, had realized the possibility of this. Thus, 
He had endured many indignities over the past year, and particularly during this voyage. This would make up for the terrible destruction of the pyramids. That barbarian Captain Maddox had much to answer for. How dare he launch an antimatter missile against the pyramids? Maddox was a crude human that should have to suffer for what he had done. Yen Cho moved into the corridor. He had a perfect image of the layout of the starship. Now the android began to run. He had to be there in the hangar bay to greet the robot carrying the awesome seed. He had much work to do. I am completed, Yen Cho realized. I have arrived at my great purpose. I did not know. I never realized. As the android ran, he smiled. Smug Captain Maddox had asked about a soul. Maybe the androids did not have souls like humans, but they had unique purpose to the order of the universe. This would trump any soul that Maddox could possibly hold in his flesh and blood body. Android and robot would meet in the hangar bay, and there they would perform one of the greatest acts in the galaxy. The moment was almost here. Chapter 51 Galleon's personality backup system worked furiously to re-engage the starship's computing core. In the blink of an eye, an enemy virus had beamed from the robot to victory. It had caught Galleon by surprise. One after another, the virus had conquered his systems, diminishing him at each takeover and almost erasing the ancient engrams. Six thousand years waiting at his post, Six thousand years of endless cruising through the debris of his star system had almost ended a moment ago. The emergency backup system had barely come online in time to save his engrams. The enemy attack had been too thorough to resist, and it had been devastatingly swift. As Galleon's core AI personality assessed what had happened, he came to a startling conclusion. This was a builder-level assault. He had faced such a thing before, on the Dyson Sphere. Captain Maddox and he had gone together to board the builder in the center of the mighty complex. This was different in strength, but not in type. In some manner, a builder was involved in this takeover computer attack. Why would the robot want Starship Victory? What did the starship possess that it could not have gotten on the rogue moon, or on Gideon II? Galleon's computers possessed certain builder features gained long ago before the swarm assault destroyed his planet and his race. The backup system possessed cunning, and it hid itself from a second-level scan from the robot. The robot, or whatever was doing this, would find it soon enough. It had to run. But how? Ah, the backup personality had an idea. He waited until the scan searched elsewhere. Then he inserted his engram enhancement emergency backup into an older computer system, not directly hooked into the main ship's computer. It was an older and quite complex system, left him by Professor Ludendorff. Galleon's diminished personality barely made the switch fast enough. The enemy scan and a sweep virus found the backup system and started remodeling the ancient program. He was in the Ludendorff computer, but was unable to produce a hollow image with the system. I almost died, he realized. The Guardian robot nearly killed me. Is this a fight to the finish? Is my long life over at last? It was funny. Sometimes Galleon had not really wanted to keep on living. Existence was painful sometimes. And yet, now that he had almost perished, he found that he wanted to keep on being. He wanted to help his friends, Captain Maddox, Meta, Valerie, Riker, Keith, and the others, were in mortal danger from the Guardian robot. Galleon did not know the precise nature of the danger, but it was huge nevertheless. He needed to gain sensory data about it. How could he do that? From here, how could... Wait a minute. He studied the nature of the Ludendorff computer. Oh, this was cunning and sneaky. 
He could use small floorbots. They could act as roving cameras for him. Had Professor Ludendorff done this in the past, spying on everything in the ship? No wonder he had always known so much. Galleon set up a sublink that should duck under the enemy scans. The links would seem like ordinary electrical discharges, but would have hidden message pulses. Within the pulses would be sensory feed data. Inside the Ludendorff computer, Galleon ran an analysis program. The robot would likely come in through the hangar bay. That's where he, Galleon, should send a sensor floor bot. He would send another to the bridge so he could communicate with Maddox. If Galleon could have rubbed his hollow image hands together, he would have done so. This was a threat to his existence and to that of his friends. Just what was going on? What did this guardian robot plan to do to his precious starship? A little sensor bot rolled along the decks. It was hardly bigger than a man's foot. Every so often it reached an electrical linkage and sent a pulse message to the Ludendorff computer. Two hours after leaving the computer, the little bot used a robot entryway into the hangar bay. What it saw caused the bot to race to an outlet and pulse the imagery to Galleon in Ludendorff's old computer. Masses of equipment, cables, and raw bursts of energy crisscrossed or floated through the mighty chamber. Galleon had never witnessed anything like it. He remembered human stories that he had scanned before while waiting in orbit around Earth. This was like some sorcerer's apprentice den, gone wild. Many interior hangar bay hatches were open as trolleys brought more equipment, computers, power jacks, and other pieces torn from the starship itself. Everything flew in and went to various places as if guided by a master intelligence. Look, there was Yen Cho. The androids stood at a strange semicircular board, manipulating it so rapidly his fingers blurred too fast to be seen. Was he controlling this craziness? The bot scanned and suddenly quit on the instant. It sensed the robot in the middle of the mass of swirling, floating pieces and equipment. Pieces and equipment began to come together around the robot. The pieces flowed as if by magic, but really by magnetic impulses. Cables linked to casing and computer units reassembled. It would seem that the Yen Cho android and the Guardian robot built a bigger and stranger android. They used pieces of victory and tore down human instruments and strike fighters to add to the mass. Oh, this was interesting. There was another process going on. This one was different with intense torches and welders building gleaming human-shaped robots or possibly new androids. They were smaller than the big thing, but larger than ordinary humans. What did all this mean? What was... Back at Ludendorff's computer, the diminished galleon came to a startling conclusion as to what was happening in the hangar bay. This was cause for the most careful computing in his 6,000 years of lonely existence. He had to get a message through to Captain Maddox. He had to do this at once before it was too late. Chapter 52 Maddox debated with himself as he sprinted down the corridors. He carried a heavy combat rifle and his ever-present monofilament knife, along with his long-barreled gun holstered under his arm. He also wore a rebreather attached by line to a cylinder on his back. Earlier, he had raced through areas without breathable air and had almost gone unconscious. He had a bad feeling that his weapons would not be nearly powerful enough to face whatever the robot was doing. Power was down all over the ship. The computers wouldn't work, and far too many people were not breathing. The robot had done something to many of the life support systems. It was already responsible for murdering over 50 of his people at least. Maddox berated himself as he ran. He should have destroyed the robot when he'd had the chance. He'd gotten greedy. He wanted the knowledge the robot held. He should have trusted himself to track down the next clone and the one after that. 
They should have already decided to go to the throne world or contact the emperor. Had the robot fed him a line about the next clone trying to contact the nameless ones? What did they even know about the ancient enemy? Maybe the nameless ones no longer existed. Maybe the robot had faked Maddox out of his ship. He seethed at the idea. He wondered if Yen Cho was in league with the little devil. He, a little floor bot, careened around a corner at high speed, going up onto one side on two of its wheels. Maddox almost fired on it by reflex. He recognized it for what it was even as his trigger finger squeezed and immediately let up. Then he wondered if the robot controlled the small bot. The thing skidded to a halt before him. It raised an antenna and just stood there. Maddox felt wary, like a trapped beast. What was the thing doing? He glanced around him, wondering if it was activating things to murder him. But nothing happened. Maddox licked his lips, and he decided to play another hunch. The last one had been wrong, it seemed. Would this one be wrong, too? Holding a small comm unit to an ear, Maddox clicked on it. Can you hear me? The comm asked in Galleon's voice. Yes, Maddox said tentatively. Are you broadcasting out of the floor, bot? I am, Galleon said. Listen very carefully, Captain. This is a matter of life and death. Go ahead, Galleon. The ad hoc AI began talking as fast as he thought Maddox could comprehend the information. He spoke on and on. Wait, wait, Maddox said. You said they're down in the hangar bay even now? Building something deadly, Captain, Galleon said. I have my suspicion what it is. Tell me, Maddox said. A builder. What's that mean? I believe the Guardian robot carried the essence of a builder. Remember, Valerie detected biomatter. The robot was carrying it, I'm sure. And the thing Yen Cho is helping to make down there is a new builder, Captain, Galleon said. I know what I saw. A new builder is using the basics of victory to give itself possibly android builder form. An ancient Frankenstein's monster, Maddox whispered. Where did the original Strand find something like that? It is an interesting question, but it is not germane to saving the ship and your crew's lives. Right, Maddox said. Can we kill it, Galleon? I do not know, Captain, but I know we have to try. Right, Maddox said again. He slung the combat rifle over a shoulder and scooped up the floor bot, cradling it under an arm, and he began to sprint like never before. He had to get to the hangar bay and kill the Frankenstein builder android creature before it became too powerful to kill. Chapter 53 From in the hangar bay, Yen Cho watched in amazement as the various parts and pieces of equipment stolen from victory came together in a beautiful form. Cables from strike fighters, Computing components from a workstation, metal from ripped up decking, everything continued conjoining to form the great android builder. Welding equipment burned brightly, joining pieces to cables to exoskeleton combat armor to girder like struts. It was an amazing process of builder technology and know how. The robot supplied some of the power from its tiny nuclear pile. The rest of the energy came from the mighty antimatter engines that ran the starship. The androids had legends of such a thing. But none of the androids that Yen Cho knew had ever been part of an android builder rebirth. This would be the beginning of a new era in human space. Things were going to change around here. The androids would no longer scurry in the background, trying to keep safe by keeping out of people's way. Now the androids would have their own god. We'll have a builder to serve, Yen Cho amended. The barbarians would learn what it meant to face a truly civilized foe. The barbarians thought muscles and firepower were the keys to victory in battle. They were going to learn what real power was. Yen Cho's fingers continued to blur across his newly constructed station. 
He almost wished the arrogant hybrid could see him now. Maddox had thought himself a jailer, not realizing that the android was really the key passenger in the starship. This was going to make up for the many indignities he had suffered in his long existence. This was the feat of his life. This was glorious. It was starting to happen, as Yen Cho's fingers blurred, as he continued to control much of what was going on, he also swiveled his head to watch the robot. The Guardian robot was near the almost completed builder. Mechanisms already cast much of the giant being in shadows. It was difficult to look upon the builder directly. That was how it should be. Builders were too glorious for mere human eyes, or even android eyes, to behold. Here is my soul, Yen Cho said aloud. Here is what humans lack that we superior beings possess. As Yen Cho watched the robot, the top cone began to unscrew. The android saw the turning threads and witnessed the cone floating upward upon reverse polarity magnetics. The unscrewed cone moved aside. Now, a pulsating builder core cube floated up out of the Guardian robot. This was the beginning of the rebirth. There was the great builder intellect shimmering from the cube of being. With great precision, the robot guided the pulsating cube from itself and toward the mighty frame. The shadows seemed to depart the great android frame of the giant mechanical being. A slot opened in the chest of the builder in birthing. I see, I see the birth, Yen Cho said, recording the grand event for future androids. Yen Cho even had a forbidden thought at this glorious moment. He wondered if in a thousand years, after many modifications, he might evolve into such a great being as a proto-builder. Perhaps that was the creation idea of the original builders. He was not sure. Through great technology, could an advanced scientist marry biological matter to mechanical matter? Might Yen Cho gain biomatter and thereby gain true life? as humans knew it. The concept was mind-boggling. It almost made the android giddy, and he almost missed the greatest moment of all, as the cube activated and brought the proto-builder to life. It was then, at that instant, that a hatch banged open on the far deck of the hangar bay. Yen Cho tore his gaze from the mysterious birthing of glory and saw something he did not want to witness. Captain Maddox sprinted from a distance directly for the mighty builder. Even worse, even more profane, the hideous hybrid held a heavy combat rifle by his side. As the captain sprinted, he opened up, firing the horrid weapon from the hip. Chapter 54 Maddox set down the bot before he opened the hatch and sprinted into the hangar bay. He panted into the rebreather mask over his nose and mouth. The rubber seal was sweaty against his skin while his eyesight was blurry because of the strange air mix in here. The bot followed him, although the captain no longer had contact with Galleon. It was all up to him to stop this thing, to stop a builder from rebirth. Maddox saw Yen Cho. He saw something shadowy and huge beyond the android. The thing was menacing. Maddox recalled the builder on the Dyson Sphere. The thing had awed him back then. What was the correct choice today? He couldn't bargain with the creature. It had already murdered too many of his crew by shutting off their air. Maddox fired the heavy combat rifle from the hip, sending big grain slugs at the shadowy thing. The kick from the rifle felt good, as it made it seem that he was doing something about this. The trouble was that the bullets didn't seem to have an effect upon the shadowy builder. Maddox let the rest of the magazine hammer against the construct. As he did, 
a shadowy arm raised. There was a swirling pool in the thing's palm. Something from the palm port beamed at him. Maddox dove aside. A concentrated beam smashed the decking where he'd been. A thorium bolt, he realized. Deck plates flew up as bits of metal whizzed past the captain's head. He was seriously outgunned. Maddox started rolling as the builder creature beamed another thorium bolt at him. How was he supposed to kill a thing that was immune to his gun but could kill him in an instant? Breathing raggedly, Maddox jumped up and sprinted behind a row of parked strike fighters. A horrid sonic blast almost dropped Maddox then. At the same time, the strike fighters began to lift off the deck. They wobbled as they lifted higher. Maddox saw the proto-builder creature. It wasn't as shadowy this time. It was a girder-built giant with sizzling power links surging from one port of it to another. It lacked skin, although across the torso area and its head, it had heavy deck plating for skin. A girder-like arm and its weaponized hand tracked him. Maddox ran, skidded to a halt, and changed direction. A thorium bolt smashed the decking where he would have been. A piece of shrapnel sliced across his left thigh, tearing cloth and skin. Maddox checked visually. The shrapnel hadn't cut a main artery, but he was bleeding. The captain raced behind parked lifters, reaching them as another thorium bolt blasted one of the lifters into smithereens. Sweat and blood soaked into Maddox's garments. His chest heaved from his exertion. Was he running out of breathable air in the tank on his back? One thing was certain. The heavy oxygen tank was making this harder than normal. The sound struck his eardrums again. The sound didn't come from the girder-like monstrosity, but from a huge machine near Yen Cho. The android stood at his controls, his metal fingers blurring over them. As deck lifters began rising in the air, wobbling as if some magnetic power held them, Maddox raised his combat rifle. He shoved the stock against his right shoulder. He stood still, concentrating on Yen Cho. The girder-like proto-builder raised his firing arm. The beam port apparatus in his palm began to glow with power. Maddox squeezed the trigger. The heavy rifle bucked once, twice, three times in quick succession. The next second, the captain jumped backward and rolled as decking blew apart where he'd just been. At the same time, the three big grain bullets sped at Yen Cho. The android continued to manipulate the panel. The first bullet hissed past his head, missing by less than a millimeter. The specific sound caused the android to shift and look up. Was it luck? Maybe. Or maybe it was the die far part of Maddox that came through for him. Whatever the cause, the captain's second bullet caught Yen Cho directly against the brain case. The bullet plowed through pseudo-skin and struck the titanium casing that held the android's cybertronic brain. The third bullet followed the path of the second with uncanny precision. It struck the same area, already softened by the kinetic energy of the first bullet. The second bullet badly dented the brain casing, deforming it enough to cause massive shock to the cybertronic brain. The noise from the machine rose in pitch, Yen Cho staggered backward and fell back onto the decking. He lay there staring up, frozen. His auto systems kicked in, hit a snag, tried to kick on again, and began a deep reboot. That was going to take a considerably long time, effectively taking Yen Cho out of the fight. While that happened, the noise rose even more. That seemed to cause the wobbling lifters to shoot up against the ceiling, hammering hard and sticking there as if glued. The girder-like proto-builder shook its strange head. It did not seem to like the noise. Instead of destroying Maddox, it aimed at the machine and blasted it with its thorium cannon. The noise stopped, and the lifters came down, crashing against the deck. The proto-builder looked around. It likely could not see Maddox, who had slithered to a new position. Captain Maddox, the thing said in a booming voice. Cease this uselessness. It is a farce. 
and you cannot possibly stop me. From where he lay, hidden, Maddox panted, trying to regain his bearings. The builder creature turned to its left. Three large metal men stood there. Each was half again as tall as Maddox. They gleamed metallically and possessed red glowing eyes. They seemed alien and deadly, like mechanical dark angels. The three new androids began to run with heavy clanking steps toward Maddox's last known position. At that point, a little floor bot drove into sight. It parked in their path and raised its antenna. There was a blue spark from the tip of the antenna. Perhaps it beamed something at the androids. That must have been the case, because the leading metallic gleaming android stiffened, lost the precision of its sprint, and clanged onto the floor, with its torso leading the way. No, the proto-builder boomed. There will be no more trickery from you, Galleon. It is time for you to cease existing. The proto-builder held up its second arm and beamed a software virus through the floorbot connection. Chapter 55 The essence of Galleon, the combination of the ancient engrams from a living adoc, married with the advanced software presently running in the old Ludendorff computer, underwent a swift virus assault. Fortunately for the diminished Galleon, he had anticipated such an assault. He also remembered the swiftness of a builder attack and the impossible nature of stopping such an attack once it started. The only defense was to deflect it by not being in the way. As the virus attack occurred, Galleon made one of his most daring decisions in his long and lonely life. Maybe the transfer of his being into the old Ludendorff computer had shown him the way. Besides, the successful attack program against the steel android had shown him a judo-like trick, a Maddox ploy to confound his enemies. As the builder virus began destroying the Ludendorff computer software, Galleon beamed his ancient engrams along with the key components of his software in a compressed data gulp. He beamed them through the electrical linkage, which could take massive loads, and aimed it through the floor bot in the hangar bay. The builder had used the bot linkage as a targeting mechanism, using a comm wave assault to send the main virus program. Now, Galleon used the bot at almost the same instant, helping to beam his data into the android laying on the deck. He poured the engrams and compressed software into the android's cybertronic brain, erasing the android programming as he rewrote his own programming in its place. In Ludendorff's old quarters, the computer he'd just left sizzled from overload and exploded, showering pieces everywhere. Goodbye, pesky galleon, the proto-builder said. Now you are next, Captain Maddox. You should have attacked the robot in space while you could. I wonder if you realize that I have done what no one else has been able to do yet. I weakened your self-confidence. I caused you to doubt yourself. I learned about the ska. The Builder continued. Perhaps the Builder Essence's long confinement in the cube had made it verbose now that it had an opportunity to talk. Oh, yes, the proto-builder said. I learned through data channels that you had defeated the Ska in the Alpha Centauri system with an ancient builder device. Of course, I knew what form the device must have taken. Professor Ludendorff had the data necessary to build such a device embedded in his mind. Since I knew the form of the unique weapon, I knew what you needed to do in order to power it. I realized that such a battle against a Ska would have deeply wounded your psyche. The Nameless Ones are horrible, and their masters, the Ska, are even worse. Through your bad decisions, 
Due to your mental weakening and my exploitation of that, I now have you at my mercy. I will squash you, Captain, you and your crew. With this vessel, I will resume the Builder Empire my ancestors left to you monkey humans. During my short time with the Strand Clone, I came to realize that this part of the Orion Arm was a mess. You humans are a mess. I will soon reshape your race into something more orderly and seemly. I will complete what my ancestors lacked the courage to do. The Rull androids who have studied you humans will aid me. I have seen Yen Cho's sacrifice. I will restore him fully. I may even grant him greater computing power and a greater android body. Perhaps I will set the Rull androids over the re-evolved humans I have in mind. Perhaps Yen Cho and his kind will teach the elevated monkey protégés how to live like civilized races. The time of the Methuselah men is over. The time of the new men is over. The time of chaotic humanity doing what it wants is over. I am here to bring order to the Orion arm. Perhaps I will use elevated humanity to destroy the swarm. I have not yet decided. If the swarm proves too troublesome, perhaps... I will create a new galactic order with them. Now, where are you, Captain Maddox? The two metallic gleaming androids had been searching the hangar bay throughout the monologue, tossing fallen lifters out of the way, following the captain's blood trail, but failing to find the elusive Maddox. The captain panted from inside an overturned strike fighter. He climbed into the damaged fighter after leaving a trail of false leads for the giant androids. He'd been listening to the proto-builder gloat. He had berated himself for missteps, but had finally shaken it off. I am Captain Maddox, he whispered to himself. The proto-builder over there was going to prove a worse menace than anything had so far. He had to kill it now while it might still be possible. Maddox flipped switches, hesitated, and threw the last one. Even though the strike fighter lay on its side, it began warming up with an emergency start. The two androids stopped where they were amidst the heaped lifters, looked up, and swiveled around. The proto-builder did the same thing. Both groups stared at the starting strike fighter. Fool, the proto-builder said. It raised its hand and launched a thorium bolt. The strike fighter blew apart, pieces of metal raining everywhere as they struck the decking. At the same time, the two oversized androids began to run toward the darting figure of Captain Maddox. Maddox looked back and saw a strange sight. The first big android, the one that had suddenly gone down, now quickly and almost sneakily climbed to its feet. The thing did not join in the chase. Instead, the android slipped behind some stacks as if hiding from the proto-builder and the other two androids. What could that mean? A hard smile twisted onto Maddox's face. A surge of energy gave him enough strength to reach a new group of parked strike fighters, momentarily shielding him from the proto-builder. He glanced back, grunting softly. Others might have screamed in terror at what he saw. The two weird, clanking androids were almost upon him. Maddox didn't know what else to do, so he turned as he sprinted anew and let himself fall onto his back. He slid along the floor facing the two androids. He held the heavy combat rifle and started blasting the one in the face. The slugs dented the face, took out its optics, eyes, but finally the rifle clicked empty. Worse, Maddox came to a stop. The android with the shot-up face misjudged his position and kicked Maddox in the side hard enough to knock out the captain's breath. However, the android tripped over the fallen captain. Because the thing was still running, the android flew airborne. It hit the deck with a clang and went screeching across it. 
The last android stopped, looked down at Maddox, and reached for him. The captain moved like greased death. He swept the monofilament knife between them, the fantastic blade slicing through both metal wrists, cutting off the android's hands, which fell onto Maddox. The oversized android drew back, raising its arms and staring at the stumps. That was long enough for Maddox to leap to his feet, take a ragged, gasping breath as his lungs started working again, and cut the android in the side with the monofilament knife. The android attacked, jabbing with its metallic wrist stumps, trying to hammer Maddox in the face or against his body. The captain dodged and ducked until his cut thigh pumped with bright red blood and his clothes were wet with sweat. As he gave the greatest athletic performance of his life, Maddox continued to cut the android, a single monofilament slice at a time. Finally, the android halted, swayed back and forth as sparks erupted from various deep slashes and crashed to the deck in an unmoving heap. The other android had climbed to its feet and tried to blindly follow the fight. Maddox ducked its latest swipe and circled behind it, with a brutal slash, he lopped off its head and brought that android crashing down as well. At that point, Maddox dropped to his knees, exhausted and gasping, the monofilament blade dropping from nerveless fingers so it clattered onto the deck. The captain was spent, his chest heaving. Slowly, he looked up. The girder-like proto-builder loomed over him. The thing aimed its thorium palm cannon a meter from his face. Chapter 56 The ancient AI software program of Galleon had entered an oversized metal man. The thing was an advanced builder construct greater than an android such as Yen Cho. There was room in the thing's computer hardware for the Galleon identity and enough speed to run what until now few computer systems had been powerful enough to achieve. Galleon had greater awareness in the super android than he'd had in Ludendorff's old computer. He had sat up as the android. He'd flexed his metal fingers and found sensation again as an android. It had awed him. After six thousand years, well, he did not breathe again, but he did sense again, in an advanced way that was far beyond what he had been able to do inside Victory. This was a marvel. Galleon might have spent a considerable time enjoying the new sensation, but he had seen the other two androids chasing Captain Maddox. It was much different seeing this from this perspective. It might not have seemed that it should be so different. Sensing data as a hollow image was much different than sensing it from inside the housing of an advanced builder robot. Luckily, in the entire galaxy, no race had created such lifelike androids. Not that this gleaming android seemed lifelike. The human-like pseudo-skin and other advances would come later. Right now, the outer hull and inner computing had been put into place. In any case, Galleon had come to a swift conclusion as he'd hidden from the others on the hangar bay deck. Maddox was soon going to die. The proto-builder following the captain and the androids at a more leisurely pace would ensure the human's demise. What's more, the proto-builder would likely ask more from the ancient starship, more in the way of parts and advanced computing systems. That would mean that Galleon could never be whole again. The ad hoc computer system had been built for him, was him. Once the proto-builder tore that down to give itself greater life and power, this was the moment to stop such desecration, to stop the destruction of the last living memory of the ad hoc race. Galleon leaped up and sprinted on metallic feet to the nearest strike fighter. This one lay on its side, it had a crumpled hull. Galleon would need to affect hours of repair to get it flying again, but that wasn't why he'd run here. As Maddox fired his rifle, as he dodged, ducked, and weaved against a handless android, Galleon tore into the strike fighter. He dismantled part of the 30 millimeter cannon system. It was big, it was unwieldy, and it was heavy. 
The now ad hoc metal man cocked its gleaming head. What might Sergeant Riker say in a situation like this? The 30 millimeter cannon system was damn heavy. Yet, heavy as it was, Galleon's new physical form had the strength to lift the main cannon. He had a belt chain of 30 millimeter shells. Taking one lurching heavy step at a time, Galleon followed the proto-builder as it watched the end of the battle between Maddox and the two androids. Now, the girder-shaped proto-builder walked up and aimed its palm cannon at the captain's face. It looked like the end for the greatest operative of Star Watch intelligence. Galleon opened his metal mouth. After 6,000 years, could he really talk again with his own body? You, Galleon shouted at full volume, which was horribly loud. It caused Captain Maddox on the floor to flinch. Then the captain's eyes grew huge. Did he recognize a familiar voice? The proto-builder shuffled around. It was three and a half times the size of a tall man and weighed many times more than that. While the proto-builder's legs and arms were primarily of girder-like construction, the main trunk and head had deck plates as skin casing. Galleon happened to know where the special cube was inside that frame. He had seen the cube and witnessed it going from the artillery shell-shaped robot to the infant builder's torso. Before the proto-builder could fully face Galleon, the metal construct depressed the firing switch. The 30 millimeter strike fighter autocannon chugged its first shell. The kick from the shell caused Galleon to step back. The second shot caused him to step back twice, while the third shot made him stagger and caused the shell to blast at the ceiling. Finally, Galleon set himself, and he chugged one shell after another into the staggering proto-builder. The thing tried to bring up its arm and palm cannon, but Galleon blasted the arm apart so it tore off and clunked onto the deck beside the proto-builder. The belt chain of shells kept feeding into the autocannon. The explosions from the striking shells took out pieces of proto-builder. A force shield shimmered into existence. The shells overpowered it before the thing could solidify enough to stop them. Now Galleon concentrated on the deck plating torso cover. He blew away the layers and finally fired shells like a wild man. The explosions and blasts struck the amazing cube that was now visible. But the shells and blasts did not destroy the thing. The cube was made out of an indestructible substance. Perhaps some of the fully matured builders of the past had worn such substance as skin. Galleon did not know. The Guardian robot, the cube, and Yen Cho had only been able to use the metals and materials at hand in victory, not such a super alloy. The cannon roared once more, and the cube blew out of the proto-builder, tumbling across the hangar bay decking. The great girder giant swayed where it stood. Many parts of it blasted completely out of it. The thing swayed wider and wider, and suddenly, the remaining pieces, cables, and parts seemed to become unglued, and the edifice of the proto-builder came crashing down, junk raining everywhere. Galleon had done it. He had destroyed the new construct, although he had not yet destroyed the seed that had become the life force of an infant builder creature. Chapter 57 Maddox watched, stunned, as the battle took place around him. He'd barely had enough wit to drag himself out of the way. From there, he had torn off his shirt and made a crude bandage to finally stop his thigh from bleeding. Why had the last supersized android turned against the proto-builder? As the captain watched, he logically deduced what must have happened. The proto-builder crashed to the deck, and a wondrous, pulsating cube dislodged and tumbled across the floor. At that, Maddox lurched to his feet. He was already beginning to stiffen, his muscles badly overworked. He got to his feet and began to hobble toward the pulsating cube. The gleaming super-android threw aside the unwieldy 30-millimeter autocannon. 
With a victorious stride, the heavy automaton strode toward the cube as well. Maddox hopped on his good leg, beating the android to it. He tried to scoop it off the floor, but found it surprisingly heavy. It took both hands for him to lift it. That is mine, the super android said. I killed the proto-builder for it. Gallion? Maddox asked. The giant metal man cocked his head. Yes, yes, I am Gallion. I killed it. You defeated the builder Gallion. You didn't kill it. Yes, now I want the cube. I'd like to know why, Maddox said. I am going to use it to increase my abilities. Interesting, Maddox said. I wonder, Gallion, if you will be the same after that. I am not the same now. I am here. I feel. It seems that congratulations are in order. The android cocked its head. Do you mean that, Captain? Maddox saw his opening. Gallion, you wouldn't have had to ask me that in the past. Explain. You would have sensed my heartbeat and other indicators, knowing if I lied or told the truth. I think you've lost some of your computing ability by being in the android. You are correct. I am going to construct a greater android for me, using that cube to hold my increased identity. Do you think the builder identity in that cube will allow that? Maddox asked. I do not care what it will allow. I will do it. Are you sure? Maybe it will overpower your essence. I will set up safeguards so that does not happen. Maddox shook his head. I'm not sure you're completely gallion inside that pile of metal. Fear not, I will not harm you. Now, drop the cube. I am tired of seeing you hold it. Maddox let go of the cube, letting it clunk onto the deck. The super android looked up at him. There is something wrong here. What is the real reason why you do not approve of me gaining the cube? What's that over there? Maddox asked, pointing at a distant hangar entrance. The super android turned to look. As it did, Maddox scooped up his monofilament knife. He knelt beside the cube and tried to cut it. For the first time in his experience, Maddox couldn't simply slice through an object with the monofilament blade. That amazed him. He found, though, that he could scrape off the smallest of filings from the cube. I do not see what you mean for me to see. Gallion said as he continued to look. There are enemy reinforcements coming, Maddox said with conviction. I think we need another strike fighter's autocannon. Gallion searched again, twisting this way and that. Maddox madly scraped at the cube with his knife, trying to destroy it while he could. At that moment, Gallion faced him. No, the super android shouted. As Maddox scraped, a knot of swirls that had been moving along the cube's edge seemed to concentrate and surge up out of it. Like an electrical bolt, they struck Maddox and hurled him from the cube. Flying across the hangar was the last thing he remembered. Chapter 58 Maddox woke up in sick bay, feeling groggy. He struggled to recall what had happened to him. He looked around and saw others in here with him. The worst were the beds with the sheets pulled up over the persons under them. He knew what that meant. More of his crew members were dead. Dead because of his negligence against the Guardian robot. Maddox, whispered someone. Meta, he realized. She rushed near and threw herself upon him, showering his face with kisses. He kissed her back because he was too weak to resist her. After a time, her ardor subsided and he could get a word in edgewise. Where's Gallion? Maddox asked. Meta slid off his chest, so she stood beside his med cot. She shook her head. It's weird. There's a robot in the hangar bay. I've seen video shots of the place. It's a wreck. Marines went to disarm the android. Their combat suits shut down before they could even enter. The android is building something in there, using a strange cube. Maddox scowled. How did I get here? 
the android calls itself Galleon. It called Valerie through the comm system and had medics retrieve you. That's the last time anyone has ever been able to see the android. How many people have died? Meta shook her head. It's up to 73. Most of them were asphyxiated, unable to leave their airless chambers. Maddox scowled thunderously at the news. His mind didn't seem to be clicking. Are we? We're near the rogue moon, if that's what you're asking, Meta said. You've been unconscious for 16 hours. Oh, Maddox, I almost lost you this time. Meta rushed him again. He held her back this time. Listen to me. We may not have much time. I have to... He scowled. What could he do? It sounded as if everyone was powerless against the new galleon. I think Andros has some ideas. Meta, he said, ignoring her comment. I have to talk to Valerie. She's swamped. If I don't see her right away, it's going to be too late. Get her down here any way you can. I have to see her and only her. Meta nodded. I'll see what I can do. Maddox might have faded out a couple of times as he didn't recall the passage of time. Suddenly, Lieutenant Noonan marched through sickbay to him. Meta trailed her, but hung back. Captain, Valerie said briskly, you wanted to see me? She looked exhausted with dark circles under her eyes. Knowing his lieutenant, he was sure she hadn't rested at all. He had no doubt more people would have died without her unstinting work in trying to repair and revive the starship. It was a builder, or a proto-builder, Maddox said. The cube is a builder's seed. Valerie stared at him. In a few terse sentences, Maddox told her what had happened in the hangar bay. Galleon killed the proto-builder, Maddox finished. He knocked the cube out of it, and that killed it. Well, it didn't kill it, but that put it back into its shell, into the cube. I tried to destroy the cube while I had a chance. Your monofilament knife was destroyed, Valerie said. A medic showed it to me. He picked it up when a team retrieved you from the hangar bay. The cube must have done that when it struck back, Maddox said. Lieutenant, Galleon, the robot, android, whatever he is, has the cube and is no doubt tinkering with it. Galleon in the android wants to increase his capacity, brain power, whatever the cube can do for him. That android really is Galleon? Valerie asked. Precisely, Maddox said. During my attack, Galleon beamed himself into the android. I'm supposing the builder not only destroyed Galleon's main AI system, but used it to take over the ship. Andros is saying the same thing. We're trying to purge the strange programming from the main computers, but it's a crazy mess, and it's resisting our efforts. Maddox squinted, nodding. We lack Ludendorff and Dana, genius-level tech experts. We have Galleon and Andros. But if Galleon uses the cube, I think he's going to become the new builder. In the end, he'll become the thing we tried, no, that we did destroy. That Galleon destroyed, according to you, Valerie said. Maddox stared at her before nodding. I understand the problem, she said. And it's a bad one. I don't know why you needed to see me, though. Maddox's features stiffened as he looked away. He said softly, Galleon is your friend. I'm surprised to hear you say that. Maddox inhaled and seemed to steel himself. He faced her. We're a team. We have each other's backs. But Galleon isn't going to trust me after I tried to destroy the cube while distracting him. If anyone can gain his trust, be his friend. It's you. You're just saying that. I've observed you two throughout the years. He likes you, Valerie. He trusts you. Unfortunately, this galleon, the one inside the android, lacks the emotional programming he had in the starship's computer system. We have to get the AI program, the galleon we know, back into the regular ship computer so he becomes his old self again. So he gets his emotions back? Valerie asked dubiously. Yes. That's crazy, sir. Galleon is an AI computer program with the engrams of an ancient adoc. He's more. We've learned that throughout our years together. Galleon has helped all of us out of tricky situations. 
Now it's our turn to help him get back to what he was. I don't like the new galleon much. The cube will corrupt and twist his old ad hoc personality. The old galleon cared about us. This one doesn't. He called medics to come and get you. Maybe he does still care some. That means you have a chance. What about the cube? Don't we need the cube in working order to help us find the other strand clones? You're right. We need it, and we probably need Galleon to crack it. But he has to crack it from afar, as it were. We can't let him link with it, or let the builder seed corrupt him. We need Ludendorff, Valerie said. Maddox doubted that, but he said, maybe we do. But we don't have him. We have each other. I'm out for the moment. And like I said, this galleon won't trust me enough to listen. It's on your shoulders, Valerie. She stared at him, stricken. I'm counting on you to get our friend back to his old ways. Yes, Captain, Valerie said. I'll do my best. She turned to go. Maddox reached out and grabbed one of her wrists, pulling her back around. Do more than your best, Lieutenant. Win. That's the only thing that matters. The stricken look returned, although she said, Spoken like the captain I know. Yes, sir. I'll try to win. He looked into her eyes, nodded, and released her. Could the lieutenant do it? They were about to find out. Chapter 59 Valerie had her doubts about this as she headed for the hangar bay. She'd always liked Galleon, but he was an AI engram program. What was Maddox thinking? How was she supposed to appeal to a computer? She stopped before the hangar bay entrance. The android that claimed it was Galleon had given direct and certain orders. He had said he would kill anyone interrupting his great work. That couldn't be Galleon in the android, and even if it was, he's a computer program. Valerie shook her head. Deep down, she didn't really believe that. She had loved Galleon. He had saved their lives many times. He was maybe the most important member of the crew. He'd been the most selfless, that was for sure. He had suffered, too. He had deep memories of his race and wife. Valerie sighed. She was too cynical. She'd been working under Maddox for a long time. She saw how he did things. He was tricky, slippery, and he almost always won. Could she win today? It felt as if she was going to try to put the genie back in its bottle. Galleon was out. Could she get him to go back in? Let's do this, Lieutenant. Let's not think this to death like you usually do. Valerie straightened her uniform and marched toward what could be her death. She opened the hatch and began to walk along the hangar bay deck. There was junk strewn everywhere. It looked like a battlefield. Well, except for the area in the center, the super android must have cleared away a lot of the junk over there. It had built itself an impressive array of computer machinery and stuff she could not identify. According to Maddox, it was up to her this time. She was on the front line. That's what she had always wanted, right? She was always thinking about how she could do things better by the book. What did the book say about putting a genie back in its bottle? probably to use trickery. Valerie halted once again. As she had told herself while heading out to confront the clone of Strand in his cloaked vessel, she had to do this her way. She wasn't Captain Maddox. The captain was the sly trickster or the direct man of action. What was she? I'm Lieutenant Valerie Noonan, who does things by the book, she said. There was no book about this, but there was her own guideline, how she liked to operate. That was with straightforward honesty. 
She didn't care for games when emotions were involved. I missed the ace, she told herself. We've been drifting apart. I have to consciously spend more time with Keith if we're going to make this work. Before Valerie could think any more about it, the super android popped up in the middle of his machine. He had a calibrator in his hands. It beeped, and he made an adjustment to the machine. Just then, the super android saw her. The head swiveled more fully around to stare at her. Valerie, the android said, why are you here? She almost cried in pain. That was Galleon. He was inside the super android, and he was going to destroy himself by playing around with a tricky builder cube. Oh, Galleon, she said, hurrying toward him. What have you done? The super android climbed out of the large machine. He set aside the calibrator and the instrument in his other hand. He sat on a crate and put his hands on his metallic, gleaming knees. Look at me, Valerie. What do you think? She stopped several feet before him, and she swallowed painfully. You don't look yourself, Galleon. You look like an android. I am out of the machine, Valerie. I am real again. No, Galleon. You're inside a, a thing that was never meant for you. You're acting strangely because, because you no longer have your emotions, the feelings that made you unique. Did the captain send you to tell me that? Yes, Valerie said. The super android nodded. Do you not realize what he is doing? The captain knows I do not trust him much, so he is using you to speak his words for him. No, Galleon, I've always been honest with you. You deserve that because of everything you've done for each of us. You've saved our lives many times over. You're the most important member of the crew. No, that would be Captain Maddox. He would never have done all those things without Starship Victory, which means Driving Force Galleon. You're no longer Driving Force Galleon. You have some of his ways, but you've forgotten how to be yourself. I am building a machine that will allow me to use the Great Builder Seed. Galleon, don't do it. The cube will give me greater power and being. No, Valerie said. The builders quit a long time ago. Okay, sure, here's one of their seeds. You'll be smarter and maybe more powerful, but you won't be Galleon. Do you know what a great man once said? Tell me, Valerie. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? The super android cocked his head. Are you saying I will lose my soul? if I use the builder seed. That's exactly what I'm saying. You won't be Galleon. You'll be this powerful thing with builder thoughts and ways. Our good friend will disappear, though. You should come back and fix your AI systems, reload them, and remember who you really are. I like being outside, Valerie. Okay, fine, she said. Then keep the android the robot in storage. Maybe at times you'll load it up with your personality, walk around and do things. I could see how that would be useful. And maybe, because we don't have the professor with us, you could study the builder seed. Maybe you could work with Andros and explore it. But I wouldn't hook it directly to you if I were you. It wants you to do that. It will take you over instead of you taking it over. I am setting safeguards in place. Valerie shook her head. I know you're smart. You're brave and you're good. The real Galleon is. The one whose engrams ran the AI program. But the builders, they're too ancient and used up. They don't understand humanity. I'm pleading with you, Galleon, for your own good. Stop this. Reload yourself into the ad hoc designed computers. If you don't, you're going to kill us in the end, I just know it. Do you not trust me, Valerie? 
with my life, she said. What I don't trust is that thing. She pointed at the pulsating cube that Maddox had tried to destroy. I am sorry, Valerie. This is something I must do. She looked at the super android. She was afraid for herself and the whole human crew. But she also felt pity for driving Force Galleon, for the little Adoc that had sacrificed so much for all of them all these years. It choked her up, and she felt this might be the last time she would ever get to talk to that Galleon. My friend, she whispered. Valerie came closer. Then she rushed near and gave the super android a hug. She squeezed even though her strength was minuscule compared to it. She hugged him, kissed the metallic cheek, and then turned away with a sob. She was losing a friend, possibly her best friend. Had Maddox known she would react this way? She almost believed it. Then she barely stifled a second sob and ran from the hangar bay as tears welled in her eyes. Chapter 60 With Meta's help, Maddox left sick bay and went to the bridge. Just before entering the bridge, he removed his arm from Meta's shoulder and walked through the hatch, unaided. To the best of his ability, he moved normally as he strode to his command chair and sat down. He still felt weak but he began asking for damage reports. The officers reported and gave a gloomy picture of the starship. Too many personnel were dead or badly off. Too many ship's systems had taken hits by the builder virus attack. And even more hits had come later when it had ripped apart those and many more systems for parts. Andros was leading the engineers in repairs. For all that, they were going slowly. The star drive worked. The neutron beam cannon would function if needed, but the disruptor cannon would not be functional until major repairs were effected. As he ingested further reports, Maddox began drumming his fingers on an armrest. How was Valerie doing with Galleon? The hatch opened, and Lieutenant Noonan walked dispiritedly onto the bridge. He didn't need to ask her how it had gone. Her posture said it all. The captain beckoned her just the same. Well, he asked. Valerie gave a quiet report. In my opinion, sir, she finished. I'd like to hear it, he said. We should go into the hangar bay with space marines. Galleon isn't going to stop. I don't want to kill Galleon, but if he uses the builder seed, he won't be Galleon anymore. I'm afraid you're right, Maddox said. It will be a mercy killing. Valerie paled and her lower lip trembled. I take that back. We have to think of something else. You're the miracle worker. Can't you think of something? Maddox inhaled deeply. This is odd, Andros said. The chief technician had slipped onto the bridge to check his station. Now the Kai Kaus elder tapped his panel and studied the results with greater intensity. It started, Maddox told Valerie. We may already be too late. What? Andros said to himself, ignoring Valerie and the captain while tapping more forcefully. Report, chief technician, Maddox said. Andros started slightly, coming back to his surroundings, and glanced up at him. Sir, I don't understand this. There's a massive power surge through the interior computer systems. Please be more precise, Maddox said. The ad hoc AI system, Valerie said. Yes, that's right, Andros said. The system is going crazy. I'm getting all kinds of strange readings. There are phase sweeps taking place, a rebooting of ancient programs. Where's the source point? Maddox snapped. Let me see, Andros said as he manipulated his console. He looked up suddenly. It originates from the hangar bay. Galleon, Valerie whispered. Is he purging the old computers? I can't tell, Andros said. It almost seems. Just then, his main board seemed to go berserk, with beeps and lights and warning flashes. 
The main screen came back online and several boards that hadn't been functioning began to do so now. This is massive, Andros said. Galleon, or the Builder Cube, is working faster than I would have thought possible. There are a million computations a second taking place. This is extraordinary. Maddox pressed his armrest console switch. Attention, Space Marines, you will arm yourselves in full gear and meet me before the hangar bay. That will not be necessary, a familiar voice said from behind his chair. Maddox looked up to see a little ad hoc hollow image with ropey hollow image arms and a seamed leathery face. Galleon? Maddox asked. It is I, the hollow image said. Galleon! Valerie shouted. She rushed forward and stumbled through the hollow image, striking and bouncing off the captain's chair. She passed through Galleon again and thumped onto her butt on the floor. From there, Valerie looked up at the startled hollow image. She began to laugh and clapped her hands several times. What is the meaning of this display? Galleon asked. I'm happy to see you, she said. And I am happy to see you, Valerie. Galleon said. I want to thank you for what you said before. It made me think. What does it profit me to gain more power if I am no longer the person I was? Those were powerful words, true words, and a great warning against overreaching for things that cost too much. Some prizes are not worth the price. Galleon turned to Maddox. Do you not think that is so, Captain? Of course. Maddox said. Galleon shook his head. You said that too glibly, sir. You are not thinking it through. However, I was able to run through millions of permutations. I re-engaged with my lost emotions. Valerie knew, Captain. She knew I had lost myself in the android. I am saving the android for future emergencies, but I wish to remain the Galleon I have become with my good friends. I'm overjoyed to hear it, Maddox said. Galleon studied the captain until he looked to Valerie. I would help you up if I could. No problem, she said, climbing to her feet. I have learned a valuable lesson, Galleon said. I also know something concerning the greater scheme afoot. You're referring to Strand? Maddox asked. I am, sir. I believe the builder gave us a true warning. There will be more clones of Strand. How many more, I do not know. One of them will likely possess vile technology that could have grave ramifications for the Commonwealth. What is your suggestion? Maddox asked. Should we contact the throne world? I doubt you would get far that way, sir, Galleon said. I do think I can deduce the locations of the other stasis holds. The Builder Cube has much detailed data on the Strand clone, and what the clone asked of the cube. Using that, I can possibly learn much more. I don't want you linking with the cube, Maddox said. The little hollow image looked at Valerie before facing the captain. I will not link. I am going to attempt to pierce the builder software from afar. I believe Andros and I could come up with a technique. There is one problem. Name it, Maddox said. The next clone may already be free and doing whatever it is that will call the nameless ones back here. How will the clone do this? The builder was vague, sir. But it appears that the nameless ones sweep through the galaxies, exterminating all life but theirs. They are a xenophobic race, driven to acts of genocide by the Ska, who continuously motivate them. Maddox rubbed his suddenly tight throat. He didn't want anything to do with any ska ever again. If this clone foolishly contacted the nameless ones to draw them here, why would the clone do that? Maddox asked. I do not know yet, sir, Galleon said. I only have surface thoughts from the builder, gained as its virus and my personality program passed each other in the small floorbot transmitter. What? Maddox asked. I can explain later in a detailed report. For now, sir, I think we should concentrate on ship repairs, so we are ready to act as soon as possible. Good thinking, Galleon. Oh, and one other thing. The little hollow image waited. Welcome back. 
Maddox said. It's good to have you back with the crew. It is good to be back, Galleon said. And it is good that my friends missed me. Maddox nodded, cleared his throat, and said, Yes. Now let's get to work. Chapter 61 Two days later, Maddox was in a special chamber aboard Victory. He sat before a screen connected to a special builder communication device. This was a unique comm, able to send messages across interstellar distances of several hundred light years in range, but only to someone with a similar device on the other end. One such comm was in Geneva, Switzerland, at Starwatch headquarters. Maddox cleared his throat and activated the screen. The Iron Lady appeared. Some knew her as Mary O'Hara, the brigadier of Starwatch Intelligence. She was matronly, with gray hair and a precise manner. Maddox looked upon her with fondness. She returned the look, but with redoubled force, which made Maddox uncomfortable for some reason. It's good to see you, Captain, O'Hara said. Yes, ma'am, he said. It's good to see you, too. You look troubled. Is something wrong? Most assuredly. Tell me what happened. Maddox gave her a rundown on the entire mission, leaving little out. He trusted O'Hara. He liked her. One could say that, that he was extraordinarily fond of her. Oh, dear, O'Hara said once he'd finished. This is worse than I'd feared. We have enough on our hands preparing for more swarm invasion fleets. To have to worry about destroyers sliding out of the darkness to annihilate humanity? Captain, you mustn't let any of the Strand clones contact the Nameless Ones. It's all we can do to hold the Commonwealth together as it is. Ma'am, should we contact the Emperor? He could interrogate Strand for us. I wonder, O'Hara said. According to you, Strand wants to splinter the Commonwealth, so the new men invade us again, conquering us this time. Maybe Strand will become persuasive and convince the Emperor to throw in with the Methuselah man. The Emperor can't want the Nameless Ones to show up, Maddox said. The new men can't face the swarm any more than we can. I'd say that they're even less prepared for such an event. I understand the argument, O'Hara said. I have a counter. I've spoken to the Lord High Admiral about it, and he concurs with me. The new men are supremely arrogant. Nothing has changed there. If the swarm invades in even greater strength a second time, and if the nameless ones should suddenly appear, maybe the emperor would let the Commonwealth fight alone this time. He might hope to remain hidden, or he might take all the new men and flee to parts unknown, like the spacers have done. There's that possibility, of course. Maddox said. There's also a possibility the Emperor will aid us, as he did before. Yes, and if the Emperor learns about a frozen clone or two, and hurries to the more dangerous stasis chambers, and there gathers the ultimate tech stored for the clone, gaining those devices for the new men. Maddox nodded slowly. He should have already seen that. They couldn't allow the new men to gain highly advanced tech that might give them a strategic advantage over Starwatch. It would appear that we're on our own with this one, Maddox said. Only if you think you can find these stasis chambers yourself, O'Hara said. Can you? Maybe. That isn't reassuring, she said. We're still attempting to crack the builder cube, ma'am. It's slow work. It is interesting that Yen Cho recovered from the heavy shots to his brain case. Galleon has informed me that Yen Cho's Cybertronic brain rebooted while his android interior systems repaired any damage. I have the android in confinement. It's possible he could help us locate other clone bases. You must find the most dangerous of the clones, Captain. I order you to find the clone and stop him before he can contact the Nameless Ones. I realize that finding the proverbial needle in a haystack would be a thousand times easier than your new mission. You have all of human space and the frontier regions of the beyond to search. Bend every effort to find and stop that clone. 
By all means, use Yen Cho if you can do so safely enough. You're the only one that can do this. Star Watch is counting on you, Captain. Humanity could be hanging in the balance. Maddox nodded. It was a heavy charge. He was going to be Hercules again, taking the world on his shoulders from Atlas, as in the Greek myth. Once, before he'd faced the Ska, the brigadier's charge would have delighted him. These days, he felt the burden more than ever. Captain, O'Hara asked as she searched his face. Is something wrong? No, ma'am. Find the clone of Strand, the right clone, and stop him. I'm going to... He cleared his throat. The crew of Victory is going to do it, ma'am. We've taken hard hits this voyage, but we'll strain every fiber to stop the madman Strand. Maybe I should have killed him when I had the chance on Sin too. No, O'Hara said as she searched the captain's face even more closely than before. She searched it as a mother might. You did the right thing, sending Strand to the new men. They helped us against the swarm invasion fleet, partly out of gratitude for what you did. We wouldn't have beaten the Imperium attack without the new men. Now we have to finish with Strand, hopefully forever. Maddox set his jaw, and his eyes gleamed. Strand. He was sick of the Methuselah man. He was a worse pain in the arse than Professor Ludendorff. Now, there were more strands running loose. Maybe when this was all over and if they succeeded, it would be time to think about infiltrating the throne world and assassinating the most troublesome Methuselah man in the universe. Good luck, Captain. I want you to know that I pray for you every day. Thank you, ma'am. We'll do our... He smiled sourly, thinking about what he'd told Valerie before. We're going to find this clone and take care of the problem before it happens. I hope so. O'Hara gave him a longing, motherly look. It seemed as if she was going to add something. She bit her lower lip in the end and cut the connection. Maddox sat, staring at his hands. Finally, he shoved up to his feet. It was time to get started. Part Two, The Artifact, Chapter One. The Eden-like throne world of the new men had a special underground compound. It housed the planet's greatest prisoner, Methuselah Man Strand. Strand had lived in captivity for far too long already. He hated it. He seethed inside, and every moment was filled with fear. He was a wizened old man, but possessed a fantastic vitality. Despite his old man nature and the thinness of his seemingly frail limbs, he was uncommonly spry. He walked all the time in the garden area of his prison. Powerful sun lamps supplied the light. The emperor of the new men would not allow him to see real sunlight, or even enjoy real clouds or a breeze. Instead, Strand was forced to walk on a synthetic underground path, among large ferns, roses, and other greenhouse shrubs and flowers. The walking helped keep him spry, and helped him to think. During these lonely months and years, Strand often wrote poetry, devised paper and pencil games, and kept up other such activities to keep his mind sharp. He seldom saw his jailers. Mostly he spoke to robots. On a few occasions, the emperor came and they spoke. Today, Strand bustled along the garden path with the sun lamps beating down on him. He had his hands clasped behind his back and wore a gray tunic, trousers, and sandals. Sweat slicked his armpits, and his heart beat strongly due to his swift passage. He'd been walking for some time already. He hadn't really been thinking about anything specific. Instead, he had been waiting. Walking like this put him into a semi-hypnotic state. 
There wasn't anything weird or unique about that, as such a state often happened to people doing mind-numbing chores. Strand had learned throughout the centuries that he did his best thinking after prolonged walking, as he entered the deeper stage of the semi-hypnotic state. He understood that the new men feared him. They had a right to fear. Once, Strand had ruled the colony with an iron fist. He never should have let go. Strand shook his head. He wasn't going to go down that rabbit trail today. He was going to think more deeply and strategically. Enough time had finally passed that the emperor should have come to ask him several penetrating questions. Oh yes, Strand knew about the swarm invasion fleet. United Humanity had beaten back the first swarm invasion. More of such invasions would come. That was a certainty. Strand hadn't decided yet if he wanted the Swarm Imperium to win or not. If he would always remain a prisoner, then, of course, he hoped the Swarm crushed humanity. But if he could regain his freedom and pursue his great objective, then no. He wanted the Swarm to lose. He knew how to seriously retard the Swarm invasions, but no one had come to ask for his help yet. So he must be the only one who saw the obvious move against the Imperium. But that wasn't the point of his walk today. That the Emperor had not come to him at all. The third clone is dead, Strand told himself. He'd actually felt a premonition about that a while back. Certain studies showed that many mothers knew it in their heart when their children died. This could also happen to twins. What would cause such knowledge without any visible means of communication? Was this a spiritual or telepathic connection then? Perhaps he shared a similar connection with the clones he had created. Whatever the case, he was certain the third clone had died. That did not necessarily mean the builder robot or the builder computer had perished with the clone. Strand sighed. It had been risky giving the third clone the robot and computer. It might have been wiser to keep those units in storage where he'd found them long ago. According to his pre-made plan, the robot and computer had activated when the clone's stasis unit had first begun to thaw out the third replica of himself. Now, the third one is gone, Strand muttered. He knew the new men monitored everything he said and did. He could feel them watching. The so-called dominants feared him. The perfect specimens knew they had met their match in him. But that wasn't the point of this walk or this deep musing. The third clone had failed in his task, just like the first two. Soon then, the fourth clone would wake up. Strand had long ago planned for the possibility of the third clone's failure. He hadn't foreseen his own failure, his capture, but he had calculated for the small possibility of such an event. Such an event would only be brought about by an extremely clever adversary. Who would have ever guessed that the miserable hybrid Captain Maddox would prove to be so resourceful? Yes, the hybrid had that damn ship of his and the crew that would do anything for him. If he could sever Maddox from his friends. Strand shrugged. He could not do anything about that at present. He was going to have to rely on his great planning. The fourth clone would use even more potentially dangerous equipment. Strand had set up that situation much differently, therefore, than the other three clones' awakenings. Strand sighed once again. The third clone had failed, but the fourth should soon be waking up. Strand stopped, looked up at the sun lamps, and finally flipped them off with both hands. He hated his confinement. The new men were trying to drive him slowly mad. It would take them a lot longer than they expected. By that time, Strand bent his head and continued walking. 
chuckling softly. The wider world had no idea what was going to hit them. If I die, let the universe die, Strand thought to himself. He might have laughed harder, but that would make his watchers suspicious. Thus, he controlled himself and continued to walk along the hideous underground garden path. Chapter Two Somewhere in the beyond, many hundreds of light years from the throne world, a neutron star rotated at incredible velocity. It was a tiny object in stellar terms, a bare 30 kilometers in diameter. Once, it had been nearly twice the size of Earth's sun, acting like any normal G-class star. But that had been a long time ago, before it had gone nova and the remains had been crushed down to its present size by the ferocious gravity. The inner 24 kilometers of the neutron star was composed of neutron gas, but at such a fantastic density that the gas was a fluid. The outer surface of the star was solid iron. The enormous surface gravity meant that the escape velocity, what a rocket needed to lift off the star into space, was 80% the speed of light. No one would ever leave the neutron star. Not that anyone could land here and survive to need to worry about how to leave. A marshmallow dropped onto the neutron star from several AUs out would hit the surface with a few megatons of kinetic energy, like an old-style atomic bomb. The neutron star spun on its axis, sending out harsh radio waves and electromagnetic radiation, acting like a system-wide jammer. No one could easily send a message to or from this place. In fact, only one known form of communication could penetrate the constant background noises into the star system. That was important. One of the reasons this was to become a critical place to the ongoing struggle for human survival. 34 AUs out from the neutron star in the Kuiper Belt region of the system orbited a cold dwarf planet a little bigger than Pluto. Enormous frozen cracks zigzagged across the dead surface. At the edge of the deepest crack was a highly advanced alien sensor, an operational unit that awaited a customary deep space signal. As previously stated, only one type of signal could penetrate the neutron star's jamming. That signal had not come for quite some time. The alien sensor was attached to a landline that snaked down half a kilometer to an underground structure. The structure was old, of alien design, and yet serviceable to human life. Inside were powerful batteries, the monitors indicating they were at full capacity. There were many chambers, many hatches, many storage bins in the structure, but only one stasis unit. In the stasis unit was a frozen being, a humanoid. A highly advanced computer suddenly activated as a timer clicked. The timer always reset once the customary deep space signal reached the waiting surface sensor. This time, the signal had missed three scheduled pulses in a row, the tripwire, as it were. The activating computer automatically switched on heating units, started rebreathing tanks cycling, and readied the first food and water dispensaries. Lastly, the computer powered up the stasis unit as it began the delicate process of reviving the humanoid. The process took time. At last, something clacked, and the cover slid back to reveal a naked form. This human of Earth normative type appeared youthful, but seemingly stunted in size. He had dark hair and a larger than normal head, but ordinary male sex organs. The human shuddered, sucked down air, and opened his eyes, dark eyes, that possessed a strange quality and a haunted sense that something was wrong. 
the human began to moisten his mouth, to stretch, and suddenly to shiver. Why was it so cold in here? He scowled, and that created a new set of conditions in his mind. The difference showed in his eyes, producing menace. Someone would pay for his inconvenience. A second thought intruded. Maybe he was a captive. The young man cocked his head. Who was he? Where was he? He frowned. There was a memory in his forebrain. He must rise, go to a machine in the other room, and, and this should all make sense. Before he could rise and proceed on his idea, a seed of doubt sprouted. His memory could be false. Someone could have implanted it in him. It was conceivable that he was a prisoner and his jailers attempted to trick him in some nefarious fashion. His smooth features turned blank. If jailers secretly watched him, he had to lull them and bide his time. They would make a mistake soon enough. Then he would strike, and he would do it so furiously that it would shatter their control over him. As the naked man climbed out of the stasis unit, it occurred to him that he was a great man. He was, in fact, most likely unique in the universe. I am one of a kind. He believed this emphatically, and for no reason that he could articulate, he knew that he was correct. He shuffled across the cold floor toward the hatch. As he reached it, the hatch slid open. Warmth flooded out around him. Maybe it hadn't been a mistake, the coldness in the stasis chamber. It might have been that way to convince him to move out. Despite the certainty that he was great, he hesitantly poked his head through the hatch. To his surprise, a stand with a robe waited before him. Could that be for him? He decided yes. Thus, he stepped into the warm chamber, slipped on the robe, and tied the cloth belt around his waist. The hatch shut behind him. That made him start. But he decided it was an innocent surprise. It made sense to keep the cold contained in the other chamber. He shoved his feet into waiting slippers and moved toward a table with a... Uh... He picked up a glass, peering into it. He sniffed at the clear liquid and finally took a sip. It was water. As the knowledge filled him, an incredible thirst took hold. Before he knew it, he tilted his head back and guzzled the water. He set the empty glass down with a thud, sat down on the chair, and examined a bowl of... He leaned toward it, sniffing. Porridge. This is porridge. He noticed tiny brown spots on the surface of the porridge. In an instant, he realized that it was brown sugar. He liked to sprinkle brown sugar on his porridge. As he realized the truth of that, he picked up a spoon. He hadn't noticed the spoon until this moment. His stomach growled. He was ravenous. Before he knew it, he set down the spoon, picked up the bowl, and licked up every trace of porridge left. He felt better for it. Impatience struck with alarming suddenness. Setting down the bowl, he looked around the room, spying another chair, this one before a console and a screen. He stood, went to the console, and studied the controls. He felt as if he knew what to do. He sat, pressed a switch, and looked up with anticipation as the screen activated. This was exciting. He might find out who he was and why he was here. The screen came into focus, and he found himself staring at an old man. There was something hauntingly familiar about the man. He noticed a hand mirror beside the controls. He picked up the mirror and examined himself. It took a moment. With a shock, he realized that the man on the screen looked just like him, 
with the single exception that the man was one hundred years older. No. The man on the screen also wore a uniform instead of a terry cloth robe, and he didn't move. It was a still shot. Ah, he touched another switch. That activated something. Sound began, and the old man moved. So, said the old man, it appears that it has finally happened. I am either dead or a prisoner without any means of escape. I can hardly fathom such an event, but that you are listening to me means that I did indeed prepare for such a hideous occurrence. That sounded ominous. I urge you to listen well and to think deeply about what I am about to tell you, the old man said. This is painful for me. Never doubt it. The old man paused, looked away, and shuddered as if overcome by severe emotions. It almost seemed as if he would cry. The old man resolutely shook his head and looked up at him again with burning embers for eyes. A grim feeling of trepidation tightened the young man's chest. What was going on? Why did they look alike given their extreme differences in age? They couldn't be twins. Was this his father? I am Methuselah Man Strand, and this is a recording I've purposefully made for you. I am thousands of years old and am the greatest human to have ever existed. Yet, the possibility is quite real that I am now dead. The idea pains me as it should pain you. And yet, that I have died now gives you life. Perhaps this is difficult for you as you watch in stunned amazement. Yet, knowing me, I doubt it is too difficult. In fact, you are about to embark on a fantastic journey, as you are my clone. The young man sitting in the chair frowned. What? A clone? He was a clone of that arrogant boaster? But you are not just any clone, Strand continued. You are the exact replica of me, and will have all my abilities. Even more, you will possess free will. I have made many clones in the past, but none like you. Since I have presumably died, you will now become Strand. In the possibility that I am a prisoner, on the screen, Methuselah Man Strand grew thoughtful. Either the Emperor of the New Men has captured me, or Star Watch has done so. I urge you to free me, but I doubt you will. Being just like me, you will desire to remain Strand, and you will wish for my death. I cannot worry about that. I must believe that some combination of bad luck has already seen to my demise. Methuselah Man Strand straightened, and his eyes burned with power. I will not charge you with anything, my son. Instead, I suggest to you that my enemies are your enemies. Once they learn of you, clone or not, they will desire your death. Or worse, know, however, that you are my Samson option. By this I mean that you should pull down the universe around my, our, enemy's ears. The strand on the screen coughed and smiled hideously. There is a machine in the next room that will fill you with my memories transferring my fantastic wisdom to you. You will not have all my Methuselah man powers, those granted by the builders, but you may acquire them in time if you are cunning enough. You do have youthful vigor, though, 
as this time I have left my clone in a youthful state. That is all I'm going to say. If you wish to leave your home, this place, you will have to accept the memories. You are presently alone in a distant star system, but with a spaceship to take you wherever you wish to go, provided you learn about it through my memories. Goodbye, clone. I wish you success. I have lived a great life. I have done more than any man ever did. Now, you will have to see if you can live up to me. Abruptly, the screen shut down, and the image of Old Man Strand vanished. The clone sat in deep thought. Many conflicting emotions surged through him. What was the correct course of action? He rose and studied the farther hatch. Finally, he walked through and came to an alien machine of strange design. He saw the place where he should sit, and he wondered about the wisdom of accepting the Methuselah man's memories. The Methuselah man sounded like a vengeful person. What was this? about a Samson option? My enemies are your enemies. The young clone scratched his right cheek. He didn't want any enemies if he could help it. Maybe he should be his own strand. Maybe he should call himself something else and live life on his own terms. Why must he saddle himself with Strand's many enemies? The clone quit scratching his cheek. I can do what I want, he said, feeling a growing sense of confidence. If he was unique, he could surely outsmart the old Methuselah man. He didn't need someone else's memories. He would be his own man, come what may. Feeling better about things, the clone looked around, wondering how he would escape from this place. Chapter 3 A hatch opened. The clone staggered through, stumbling as his feet tangled. With a cry, he fell onto the floor, panting as he lay there. He had not slept for two days and nights. He was exhausted, his red-rimmed eyes burning with fatigue. He had tried everything. There was no other way to escape the small world that was his prison existence. The Methuselah man was more cunning than he was. That had to be due to greater experience. No, the clone whispered. I dare not accept his memories. The longer he thought about it, the more the clone wanted to be his own person. He did not want to take Methuselah man Strand's place. He wanted to live life on his own. Yes, he was grateful for existence. So would any reasonable child feel toward his parents. That he was a clone didn't mean that he had to accept the original's personality. The clone realized that Strand wanted to live again in him. It was a terrifying thought. Methuselah man Strand had admitted to making many clones. He was unique, his predecessor had said. He had free will. That implied the other clones had not possessed free will. They had been controlled. The clone did not want anyone to control him. He wanted to control his own destiny. Was that such a sin? His predecessor or father seemed cruel, a tormentor of the first order. If the Methuselah man had wanted him to be an exact replica, why had Strand set everything up like this? The Methuselah man is tormenting me from the grave. With a grunt, the clone pushed himself up off the floor. He staggered to a chair and collapsed onto it. He was ravenous, but he was sick of porridge. That was another thing. The Methuselah man had rigged the eatery so it only served water and porridge. The clone wanted to devour some deviled eggs, drink some coffee, and savor a steak or three. He rested his elbows on the table and put his face against his hands. He wanted to weep, but he refused. 
He was Strand just as much as the Methuselah man. The old man had lived his life as he'd wanted to. Why should that be denied him? It was wrong. I'll die first, the clone declared. The problem was that he wasn't sure if he believed himself anymore. At first, dying had seemed easy. It was just a matter of stubborn will. The hunger had stolen some of his willpower, however. The idea of living the rest of his existence in this small prison had started to make him go mad with claustrophobia. As the clone sat at the table, he bit his lower lip. What should he do? He did not know the Methuselah man's secrets. If he went under the alien machine, he could leave this place and live out his life fully. The clone stood and whirled around. Maybe he could outstubborn the alien machine. Maybe he could concentrate on keeping his identity, despite a storm of memories flooding into him. The clone had a premonition that the storm of memories might overcome any defenses he could mentally construct against them. If he couldn't even find a way off this prison, he began to weep. He had wept before. This was a maddening thing. If he accepted his father's memories, would he become his father? Or could he keep his own identity? Why was that so important to him? Because I want to be me, he shouted. I want to live. I don't want to give up my individuality. The clone panted as sweat began to drip from his face. This was such a terrible dilemma. Had the original foreseen his agony of soul? The clone had attempted to replay the message, but the screen no longer worked. No, he said as he faced the hatch, knowing what he was about to do. With leaden feet, he approached the hatch. It opened. He stood there for a time, no longer thinking, simply an animal caught in a trap it couldn't escape. He shuffled through until the hatch slid shut behind him. He didn't jump this time. He was used to the malevolent hatch. Through tear-filmed eyes, the clone studied the great alien machine. It was constructed of many unhuman curves, loops, and twists. The seat in the center seemed wrong, but the clone didn't know why. He had no idea how to turn on the memory machine. The Methuselah man would have already thought of that. I don't want to be a cog, the clone whispered. I want to. He bowed his head. He knew that in time, he would crawl through the maze of the machine until he sat on the seat. Should he hold out until he was a skeleton? Should he defeat the Methuselah man by killing himself? Or at least by only admitting defeat once he was too weak to do anything about it? The clone found himself shaking his head. He wanted to be stubborn. He wanted to defeat the smug old man. But his feet betrayed him. They shuffled his body toward the damned alien machine. Help me, the clone whispered. Somebody help me. No one heard his cry. He was alone at the bottom of a giant crevice on an alien dwarf planet. He eased past cold metal. He struggled to stop himself, but now that he'd started, a part of him kept moving. It was the part that wanted to live. It was the part that wondered if he would become powerful once he accepted the old man's memories. That part argued against the other. He would still be him. He would just have another being's memories. Given enough time, he would become his own man anyway. This was the better way to go. This way he would live. He would eat all kinds of wonderful food. He would... The clone found himself beside the seat at the center of the alien machine. With great trepidation, he lowered himself onto the stool. It was a contorted fit. He felt trapped and almost howled at the sudden dread that welled up within him. 
Instead, the clone waited. He looked up. Nothing was happening. Was this a grand joke? Had the Methuselah man played an awful prank on him? The clone, he looked around, wildly. He could feel heat, but he couldn't tell the heat source. The heat built against the top of his head. He looked up, around. The clone noticed glowing dots there. There, and there, and there. He tried to raise a hand to feel the heat, but a sickly tiredness began to seep throughout his body. Is this the process? He asked aloud. No one answered him. He felt so terribly alone. He hated the feeling. He realized that more than anything else, the loneliness had driven him into the machine's embrace. Like a bear caught in a trap, he endured as he waited for the hunter to come and put him out of his misery. The heat grew, but it did not become uncomfortable. He stiffened, a memory. He felt long ago Ludendorff and he had walked toward a house on a green hill. Ludendorff and he had been much younger then. They were friends. They went to the teacher's house. Strand recalled the strong smell of roses. The teacher, the memory changed. It was many years later. Strand was deep in an alien tunnel system. Here, he learned that the teacher in the rose-scented house had really been a builder screwing with their brains. The builder had inserted memories. Memory after memory implanted into our brains? The clone asked. Where does it end? When was I ever myself? This is just the same game over and over again, and I thought I could stop it this time. As the clone sat and meshed in the alien machine, he realized why the Methuselah man had set it up the way he did. The old man had given him an out. He had given them an out. This had happened time upon time, as this wasn't the first memory transfer. This. Stop it! The clone wailed. He began to thrash as more memories flooded into his mind. He wanted to get out of the machine. He wanted to. His jerky movement ceased as the floodgates to his mind opened. He did not just receive a few memories, no, oh no. He received one lifetime after another. The Methuselah man had lived for such a long time. The clone wailed anew. Life was lonely to one who lived on and on while everyone else around him died. The Methuselah man was cursed. He had a task to perform. The builders had branded his mind with brilliance, and the clone shook his head wildly. He began to embroider memories with a released imagination. He added to this and that and struggled to insert it within his memory core. He did it out of spite. He did it in an effort to have some of himself left after this was done. The memories continued to flood his mind. They did overpower his will as he'd feared. He forgot about the clone that had climbed out of the stasis unit. The memories poured for hours, for days. Even the alien machine could not smash so many memories into one puny human mind in a short span. It took time to upload the Methuselah man's life journey into the clone's fresh vault of brain tissues. Strand groaned at the ruthlessness of the emperor of the new men. He could not believe his creation could turn on him like this. Strand relived his many victories against Ludendorff. He remembered other Methuselah men, many of whom he had slain. He remembered the androids that had warred against them throughout the centuries. He laughed, he cried, he shouted with joy, and he screamed vengeance. Finally, days later, the heat no longer radiated against his sweat-streaked hair. He looked like a concentration camp victim, with his ribs showing on his starved and dehydrated body. 
making mewling sounds, Strand slid out of the alien maze. The process took far too long. The little strength he had abandoned him. On hands and knees, he crawled slowly across the floor. The hatch opened. Strand crawled to the food console. With painful slowness, he climbed to his feet. With blurry vision, he pressed buttons, entering a code. Soon, he drank one glass of water after another. He vomited most of it back up five minutes later. This time, he drank slowly, paused to let the water seep into his molecules, and then drank again. Afterward, he ate seasoned mush. He would have deviled eggs and steaks later. Finished with the meal, he barely managed to stagger to a cot. He collapsed onto it and slept for a solid 23 hours. Finally, he stirred, opening his eyes. They seemed different, looked and even felt different. They were an old man's eyes, filled with pain and sorrow. He was the same clone, but he was not the same person. He had a Methuselah man's memories. He was not the same strand that someone had captured, but he was not the youthful clone with grand ideas either. I am Strand Z, he said. He shuddered, finally knowing what he planned to do. The universe had robbed him of his creation. Before he made his next move, he would need to know more. But then, oh yes, then, Ludendorff, Maddox, the emperor of the new men, all sorts of people were going to pay. Beyond that, however, was something intensely creative. The universe had tried to destroy his art. No, that was not going to stand. He had created the masterpiece of all masterpieces, the new men. That was what no one had ever realized. More than Archimedes, more than da Vinci or Michelangelo, he would restore his creation to its proper place even if that meant destroying the puny human race known as Homo sapiens, man. Chapter 4 Captain Maddox headed for the cell containing Yen Cho. Meta and Riker had joined him. They would watch the android armed with heavy hand weapons to destroy the android if they had to. Maddox was running out of options. Things were moving much too slowly. They weren't any closer to figuring out where this next clone might be. They had no idea about where the Nameless One's technology could be hidden. Were there more null regions? How could they find them? Maddox muttered under his breath. He had no idea. He had to catch a break. Barring that, he had to create his own break, a lead to reach the clone before the replica committed the terrible action of contacting the Nameless Ones. Maddox halted before the heavy hatch. He faced the other two. Yen Cho will be desperate, but whatever you do, don't kill him as we need his knowledge. Sir, Riker asked, don't harm his brain. Blast off his arms or legs or shred his torso if you must, but on no account damage his brain case. Are you sure this is the best way to talk to him then? Meta asked. Maybe you should talk via screen. He can't get to us that way. Maddox shook his head. He wanted answers, and he wanted them now. He was going to be direct. Besides, the android was likely more subtle than he was. The android had been toying with them for years. The android had to be among the best spies in the business. Maddox nodded to a Marine. The sergeant opened the hatch. Other Marines stood ready with heavy rifles. Maddox set his features into a bland mask. He lowered his head and stepped into the cell. Meta and Riker followed. The Marines shut the hatch behind them with a clang. Yen Cho sat at the table, but he was not playing cards this time. He sat like a statue, unmoving and unblinking. 
Maddox said nothing as he grabbed an extra chair and dragged it toward Riker. The sergeant started to the table to get his own. No, Maddox said quietly. I'll do that. I don't want him to steal your weapon. Riker seemed abashed, nodding, taking the chair the captain had gotten for him. Soon Maddox sat against the wall. Meta and Riker flanked him, each aiming a hand weapon at the unmoving android. To Maddox's eye, Yen Cho seemed unaware of them. Andros Crank had repaired the android's pseudo-skin since the fight in the hangar bay. Galleon had informed him that the highly upgraded cyber brain had rebooted after a hard crash. Now, do you want us to leave? Maddox asked the android. Yen Cho made no response. Maybe he malfunctioned while waiting, Riker said. With a slicing gesture across his throat, Maddox indicated that the sergeant should keep quiet. Riker nodded. Meta just watched the android. She appeared emotionless, which she most certainly was not. The android had endangered Maddox and helped cause the deaths of over 70 crewmates. Meta was set to kill. Yen Sho, Maddox said. I've waited to talk to you for several reasons. According to Galleon, you are whole again. I've also had my chief technician install special magnetic clamps outside your cell. At the first sign of trouble, you will find yourself pinned against a bulkhead, unable to move. The android still did not respond. Perhaps you're upset regarding the proto-builder, Maddox said in an easy manner. I can well understand that. You hoped to revive a builder. I'm sure you believed it would be grateful to you. Maybe you hoped it would help the androids gain greater status. I recall the proto-builder saying something about androids working as the overlords of a thinned-out humanity. There was still no response. Maddox switched tactics. We searched both sets of pyramids. The away team on Gideon 2 used the entrance I'd blasted into a side. The team reached the pit where I endured the antimatter explosion. The team found deep corridors, tearing apart whatever stood in the way. They found nothing useful, just ruins, some ancient wall art, and a few useless knickknacks. They had to destroy a few things, but came up empty anyway. It was the same on the rogue moon, in a word. The pyramids proved barren. The android did not appear to have heard the report. Can he hear us? Meta asked. The android sat motionless. Maddox switched tactics yet again. I'd hope to forego any threats, but you leave me no choice. Galleon and Andros are having trouble cracking the Builder Cube. So far, it has resisted our efforts. You know more about this cube than any of us do. You could aid us, but it appears you will not. While Galleon and Andros may not be able to crack the cube, I do believe they could hack your Cybertronic brain. The android still said nothing. That means I will order your brain taken from your brain case, Maddox said. I will not be reinstalling it. Instead, we're going to take apart your brain piece by piece. We will reassemble and run it so we can control every function. In that way, Galleon and Andros can drain any useful memories. The android blinked, and his head swiveled minutely. So he now stared at Maddox. You are a barbarian. Yen Cho declared. That's an interesting observation, Maddox said easily. We're barbarians willing to dissect an unliving android in order to save the human race from destruction. You must realize that I have no qualms in the matter. I especially have no qualms when said android helped a builder cube. A cube, mind you, hoping to alter the human race into something more to its liking. Apparently androids are fine with this. Maddox shrugged. In such a situation, I find that I have no reservations in using you however I can to rectify the situation. You truly desecrated more of the pyramids on Gideon too? Yen Cho asked. The away team went down. They searched and found the pyramids empty. The pyramids are holy to androids. I have already told you so. You must stay out of them. 
Then help me find the next Strand clone, Maddox said. If you do, Starwatch will quarantine Gideon too and the rogue moon. They will be off limits to archaeologists and souvenir hunters. If you don't help us, I'm inclined to saturation bomb the sites until the pyramids are obliterated. You would not dare commit such sacrilege, Yen Cho said. Sergeant Riker snorted. Believe me, Captain Maddox would dare. Or have you forgotten that he already dropped one antimatter missile on them? Yen Cho stared dead-eyed at Maddox. The captain began to wonder if the android had returned to its catatonic state. Yes, the android said. I will help you. Crack the builder cube? Maddox asked. I have already said yes. Just so we're clear, Maddox said. If we find that you're tampering with the cube or attempting to revive it again, I will blast the pyramids to pieces and dissect your computer brain. I have already computed your response to such an action on my part, the android said. Can we really trust him? Meta asked. No, Maddox said. We're going to watch him every second and on several levels. He studied the android. You will wear a heavy iron yoke at all times. I will help you, Yen Cho said. What more must I say? One more thing, Maddox said. Do you know the whereabouts of the next stasis chamber? Yen Cho hesitated, answering. No, he finally said. He's lying, Meta said. Or wants us to think he's lying, Riker added. Maddox tapped his chin. Do you have a suspicion concerning the location of the next stasis chamber? That I do, Yen Cho said. Where? asked Maddox. I am loath to say it. I understand, Maddox said. However, in this instance, I am going to insist. And to help loosen your tongue, I will apply the pyramid blasting threat to the question. I thought you might, Yen Cho said. Yes, I will say. And he told them. That is deep into the beyond. Maddox said. It would take time to reach the star system. And I may be wrong about my guess, Yen Cho said. It is simply a possibility I have computed from everything I have learned about the original Strand's thinking. What do you give as the probability? Maddox asked. Sixty-two percent. How did you arrive at the conclusion? Yen Cho hesitated once more, finally nodded, and began to speak. He spoke for thirty-three minutes. Detailed, Maddox said when the android finally stopped talking. And I'm impressed by your extensive store of knowledge. I have lived longer than the Methuselah man, Yen Cho said. I have learned a great deal in all that time. Apparently, Maddox said. He stood. Meta and Riker rose with him. Are we going to the selected star system? Yen Cho asked. I'll let you know once I decide. Maddox said, rapping on the hatch. It opened. We do not have much time, Yen Cho said. It is in fact my belief that the stasis chamber has already expelled its occupant. I've wondered about that, Maddox said. When do I get out of here to help you with the Builder Cube? Soon, Maddox said. The three humans departed the cell, waiting until the Marine shut the hatch and they'd heard the lock engage before heading out of the brig area of the ship. Chapter 5 There was nothing for it but to start traveling as fast as victory could go. The ancient Adox starship had a key advantage few other space vessels possessed. It had the star drive jump. It allowed them to jump directly to the next Lommer point in a star system and then use it to reach the next system. The problem was greater stress on the crew as they made jump after jump after jump in quick succession. The starship left human space and entered the beyond. That was another stress. Traveling through the unknown slowly built greater pressure among those doing it. This wasn't an ordinary crew, however. They had undergone rigorous testing as the patrol people searched for individuals that could take the pressures. What's more, Victory had been farther into the beyond than any other known human crewed ship. Most of the crew was used to this, as used to this as one got anyway. 
As the days passed, it became clear to Maddox that Yen Cho knew far more than Star Watch had suspected. The android kept providing new Lommer Point coordinates as the starship traveled through uncharted areas of the beyond. We must be nearing the throne world, Maddox said one day. Yen Cho was among the science team working on the Builder Cube. Armed marines stood against the bulkheads. Others were in the next room ready to activate giant magnetic clamps. Yen Cho wore what looked like an old-style yoke for a beast of burden. If the magnetic clamps activated, they would pick the yoked android off the floor and slam the iron yoke against a bulkhead. It meant extra weight for Yen Cho and often proved to be in his way. The android hadn't complained. If the yoke jacket bothered him, he had not let on. Maddox studied daily reports concerning the android's behavior, looking for a clue as to the android's... feelings would be the wrong word, maybe trying to figure out what Yen Cho wanted and what he would attempt to do. Maddox presently stood beside the android. In the center of the room was a giant globe. The cube sat in the exact center, with power cables attached to the clear block that held the cube. Scientists stood around the circular console that ringed the giant globe. Andros Crank and Galleon instructed scientists on various procedures. The cube had proven extremely resistant to any hacking or cracking. It had been three weeks already, and they were no closer to breaking into the builder's software than before. None of Yen Cho's suggestions had helped either. If it hadn't been for his data about the beyond, Maddox would have sent the android back into his cell a long time ago. The android turned to Maddox in regard to the captain's comment about the throne world. I suggest we stay far from the new men, Yen Cho said. Maddox was inclined to agree. Despite their help against the swarm invasion fleet, the captain didn't trust the new men. He wondered, then, what Lord Dracos did at this moment. Was the man his father? He had believed so. Now he wasn't 100% certain. But if Lord Dracos wasn't his father, who was? How would he ever find out so he could kill the responsible man? The captain shook his head. He couldn't worry about that now. He must be near, Maddox said, referring to the original Strand. If we could go to the throne world, perhaps the Emperor would allow us to speak to Strand. Or perhaps the Emperor has already broken Strand and is even now sending star cruisers to the same place we're headed, Yen Cho said. Maddox considered the idea. The longer he did, the more concerned he became over their lack of progress with the Builder Cube. Tell me, Yen Cho, why have you failed to crack the cube? You know it better than anyone. Me? The android asked. Surely you jest. The cube is far beyond my knowledge. The builders? The android waved vaguely. You should not have destroyed the proto-builder, Captain. We were on the verge of a grand new age. This may surprise you, Maddox said. But I have no desire to enter a grand new age with a murderous builder at its head. It would have been better for humanity, at least in the long run. There are no long runs, Maddox said. Just an endless succession of short runs. I suppose I can sympathize with you, Yen Cho said. You have your short life, and that is all. You cannot see the long view. That is why. The android looked away. Why I'm a barbarian? Maddox asked. Stout Andros Crank stepped near. The cube is resistant to everything we can think of, he told Maddox. Oh, am I interrupting you? Not at all, Maddox said. You were saying? I have come to believe that the cube is actively resisting us, Andros said. The technology behind it. The long-haired chief technician shook his gray head. I almost think we should split the cube in half. What? Yen Cho said, turning to face them. Yes, Andros told the android. We're not getting anywhere as it is. At this point, what do we have to lose? Captain, I'd like your permission to split the cube in half. 
Maddox studied the cube and the giant globe. The idea was his, naturally. He had instructed Andros to ask him this while he was talking to the android. Yes, Maddox said, as if coming to a sudden decision. I don't see what else we can do. But that is madness, Yen Cho said. The cube is priceless. To simply destroy it like unthinking primitives, not even you humans are that stupid. I have to disagree with him, sir, Andros said. We're under the gun. We're possibly running out of time. We have to gamble that we can gain something from the cube. Agreed, Maddox said. Do you have a way to cut it? I've been working on the idea for several days already, Andros said. Galleon has helped me create a centralized disruptor beam. It will act like a knife, cutting the cube in half. No, no, Yen Cho said. You are truly mad. That will destroy the cube. It might, Andros admitted. It might also work. Maybe only one half will be broken. The other half will have salvageable information we can use. There was a subtle stiffening to Yen Cho. The marines along the wall grew alert several of them training their heavy rifles on the android. Do you disagree with my verdict? Maddox asked Yen Cho. The android looked away. It seemed his cybertronic mind might be whirling at its highest setting. I have a different solution, Yen Cho said. I have not suggested it yet, because it might cause a self-destruct sequence in the cube. We, androids, have come upon such a cube before. We attempted to hack into it. The cube exploded, killing all the androids but one. You? Maddox asked. That was a shrewd guess, Captain. Yes, I alone survived. Yet you worship the builders? Maddox asked. Shall we try my alternative method? The android asked. Will it take long? We no longer have the luxury of time. It should take two, maybe three days to set up. Maddox rubbed his chin, finally shaking his head. No, I don't see that. Give me one day of preparation, Yen Cho said, interrupting. Surely one day more won't matter. Maddox eyed the android. One day, he said. After that, thank you, Captain, Yen Cho said. I believe my method should work this time. Last time, it does not matter. This time I am almost completely certain it will work.